What are you gonna do? Just shoulder right. Uh, I'm just gonna bring oh. the the wing out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Slowly make sure it goes nicely. I get hooked funny. Okay, good Please morning, everyone. Yeah. We have just touched down on the seafloor at 1,610 uh, meters well, depth at a site I known as, um, well, we're in the Green so, yeah. Canyon um, area right at uh, St. Tammany Basin um, no. in the southern yeah. Gulf of Mexico. So today, our dive should be a pretty exciting one. We are diving south of um, a potential expansion zone of the Flower Garden Banks Na so Marine National out. Sanctuary, the, as well yeah. as south of a proposed habitat area of particular ahead, concern yeah. that was proposed yeah, by the bottom, Gulf of Mexico uh, Fishery uh, Council. Let's sit, so our dive today to has pretty please. big yeah. management yeah. implications. Um, as I said, we're going to be diving south of those areas. Next so person. while we may not be inside Thanks. of those boxes, um, we are going to be looking at communities that could potentially be connected to those or are very likely to be connected to those within the box. So that um, understanding that connectivity, the biodiversity in that area, as well as the geological origin here in Green Canyon area, um, is pretty important. So last night we identified a number of seep anomal well bubble streams that could potentially lead to chemosynthetic communities and seepage. Um, in those areas, there were also um, some potential high, hard grounds, which if you were looking at our dive yesterday, was what we explored then. And, and so as a result, uh, we're hoping to find similar communities to those absolutely spectacular ones we saw yesterday. We'll basically be following one of the bathymetric highs in the area, um, which we hope will be exposed orthogenic carbonate, or as we saw yesterday, asphalt, and um, that there will be spectacular communities to uh, being hosted on them. Um, apart from that, just to tell you a little bit about who you're listening to, um, my name is Diva Raymond, and I am one of the biology co-leads on board the Oceanus Explorer during this expedition. Um, I'm a research fellow at the Natural History Museum in London, and my specialize in chemosynthetic habitats such as cold seeps, and also um, how humans are impacting the fauna down in the deep sea. And this is Chuck Messing. I'm a professor at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm an invertebrate zoologist, and... Uh, my area of particular specialization is the crinoids, but I uh, generally cover the waterfront and invertebrates and uh, have another interest in deep water coral communities there. Uh, we're doing a swap right now, so we'll let the next watch do it. And I am Alex Avila. I am a PhD student at, at Oregon State University Bar in fisheries. I am here as a Nancy Foster Scholar, and I'm also an Oregon State uh, Steve Grant Fellow. And so in addition to the three of us on board, um, we of course have a control van of ROV engineers and video engineers who are going to introduce themselves shortly. But additionally, we are via telepresence, which is this amazing technology that the Oceanus Explorer has where we are able to stream all of our data and all of our video from the ROV, Pilot. which is currently you know, over one and a half know. kilometers deep. Um, so in the Gulf of Mexico, to folks in their homes or offices. And as a result, that means today. that we can work very, very closely with a number of stakeholders as well as scientists with a variety of expertise on shore. Right, Pat, so uh, that means that we can also? tailor our expertise to what we may need on a particular day. So, for instance, today is um, in a... Today's dive is in a geologically active area, and so we have a number of geologists joining us. And tomorrow, uh, a couple of days uh, from now, yeah. we're going to have a shipwreck dive, and so we're going to be joined by a number of archaeologists then. And it, it's a really like um, did all the, uh, interesting and exciting yeah. and extremely Check useful here. tool uh, to be able to maximize the amount of information that we are allowed, that we can, can get, the, um, and then also um, distribute and you know, give, send out to you guys on shore um, who may be watching, members of the public, and so on. So today, we are joined by a number of folks who may be on the telecon line. Um, if anybody's there, do you want to introduce them to yourselves, please? Go by, can we get lasers on? Yeah, lasers. I might be, oh, okay. Okay, well, 
we are also joined by a number of scientists who um, communicate with us via an instant messaging um, chat log. And so today we've got Asako Matsumoto, who is a coral expert um, based in Japan. Japan. Carolyn Rupel, who is um, a geologist. You may have heard her a lot yesterday on the call. Um, and she is at USGS. Uh, Mike Vecchione, who is a cephalopod expert, so squids and octopus and cuttlefish. Um, and Nolan Barrett, who is a student at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution. Bob Carney, yeah, who has worked extensively trip. in the Gulf of which Mexico which direction um, would you like to go? and has both geological um, and biological expertise. Mind. Tina Molotsova, who is also joining well, us from me, uh, afar from Russia. Fun. She's a cnidarian expert, especially with five, black corals. And Tracy so Sutton, mine, who um, yeah, works with Chuck at Nova Southeastern University. And he is a specialist in fishes. fishes that's right. So, um, so again, a variety of expertise Bridges joining us now. from ashore, and hopefully ahead, they, a number of them will like call in move, during please. the call today. We'll, uh, so do 30 during this dive, we're hoping to um, proceed through a number of bubble targets, which we uh, picked Roger up last that. night, Position and move. hopefully Range those areas, zero in meters, those areas, we will zero find seven five some speed um, exposed two. hard bottom, which hosts. Very exciting communities. Pilot video so should be a very good to dive skid. today. Perfect. If it's video. anything like yesterday, yeah, it's going to be phenomenal. And so uh, we find ourselves on uh, what looks like a local high, a um, that slopes off to either side. This is a. Move initiated, uh, range 30 meters, bearing 075, speed decimal 2. Thank you. And you can see a fair amount of bioturbation on the bottom. There are so lots of little trails here uh, made by organisms that move along the sea floor and uh, are deposit feeders. They feed on the, uh, mostly on the surface Come layer of sediment continue. which you can see is slightly right, discolored yeah, because it is, it is uh, 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 higher in organic it material like it's um, comes uh, down uh, from uh, it's dead plankton and detritus that comes down from the, see, yeah, see one in the upper there. waters and uh, the paler yeah, you sediment can you can see scale. in the scour mark here um, is dark is uh, paler near the surface underneath that tan layer but then becomes gray yeah. um, as you That's go down. Moral. This may be, oh, okay. we've, we've been told, that uh, there are beaked whales in but the Gulf like of Mexico right there, that the, uh, uh, leave scour edge. marks similar to this upper edge when they come the down no, and search for oh, yeah. uh, uh, deep water food on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And adjacent to that, you see a hole that's partly covered up Come in. And another hole, that may yeah, be the, the tunnel burrow of uh -huh. a blind lobster. It so is. it's possible, since those blind lobsters often sit at the entrance to their burrows, maybe that yeah, uh, beaked whale was able to nab ready. that blind lobster right. during its dive. Okay, so um, we're getting off to a good start today. Uh, but just before we proceed any more, I want the... Uh, ROV and video engineers in the room to introduce themselves, please. Yeah, so sitting in the front row, um, sitting pilot is Levi Unima, and to my left. Uh, Dan Rogers is on nav. And sitting in the uh, co-pilot seat is Sean Kennison. Over on the far right, Bob, not on video. And sitting on my right in the back in the clipping chair is Art Howard. <laughs> and we are all from the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. Hi, Diva. Uh, this is Carolyn. I was just going to mention something about the geology today. Um, so we are sitting on this topographic or bathometric, sorry, high between yeah. two low areas. So those low areas yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico are typically what we call salt withdrawal the way, mini basins. Like. Yeah, so, so uh, the, the mini basins are where we keep an eye don't have out that much salt sonar for whereas there normally yeah, would be salt between these whales. little mini basins and so possibly always, under the always, area yes. where we are right now. Um, in addition, the reason the steeps are lined up as they are on the topographic high between the mini basins 
when Sears gets caught up. It's because you get faulting you know, uh, don't in these areas. Too far and the forward, faults are obviously the you know, conduits for the fluids, side to side, the deep fluids that can come up and, and form we'll the this heat. And the faults and basically do area. what we call in geology accommodate the rise. Salt is very buoyant, and there's a big salt sheet under this area. That accommodate the rise of the salt up through the sediments. And so the sediments have to kind of move out of the way, and the faults accommodate that, and they become conduits for fluids. So this is a very classic structure that we're on today. It's a, it's a place where one usually expects to see seeds. It's great that you found new ones. I, I even find them in three, my own database that would be when I put them into my GIS fine for you. this morning. So yeah, this is a, this is a yeah, nice classic area for the golf. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Well, maybe we'll Thanks very move, much. We'll move and uh, and do 50 you may have seen as we went okay. over yeah, the slope start. down there start. that the... Um, surface texture of the sediment looked different. It lacked uh, many of the little trails and some of the um, patches, little white patches that you see here. Uh, the, and ooh, that is a um, larvacean, sometimes called an appendicularian. That is a relative of sea squirts that you, you're not looking at the entire organism there. You're looking at its mucus house that it generates to collect fine plankton out of the water. Those two pale, semi-transparent lobes that are jiggling around, we've sort of destroyed it right there. But not to worry, because those little uh, larvaceans or appendicularians, little tadpole-shaped creatures, uh, bail out of their houses after just a few hours, uh, because the houses clog up with um, the tiny little particles that they collect. Yeah, I think that's almost done. I'm going to call it 50 meters of point three. One. Sounds yeah, good. So Video we'll probably on see more of those fish. as we go along. I won't have a lot of time with it, but. Bridge. And this is here Arby is now. a fit. Oh, go ahead, uh, no, that is a ketogenic. Right, it looks like that move is that just is about done. That is an arrow worm. Yes, it is. Um, we'd like to uh, go ahead and put video. another move in. Okay. They're found we'll do 50 uh, meters. That's five zero plankton, meters, bearing zero seven and five, deep. and we're going to go uh, zero decimal three knots. And they are among the voracious, most voracious Roger predators. Roger that. Position move. Five zero meters, bearing zero seven five, speed decimal three. That's correct. So, they've got these grasping, curved grasping spines around their head. And they have clusters of very fine uh, sensory hairs along their bodies, and they live in a world of vibration. Huh. And exactly who they're related to has been a knotty problem in taxonomy for centuries, really. Nobody knew quite where to put them. They could, they've been put close to this worm group or that worm that group, and it's finally uh, um, it. becoming now, a little clearer Go uh, to which group Position move uh, initiated, range five zero uh, meters, related. bearing zero but seven still, five, speed decimal you know, three. Thank not you, really close cousins to anybody. You've got me at 52, you called in a 50 meter move. Keep going along. I'll have to double check, but I think the most recent consensus is they are placed most closely to the large group that includes the segmented worms, the mollusks, um, the flat worms, uh, ribbon worms, and some other groups. And that looks like Video come in it on might be white subject. a gastropod. No, no. That is a piece of uh, muscle shell. Uh, Bivalve shell, isn't it? Yeah, so that's a that's a pretty good sign. Um, this is likely one half of a bivalve shell, um, likely from the genus Bathymodiolus, which are the most dominant inhabitant of chemosynthetic habitats in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's got a little probable, um, maybe zoanthid um, anemone growing on it. Tough to tell exactly. But it's we'll a matter of any old port in a storm. Not much else uh, of a substrate to attach to down here. You can also see a little curled shell almost right in the middle of the uh, screen now. That is the, looks like it might be the shell of a planktonic mollusk, gastropod mollusk, that has settled to the seafloor. Thanks, video. 
Thanks, pilot. And there's yeah. a little pile of narrow uh, uh, fecal uh, pellets there from right. some uh, we'll creature that <laughs> has uh, gone on by, a deposit feeder. The deposit feeders, of course, feed on the organic material yeah. and microorganisms in the sediment. Okay, video when you're clear. And they uh, pass through okay. themselves right. the uh, undigestible mineral material. And, of course, waste comes out as well. So there you can see in the background is smooth sediment and then bioturbated sediment with trails. So uh, it's an important point that the bottom here in the uh, anywhere in the deep sea may look absolutely uniform, but then you'll see these subtle differences and they can represent major differences in the organisms that live in the sediment and the much smaller organisms as well, the larger organisms that burrow and the smaller organisms that live between and among the uh, sediment yeah, grains. It's like a point three which can vary moves, even flatter between stuff one be of those tail patches to the top of that and the surrounding yeah. uh, slightly Video darker patches. Snap on this. And here we have a little bit of uh, sargassum weed. This, of course, is a brown alga uh, that floats about at the sea surface and whatever circumstances contribute to its uh, sinking and demise, when they reach the sea floor, they are, in many cases, important sources of nutrients to deep sea organisms. So while we have a quick second here, um, I just wanted to plug an event that we have happening today. Um, so at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 1 p.m. Like Central Time, um, you can right. join Alex Avila, uh, Noah Nancy Foster Scholar and PhD student, Oregon State University, and myself, as well as the expedition coordinator, Brian Kennedy, eight, um, where we'll be doing a Facebook Live right. event. So you can find that at, again, at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the NOAA Ocean Explorer Facebook page. So please do join us for that half an hour where you can ask us whatever questions you may have about ocean exploration and the Nancy Foster program. And while we're doing that, Chuck is going to be holding down the fort and continuing with the... Um, with the narrations. Doing my best. And uh, Mike Vecchioni mentions also that sperm whales make, uh, may make gouges in the deep sea floor as well when they hunt for uh, bottom associated prey, uh, not just the beaked whales. That, uh, we, we talked about the gouges before. There's a little bottom, sh bottom dwelling shrimp. Did you have a close up of the, the shrimp? Carcinus. Watch it or not? I mean, that's fine. Um, Interestingly, similar to the uh, the fact that beaked whales can come down here, um, did like you also know that whale yeah. sharks can make it to these depths? Um, they obviously don't make gouge marks that we yeah, know of so far, but um, Alistair Dove, who yeah, yeah, is yeah. an expert in whale Russia sharks as well as works at Georgia yeah. Aquarium, um, offset that a little. got in touch yesterday and said that whale sharks are known in the Gulf of Mexico from depths, you did know, know, this deep. Did not know yeah. that. Amazing. Nothing crazy in sonar. The organisms that live in the sediment, um, and both in shallow water and in deep water, um, uh, marine ecologists generally divide them in the grossest Video, let's come uh, on this. level of approach. Uh, dis divisions. And what do we have here? There's that's a little burrowing anemone, a cerianthid, and the laser dots are. Um, our parallel lasers are 10 centimeters or about four inches apart. So you see that uh, little anemone is uh, probably no more than two inches across, if that. You can always tell burrowing anemones because there are regular anemones that burrow also, but burrowing Arm anemones have bridge. two distinct rings of slender yeah, tentacles. One interior shorter ring, and uh, uh, what you see here is the longer exterior ring. Video on your clear, we can come out. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put and the there are little um, okay. Okay, well, bridge uh, shells. Uh, the yeah, we'd like to do another 50 meters, five zero meters, bearing shells zero seven five at zero Gastropod snails, sea butterflies that have uh, died and fallen to the deep sea floor. Good copy, RV now. So, uh, meters, bearing zero marine seven five uh, ecologists, good marine copy. biologists, copy. Stand by for input. In, uh, in the most general terms, divide the organisms that live in the sediment. Uh, by size, 
and um, yes, that if video. I remember correctly, and and those ashore can. Um, yeah. There's a bit of debris, or is that muscle? That's muscle shell again. Yeah, very shiny nacreous layer on the interior of the shell. <coughs> um, trying to remember my size categories. This goes back a few years, but. Um, so when you pick up, let's really uh, again really focus on half a millimeter to as much as two possible millimeters is survey a wide area. Wide so moving forward, fifty micrometers. We're not sure. It's somewhere half on this a millimeter sure is exactly myofauna and I O, and, yeah. and smaller than that is microfauna, yeah, okay. and larger than the two yeah. millimeters is megafauna. So uh, anyone can weigh in and correct me if I got that wrong. It's like I can see off the uh, edge. Those are general. Distinctions and of course, no depending on terms. what you study, uh, what you want to study, you uh, will ahead. have different equipment to examine the uh, the uh, organisms and collect them. Different sieve sizes when you take a sample with a core tube or with a grab sampler. And of course, we're largely focused on and the megafauna the here, the organisms that we can easily see with the naked eye. I'll, I'll hold this for a second. You can change gains if you want, but I don't see anything to do. And there's a fair amount of undulation to the body. Did I say the body? I meant the bottom. I was like, what? What? <laughs> Reminds me, when I was teaching marine biology years ago, I kept for a little while substituting the word money for energy. Must have had that on my mind. All right, scanning back up in port. I didn't see anything off to starboard. So this is an interesting contrast to yesterday's dive because as we touched down yesterday, it wasn't a sedimented area, but there were a number more deposit feeders. So we saw quite a couple of urchins, um, a lot more fish, a really high diversity of Try fish. Whereas today, trench. I think we've only so seen three here. species so if we include the two that were Check just in the shot. North side of this feature. So that actually does look very similar to a beaked whale gouge mark. Very so narrow. Yeah, narrow. Yeah, they're very narrow. Um, they're about a foot deep a little over a foot sometimes deep, and about a meter in length. Huh. And so it's thought they cool run their lower yeah. beaks, their lower jaw um, along the sea floor and can pick up food or stones in some cases to aid in digestion. I'm going to range down um, D2 and soon order Or 30. even potentially yeah. scrape off parasites. But I don't know if this has actually ever been observed or whether it's just a theory, I'm not quite sure. But of course, beaked whales are known to go down to depths much deeper than this, I think over three kilometers in some places. Wow. This is a child's play for them. And there's more uh, dead sargassum sitting in, they'll tend to collect in depressions in the sea yeah, floor. It's looking good, Levi. And yeah, we've got I'm a variety of mounds and so burrows here created here. by organisms Super. living in the sediment. They could be sea cucumbers, a variety of worms, and crustaceans. There are burrowing shrimp. Starting to go off port. Yeah. So this looks like an, a fairly narrow ridge which slopes off, or a whaleback that slopes off in both directions. Yeah, I think this is one of the local highs. Um, so we're going to go leave this in a little while and go back down. Um, I don't know. The, the relief in this area is very... Um, very limited, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. yeah. So these are all very relative terms. And the uh, communities uh, can change rather abruptly. So I mentioned certainly on the micro scale, the organisms living in the sediment, uh, their uh, community composition, the different species, can change over distances of a few centimeters. Critters that may like living in those mounds will differ from critters that like living on the flat sediment surrounding. And of course, that goes for larger communities. Yesterday, we came 
very abruptly. Yes, uh, like a bit of a depression on uh, very distinctive on the court, or communities of organisms on the seafloor. Uh -oh. uh, Diva, did you ever figure out or uh, try to? I'm not we sure. Require that. Uh, I didn't really look for what, do you think, Sean? what those curlicue were. I can't say anything serious, but do you I think agree those were? Like yes. Do you think those were sibogrenids? Yeah, they were. They were scleronyms. Scleronyms. Straight ahead now. Scleronyms. I'll have to put that in our. That was Eric Cordes. Thank you for that idea, oh, yes. Eric. Thank you, Eric. <coughs> yeah, I'll have this. It looks like a different rat tail. Video coming on it's fish. It's paler. So Mike is just, um, Mike Vecchione is just contributing and saying that he agrees. He doesn't think the bottom feeding okay, behavior of these off. toothed whales has been observed. Um, inference was based on location and dimensions. But a dead sperm whale was once found with a, its lower jaw entangled in a deep sea cable, which would imply that it had come down to the bottom and um, scraped along the seafloor and then happened to get caught up in that cable. This rat tail looks very um, distended, mm -hmm. either a very big meal or some babies. And it's characteristic, for those of you who have not tuned in before, uh, we've talked about this before on previous dives, many of the, if not most, of the deep okay, sea fishes that are associated with the yeah, bottom like this at, yeah. um, tend to be either eel shaped or tadpole right. shaped like Fresh that one back. with an enlarged uh, front one? end uh, and a, a long narrow tapering tail or two. and they tend to have uh, little or no pigment uh, so they are uh, dark gray pale gray even anything? white um, in the deep sea of course our depth now is 1600 um, and five meters and there is no light here apart from bioluminescence yeah, it looks like some it's bioluminescence that of course okay. is in not visible to us because we have this the ROV's lights on looking but to the north. Um, uh, as you go deeper in the ocean uh, you'll find fishes uh, many of them will have uh, large eyes like that one but there are others, and particularly as you go further down, uh, the eyes tend to be smaller. So you have this combination, typical of many deep sea bottom associated fishes, of the gray, dark pale, gray, white coloration. Yeah, just leave the ship stop uh, for the a tadpole couple minutes. or eel shape. <coughs> and as you progress into the deep sea, although it's not uniform by any means, you, guys? Um, no. you no. get a they tend to get uh, smaller and smaller port, eyes. Yeah. Well, and Tracy Sutton tells us there are over 30 of those rat tail species a lot of, like, and 14, in 14 that genera the port side of uh, common I'll in the Gulf of Mexico. To, uh, and unfortunately, a, an absolutely yeah, positive I identification I mean, it requires it the specimen like in hand to count the small actually. parts of the uh, anatomy or maybe the scale numbers or uh, things like that. Port? Uh, yeah, and that's not just the case for the macro urids. That's the case for a lot of um, All right, Dan. Try to hold many, this most animals. Um, a po an, you know, an idea of 100 percent cannot direction. be given without a specimen in hand think? because of, uh, yeah. the, as Chuck was saying, those very you small features you may not be able to I see I in um, imagery kind of or also the uh, presence of cryptic species. So cryptic species are those yeah. which are genetically distinct from each other but have the same. Um, morphology yeah, or they uh, look the same so they really you yeah, really yeah, must be very more. careful about Range. giving uh, you know um, definitive um, ideas from so like, um, yeah. video so or photography yeah. any kind of imagery so you want 20 uh, meters right. at zero one zero or yeah sometimes yeah, it be good. it's um sometimes it can be uh easier than Bridge, others Arby there now. are Definitive ahead, features Move, please. where there's two, a limited meters, number of two zero meters known bearing from an zero area, one zero and you can make a, uh, an important um, right, educated back. guess got two zero meters, um, zero, one, zero, and so be uh, pretty right. precise. That's great. So, for example, right. um, um, is there a reason why we're going decimal a few three days ago, years, since my area of the crinoids, the sea lilies uh, and feather stars, running late. I well, saw we're just trying a to uh, feather star up. We're, we're searching uh, that for clearly Good belonged copy. to right, a certain thanks. family. It had the characteristics. But I know uh, from my work that there are only two members of that I'll family known from the entire tropical western Atlantic Ocean. 
That's you know, know Southeast Florida, the Bahamas, all the way down to Brazil. And this wasn't one of those two. So I have a pretty good bet yeah. that uh, what we saw and we were able to collect is going to be an undescribed species. There's another rat tail. Yeah, it's coming on rat tail. Slope, that slope, that's quite a slope here. Video come in. Oh, I don't have you latched. And you can see the pale yeah, sediment the kicked up by a burrowing What's organism. Uh, we don't know what it is. It might be a, a spoon worm, a uh, yeah, cucumber, a burrowing shrimp, um, any uh, number of things yeah. uh, next to that rat tail. Uh, we occasionally do see okay. furrows uh, when we back off a site, and there's a small shrimp. Okay, uh, Okay, on us. And another. Yeah, it's me talking to you. If it didn't come wide. Um, we will back off from an area, and you'll see the skid mark of your back of the it's made by the center. ROV as it uh, as it uh, ran along ran it along the back. bottom and back Tail off. Dragon. And those are pretty yeah. distinctive. Yeah, why don't you come back, Levi? Yeah. And you see here we're backing off a little bit, and that cloud of sediment is sediment that we have stirred up. Yeah, very soft bottom. My tail touched the ground and then stirred it up. <coughs> I stirred up quite a bit of sediment here. You're pretty high right now. Yeah. So just a little background on this expedition. Um, this is the first expedition that the Oceanus Explorer has had in the Gulf of Mexico in three years. Um, prior to this one, they had spent three years in the Pacific uh, doing so quite a lot of exploration all around the Pacific um, in various monuments and um, U.S. territories um, or states' um, waters. And... Uh, this is the first time that they've been back since then and will be conducting three expeditions in the Gulf of Mexico, this being the first. Um, in February or March next year, there'll be a mapping cruise to help refine targets. And then in April next year, there'll be a second ROV cruise um, where there'll be another 20-something odd dives like this one. Um, after that, I do think they'll be heading out into the Atlantic, uh, the east coast of the U.S., to do some exploration there yeah, later in the day, in the year, sorry. Um, but it is, is it is now. really exciting for the Okeanos Explorer Final, to be yes, back on here. this side of the world. And I am really excited about that uh, cruise to the, uh, off the southeast coast of the U.S. because there's the potential for exploring this vast it's area east of the Carolinas and Georgia and north of the Bahamas called the Blake Plateau. Yeah, but you can the, come in uh, on the western the margin of it where it slopes up to the continental there? shelf is much very, very well explored. There are lots of enormous deep Traffic. sea coral Traffic. mounds yeah. there, mounds and reefs, and um, a little bit of the northern margin of the Bahamas, Little Bahama Bank, has been explored. And the very eastward margin of this uh, area, the Blake Plateau, uh, is incised by a series of canyons, and some of those have been explored, but much of the plateau itself has been completely unexplored. No Alvin dives, no submersible dives, a few trawls here and there, um, uh, but not much to speak of, and so I'm really excited uh, about that. Uh, there, I guess there were I one dust or two Alvin and dives I see the, in um, that area, there's but... Uh, so on our return uh, to the port, really like looking to see, forward to seeing what we find there. Here. This is a great cool. yeah. example of a burrow on a slope where the inhabitant has dug up the fine sediment from below and it all uh, pours down the slope. Okay. This looks like a pretty active burrow. Clear. It might be a burrow. Uh, that is uh, as wide as oh, we any right wider we're in the skid. All right. Thank you. All right, let's, let's go back to acquire that sonar return here. There's a little uh, shrimp up in the water.
and we're just passing off to the right a ring burrow yeah, of a, a, a set of burrows in a ring and um, Bob Carney uh, on shore in the chat room has mentioned them before I don't know if anybody knows what makes those if anybody uh, has an idea let me know let us know there's a little bit of the cloud that we stirred up on the left as we turn Is that getting any closer, or is that an artifact in sonar? It might just be an artifact. Seems to be saying the same range, no matter my movement. Eva, so I yeah, wonder uh, how that those odd muscle shells get all the way out push forward a little away more from we can, uh, line where up. they could. I guess some crab could have picked easily. one up and carried it around. Yeah, exactly. So not like yesterday, we saw yeah, these um, clam and muscle shells, chemosynthetic clam and muscle shells, strewn all around the area, um, where right. it did look like it okay. was geologically well, active in we some can, uh, capacity. Line, let's line up at one so zero zero. So what would have happened potentially yesterday was that we have been zero a zero community yeah, there, you know, many many zero years zero ago, and, and then the flow of those well. chemical-rich fluids and gases waned, and as a result, those communities died. But here we can see that it's just the odd shell every now and again, pretty pretty separated from each other um, with not much else around them. <coughs> and so as you say, Chuck, that could be very correct. You know, a, a scavenger, um, some kind of predator may have dragged one off and taken it somewhere to eat. I do know they, d they are eaten, mussels are eaten by, um, for instance, the Chasian crabs, which we see often in the Gulf of Mexico, the red crabs and the golden crabs, um, as well as a number of other arthropod species. There's a little midwater fish zooming by. That might have been a uh, bristle mouth. If uh, Tracy spotted it, maybe he can tell us. It went by pretty quickly. And some large cones here. The cones are the uh, built up by the sediment dwellers. They're the material that uh, they excavate and uh, pass out of their burrows along with the fecal material. <coughs> and sometimes you'll see uh, a combination pairing of uh, mound and crater where the, uh, in the case of some worms, the worm uh, uh, feeds on the mud within its burrow and mud collapses from above creating a crater and then the worm backs up through its tube or tunnel and deposits its waste material up on the uh, sediment to create a mound or a cone. All right, I'll go ahead and put that move in. Yeah. That's good. Bridge, this is RV Nav. Go ahead, RV. Another move, please. We're going to do 50 meters, five zero meters, bearing one zero zero at zero decimal three knots. Good copy. I've got five zero, zero, zero meters bearing zero, one zero zero, zero speed decimal right. three. Is that correct? Good copy. Good copy. Stand by for input. And coming up on the another edge of this elevated sea floor here as it drops away from us. RV Nav Bridge move is initiated five zero meters bearing one zero zero speed decimal three. Good copy. And Bob Carney tells me that those um, those the sediment little craters or holes or that form rings I must be from a while is still a mystery. Correct. We have not figured around. out who makes them, whether they are uh, produced by a single organism a buried in the sediment turn or, or no, all at one time, it produces them basically as it's living there, or different holes are produced over a period of time, or what. Uh, I've seen them in the Bahamas and uh, in the Pacific, and here, of course, and I imagine they're ubiquitous in, the, in much of the deep sea. And that's a pretty steep slope. That looks like it's getting towards... 35 degrees or so. That's uh, 
That's steeper than anything we saw yesterday, that's for sure. And as we move forward, you can see all of this fine particulate material in the water. We call that, that marine snow. That only take five minutes. And it's gonna uh, bring when you, if you happen to go uh, swimming, yeah. jump off a boat in blue water out in the ocean, uh, frequently the water looks very, very clear. Certainly when you look down on it, it looks clear. But if you were to go into the ocean at night, you'd see lots of that uh, with a light. You'd see lots of fine particles. There's a tremendous amount of suspended material in the sea, f in the sea at all depths. And what we're seeing here is a combination, as I said, it's called marine snow. It's a combination of uh, dead particles, organic particles mostly. Um, detritus is what we call that, dead organic material, <coughs> dead plankton, uh, fecal material, um, molted exoskeletons, um, and wherever you have a, a, um, okay, video we got a, a particle of organic material, it will be colonized by bacteria. And what do we have here? There is a tiny little half-buried hermit crab. Is that a trophon shell, uh, Diva? Good spot, ROV. Yes, indeed. So hermit crabs, of course, uh, are not true crabs. They only have that two pairs of long walking legs. You can't see the claws, which are on the other side. And then, uh, like their relatives, the true shrimps and crabs and lobsters, they have an additional pair of walking of, of legs behind those two you walking zoom, legs. You can take it. But they're small, That's and nice. they've got oh, patches top. of scale-like spines that they use to press out against the shell and hold them in place. And it looks like there is a tiny little anemone um, on the front left side of that shell. There's a, an, a, an awful lot of, um, there, are, there are an awful lot of uh, symbiotic relationships between hermit crabs and a variety of anemones. Uh, we saw some the other day where as the uh, hermit and the anemone grow, the shell apparently dissolves or breaks down or whatever, and the anemone for, uh, basically forms, curls around its bottom, its base, and forms a sh uh, the equivalent of a shell okay, for video the hermit crab. Very cool. And so that little shell is probably I'm no more a little bit than half an inch across. That was yeah, a I very good spot pilot and video very very good so uh, to wrap up that story or to pursue it a little bit um, the uh, the marine snow is colonized by bacteria and that is a major sort of unsung sure. on top, component yeah, of ocean food webs because other microorganisms, yeah, less slightly larger, spin. will feed right. on the marine snow and the bacteria. Uh, slightly larger organisms will feed on those little organisms. Turn start with me. And then, of Copy. course, those organisms will poop feature. out so waste material, which again will form so marine snow and be colonized by, by other bacteria. So you have this entire little loop of um, uh, we, do, we can do 30 the meters at 130. Even before it reaches the sea floor, that goes round and round yeah. and round, and the uh, uh, one, four, five. chemical one, four, five. Uh, nutrient yeah. okay. this is a good circulation one. in that, that. Uh, yeah. 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 loop is extremely important in, there? in the economy of the open ocean. Yeah. What direction is that, Sean? South. There's a deep crater. Quite the crater, huh? So I'm looking at it right now, and I'm looking due south. That moves almost done. Somebody's there Get right on up. the rim. That looks like it might be Video, a uh, <coughs> zoom here. Let's see what that is. That is a uh, Is that a uh, 
What kind of eel is that? Lasers are. Is that a duckbill eel, a netostomid? Oh. Look at how. Depression up on. How. Uh, as well. Well defined Same the that's units of its lateral line four, five, are. That's its vibration that sensing time. system. So and I think that might be an Iliophus synaphobranchid. Um, no, hopefully okay. Tracy will weigh in. Um, yeah, he says it's a yeah. synaphobranchid. Yeah. Like Sorry, toward pie. 180 just to get you lined oh, up We again. saw some of these yesterday. Uh, what direction did you say? Dan? Well, I was saying we could get serious more. The species over we saw yesterday was yeah. Iliophus so bruneus. We could do 20 meters of um, I'm not sure if it's yeah. the same. Yeah. Or even uh, further over. What do you think, Sean? Uh, 180, I think, would be great. Okay. That'll put me like All just fishes on the have edge of some that? kind of lateral line uh, system pit. for detecting vibrations. And, and, and this one is okay. very, very distinct. Bridge, a series now. of uh, of units. Go ahead, Arby. That Other are Other move, please. Obvious. Two zero meters. Bearing 180 at 0 decimal and, 3 uh, Bob Carney mentioned that, that uh, uh, some time ago someone speculated that the that rings of copy. holes copy. Copy. Stand by and uh, multi hole furrows were the nests of crustacean colonies, Rotates like uh, the they, they thought perhaps product. like social yeah. insects, That's but good. interesting idea, but highly unlikely. Okay, video, we'll let it go when you're clear. Just quite the depression. Right, and uh, there is one of those uh, deep water shrimps. Good copy, Bridge. Thanks. Um, Go ahead, watch Probably Nematocarcinus with very, very long legs. Do a quick one on this uh, shrimp video, and then we'll maybe those depressions sure. on the left. Uh, time remaining on bottom. Very long antennae, very spider like or daddy long legs Off like bottom legs. Time. Will be for navigating over this soft substrate. 1538 local. So we're bound 1530 local. Thanks, video. All right. Will do. Okay. Might feel some tugs from a pilot. Really? Okay. And we'll some large right. burrows here we're in the crest right of this ridge. Getting closer to there. Yeah, is he lying? Uh, it's on back, top so. of the this ridge that we're on right now, be and then on top of this point up above. So we we're yeah. we're moving pretty yeah. quickly at 0.3 knots, right. surveying back and forth, and then we'll we'll quite get a bit past of activity this flatter uh, area as quickly as we can. Just there has been way up quite a bit of activity in this particular Over area. Looks like uh, at least three or four. Pilot, burrows. can we take a look down in that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Depression? Just a quick zoom, if anything. Yeah, down to see those white. They uh, do a quick snap zoom video on the base like of the like uh, tunnel burrows of the uh, fell down to the bottom. Uh, like deep sea blind three. lobster down here. That looks like some trash and mussel shells. Yes, or just mussel shells. Yeah, I don't see any trash. No. Um, but there definitely does look like um, those are it's Bathymorials big. mussel shells. Oh, I'm not sure which of the right. three species it is, um, but also you can see some blackened areas of sediment, very, the very shells, small, yeah. um, as well as an ophiroid or brittle star. Uh, so, yeah, just, again, it's like little clues that this area is or was geologically active at some point, um, but nothing too leading yet. Thank you, Pilot. Yeah, thank you, video. Big star down there. We're headed that way, so. So there was one more depression off to your port. Yeah, over here. Do you remember, right? We'll yeah. Grab it and sonar for you. I think I need to be up higher to see it. Should be off. I think it's this right here, actually. Oh, really? Because you're looking, you're looking, yeah, west right now. If you rotate port, I think it's. And there. Looks like that little yeah, yellow in, video. fellow. If we can get a zoom on that, yeah. that looks like the same tinafore we saw yesterday, comb jelly. But I have never seen, uh, apart from the one yesterday and this one, a uh, a yellow one before. With I guess that's the uh, um, digestive cavity in the middle that that's moves dark. About done, Sean. Um, if well, anyone can weigh in, it looks really like a low bait Tina 4 yet, I don't think. with these large um, lobes that have uh, tracts of cilia on them for collecting planktonic food. Kill lasers. Yeah. Lasers off. Sorry. The one we saw yesterday uh, was near one of the um, cold seeps with bubble streams and unfortunately had a bubble 
caught in one of its lobes that was uh, dragging it upward. Uh, or is that a, is, no, it doesn't look like commensal. That looks like uh, interior gut. I run out of tether. But look at how big those lobes are that stretch out to either side. Big elephant ears. And these, of course, are extremely delicate. Uh, they are, we call them comb jellies. And that brings up uh, the point that I made yesterday that um, the word jellyfish is a very fuzzy term. We should avoid it because jellyfish and jelly refers to... Um, those two words refer to a lot of different organisms. Uh, so this one, you might have seen little uh, flashes along it. These have, uh, there you see it again, they have uh, rows of uh, fused cilia, like little combs. Are we on the move? And the stop? beating of those uh, combs, the ship, the name, comb is done, jelly, drives still, still the water. Yeah. Still swimming, and yeah. that's not bioluminescence you're seeing. I'd, that's, I'd like uh, to get you more on The light is this, reflected uh, or refracted yeah, off the, uh, from the ROV's lights. Come wide video. I didn't really move forward that much, so I Very think it's still interesting. for some. Yeah. It doesn't really show it on high pack either. Yeah. I think the, the actual ridge top is a little offset from high pack. Copy. I meant uh, move. You can see how quickly it slopes move. off, so we need to get serious further over to starboard. You're, yeah. you're stretched out real far, Levi. Should uh, come okay. back a bit. Current is blowing me away a bit. Um, okay, so you're facing a little bit actually. The wall like way. 205 to 10. Okay, I had some mud in my skid that's kind of now decided to break off here. All right. We might be getting on the back side of this peak too. So peak. Okay, I got you. I see right. what I'm saying. Yep. Coming to port. Nothing indicating seeps so far. I think if you drive forward, though, there was a, I think another depression around here somewhere. I don't see it on sonar anymore, but yeah, it was definitely there earlier. I saw it too, Sean. Sorry, so uh, I went online to look up right. yellow tinafore, and um, this tinafore was seen uh, in the Gulf of you? Mexico by the Okeanos Traffic. Explorer back in 2014. And uh, the description of the photograph says a rare yellow tinafore caused quite a stir amongst our science team. Okay, it was later identified. Here we Can go. Zoom on this fish, please. Yep, video come in. As Lampoteus. Yeah, Lampoteus. Cruentiventer. Five seconds. There they are. So that's cool. We have a name for that Tina for now. Yeah. Let me write that down. So this also looks like um, a Sanafibranchid You Actually, uh, can I see the tail for a second? Video come out to acquire tail. Uh, maybe a halosaur actually. Yeah, you can turn. Kind of thrown by this one. Off. Tracy, the the, the body movement, the, the, the tail yeah, movement. Oh no! Okay, versions. neither of those. So Tracy said the saying this is a noto yeah. notocanthidae, um, which is a spiny eel. It's from the family notocanthidae. Um, so neither of the families we were suspecting, which were Halosauridae <laughs> and um, Netostomatidae. Sorry, Sanafibranchidae. Very nice video. Thank Look you, Tracy. That. Thanks, Tracy. And uh, that um, uh, text online from the uh, uh, Okeanos Explorer in 2014 said the um, that Tina for Lampocteus uh, Cruentaventer comes in a variety of colors, but it always has that dark blood red gut. Very cool. I learned something there. That's nice. Never saw anything like that before, but apparently it is rare. Hey, Chuck, this is Tracy. Um, that is a spiny eel, uh, Polyacanthanotus meridae. Very good. Thanks, Tracy. Is there any characteristic that um, uh, uh, there seem to be such a variety? Of course, we know there are large numbers of species, but is there a, what um, shouts at you from this fish that this is a notocanthid? 
Well, the, uh, it, it's not quite long enough to be a synaphobranchid. And on the back, what you can't see is a series of pre-dorsal spines. So that's how it gets its na name, the spiny eel. Uh, they go into a little groove there. So it's, it is related to the halosaurus. And like, like most of the eels and halosaurs, it does have a leptocephalus larva, but it's in its like own gross. order. It's not a it's true right eel. So we would call it a yeah. it's spiny eel, Here's just that. in the common name. Very good. Thanks very much. And... Um, for our listeners, a leptocephalus, which means little head, okay, we should, uh, uh, the larvae of, uh, uh, I guess, all eels, um, the majority of eels, is a very thin, uh, elongated, let's, uh, flat, let's get, let's um, like a long, the ridge, slender, so or forward and get uh, serious and get serious lanceolate back leaf with a, uh, a tiny little head at one end. Uh, turn with me, Sean. All right, onward. And still along this, oh, that looked like a little red tina four drifting by, perhaps, and a shrimp. Might uh, take a peek to port, just look for sonar, possible bubbles here. The dance, maybe Let's like see. one, two, five. One, one two, two, five. Zero. Yeah, I think it should. Yeah, I think one two five sounds good. Angle me about right. So the pilots are uh, looking to port here to see if the sonar can pick up any trace of bubbles. I don't see anything? Bridge, RV nav. Go ahead, RV. Another move, please. All right, what do you got? Fifty meters, five zero meters, bearing one two five at zero decimal three knots. All right, let me read that back. I've got five zero meters bearing one, two, five, speed decimal three. Is that correct? Correct. Copy, standby. So as this uh, marine snow eventually and very slowly settles to the sea floor, that contributes to this uh, superficial layer of tan, uh, rather flocculent okay, uh, organic material that covers much so of the sea yet. floor here. Give it a couple of updates. All right, we now bridge. Move is initiated five zero meters bearing one, two, five, speed decimal three. Good copy. All right, I don't see anything, Dan. All right, you know it's interesting. It one, two, um, five. Uh, All right. uh, Tracy Sutton's observations about uh, identifying nothing that notochaetid eel um, point up some interesting um, things about how we uh, yeah, maybe let's try this small fish. Is it taxonom away? Taxonomically oriented. Um, Scientists identify things. That looks like that's a midwater fish. And of course, we're viewing it uh, from its dorsal side. I guess that might be a. Oh boy, that'd be tough Stop to identify. For a second. Tracy, if you're there, maybe a bristle mouth? Zoom now. I have a feeling that's a lantern fish. Nanobrachia, okay. maybe. Okay. Uh, they, they're actually quite convergent once they get really deep. Yeah, I think that's the, I think that's a lantern that's fish, nanobrachium. It's, it's really too big to be cyclothonian. You see how it swims slowly? Uh, cyclothonian basically swims like a heating mass. Oh, okay. Just trying to get away from At, me. Uh, Tracy Sutton is the king of midwater fishes in the Gulf Snap of it, Mexico. He's been, uh, sampling them for a number of years and uh, knows them back as backwards and forwards as anyone and keeps finding new species. If he starts away, we'll let it go. When's your next cruise? Uh, we will be heading out next August on the point chair. Now, as we look at it further, that does look like a cyclotony, but it is really huge. Well, it's tough to say because we don't have the lasers on it. I mean, it could be really close to the to the ROV. Try to get lasers on. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, I guess some, uh, as, as fishes get really big, they often uh, change their swimming mode. So okay. the fact that that one hasn't just taken off like and it's swimming really slowly, my guess is that Cyclosony obscura, Giant which is the uh, dominant. Uh, yeah, that is definitely a Cyclosony. And if it has no photophores, it's Cyclosony obscura, uh, which is the probably the that. numerically dominant fish of the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, that's very cool. Thanks, Tracy. Right, so unlike on. the um, fishes of the sea floor, the midwater there. fishes are typically black. Um, this is this uh, is this one likely to be a vertical migrator? All right, still lined up at about one. Like two, the other, uh, if it is cyclotony, right. it is not. They they do not vertically migrate. My other guess, just based on size alone, would be uh, Sigma sea longata, but. I, I would so stick with cyclotomy the way it was, it was just hanging out like that. Yeah, very cool. So the midwater fishes like cyclothony and the lantern fishes that Tracy mentioned are typically black as opposed to the ones along the deep sea floor, which are that gray, dark gray, light gray, and even white. That was a five zero meter move. And what do we yes. have here? We, I mean, we can stop it if we need Drifting to. Yeah. by. That might have been a larvacean. And look at these, uh, this digging around these mounds and burrows in the sea floor. Yeah, we haven't seen any look. residents yet. Remember, our laser dots are Come only in, 10 partial. centimeters apart. That's about four, mi four inches. So that's a, not a big burrow. That's only four inches across. And. Uh, a little bit of sargassum heaped up at the entrance. Doesn't look very active left. because we don't see any new sediment um, cast out Inside in front the, of it. Uh, the burrow. All right, I can uh, inch my way closer. But when you don't have the lasers on it, you have no idea of how big it is. You know, that could be a yawning tunnel that you could drive a car no. into if you didn't know anything about sargassum. It's just sediment. But it's only four inches across. I don't see anybody Only home. sediment. No one's Thank home. you, video. All right, video, come wide and get clear. Okay. Okay. Let's do some uh, scans laterally here. Copy that nav. I'm looking northeast. And let's see. It's a nice line. You can see the serious cam. It's perpendicular. It's right in front of you. See it? Oh, yeah. trail that goes and uh, Tracy uh, mentions in the chat room that that spiny eel, uh, the name of it was Polyacanthonotus meritai, and he thinks the bristle mouth was okay, in, okay. The, in the water column, the north, dark slender fish, yep. was Cyclothony obscura. We'll see a lot. Nope. Okay. Looking down at me at the name of that uh, spiny side. eel, the species name, come to port. Uh, Merit Eye, uh, points up one of the I'm things, starboard. one of the several Excuse ways me. we can, uh, taxonomists can name species. So the, the primary way, of course, is to give it a, a new species, Scan a name that reflects its dominant that characteristic, the thing that distinguishes yep, it, it from... Uh, other species. So, uh, um, you can also name it after the place that it was found, although that's usually that turns out frequently to be problematic because uh, organisms are usually found in more than one place. So way back when, at the beginning of the 19th century, I think it was uh, south to be uh, Lamarck, uh, he was uh, an extremely important okay, biologist in Paris. And at the beginning of the 19th look. century, uh, uh, he came Nothing up with, obvious. I believe it was he who came up with yeah, the term much. biology. And uh, so the explorers, the French explorers who were going all over the world, would send back troves of exotic new species and artifacts and things. And he named an enormous number of organisms. And he was sent this one enormous shell, a helmet conch, which uh, he gave the species named Madagascarensis too, and uh, because the information he was given uh, indicated Are that it was from the island of Madagascar. Well, it turned yeah. out it was from the Caribbean and Florida. 
So we now have Cat so Cassis Madagascarensis uh, in the Florida Keys and the Bahamas One, and uh, the Caribbean. So that's a, a shortcoming of naming something after well, where it was found. We do Another want to kind of tend toward the north thing you can do, as this spiny uh, eel yeah. uh, name indicated, is you can name it, it can after be, uh, someone as an honorific. Uh, this has got a long tradition uh, uh, going back to Linnaeus go of naming things. Linnaeus, of yeah, course, there was no uh, was off Swedish there, National we'll Science Foundation the, when the Linnaeus side. was working yeah. in the 1700s. Uh, yeah, yeah, like we have the NSF to today yeah, or that. other yeah. agencies like NOAA to support scientific research. So he relied largely on private patrons. And so he would name lots of species but and so genera much after the, the people feature, so who helped correct. support uh, him. Yeah. Um, yeah. The yeah, sunflower genus yeah. Rudbeckia, Bridge, he named after uh, Go ahead, Nav. Olaf Rudbeck. Yeah, can we please and move so the uh, spiny 50 eel meters? That's five zero meters. Named Merit, I assume after an ichthyologist named Merit. Uh, but you can also name it after the person Roger who collected that. it. Roger that. Position move. Range five zero meters. Bearing zero seven five. Speed decimal three. Contributed substantially in the field. You don't name it after yourself. The That's not rock. the done thing. And another um, thing to do is to uh, name it. Uh, you know, wax a Come little literary video. or uh, poetic. Um, so right. I told this story the other day. I'll tell it again because I really like it. When I was a graduate student at the University Nav of Miami, bridge. one of my classmates worked on parasitic Gilbert. isopods. Position move initiated, range 5, zero meters, bearing other zero 0.75, speed and decimal 3. And he uh, found a new species of this of parasite that parasitized a small shrimp. It lived under the carapace of the shrimp and swelled it up so it looked like the Did you copy that? shrimp was uh, copy, okay, had a good. cut plug of chewing tobacco in its cheek. But, uh, of course, it was a parasite. And the shrimp, little guy, only uh, uh, generally less than an inch or so long, the genus name was Thor, after the Norse god of thunder. Don't ask me why. Maybe somebody ashore can help me. Uh, but I don't know why anyone named that genus Thor. At any rate, he found this parasite that uh, attacked only the genus Thor. And what do you suppose he named it? Loki, uh, Thor's nemesis in Norse mythology. So you can wax poetic and literary in naming things as well. Another muscle, Diva? Yeah, can we have a quick snap zoom? Yeah, video, go ahead and come in. So yeah, this looks like another mussel shell, Bathymodiolus. This one's obviously been here for some time. It's got quite a lot of hydroid growth on it, um, or foram growth, whichever that may be. Um, but it'll be one of three species in the Gulf, um, Bathymodiolus childressi, uh, Bathymodiolus brooksi, or Bathymodiolus hecari. And this looks more intact. We've got both valves there, it looks like, although they are very worn and overgrown. And so these are one of those, this is one of the species can, uh, that right will exploit pilot. those chemical laden um, fluids emanating from the sea the floor just fine. below the sea surf sea floor surface yeah, um, for minutes. their nutrition. They utilize chemosynthesis, which is where food is created happen, from chemicals rather than right, photosynthesis, where food is created Thank from you. light. And instead of there being primary producers such as bacteria, I'm no, um, sorry, such as plants Bumpy, in the surface uh, layers of the ocean, um, as well as on land, ahead, on the of course, in the deep port. sea, we don't have light down here. Oh, yeah. um, it's very cold, it's very dark, it's very high pressure. But that absence of light yep. means that in, st in select areas, such as cold seeps, hydrothermal vents, sometimes at whale falls and wood falls, um, we will get chemosynthesis being a primary form of energy and in those cases bacteria will be the primary producers if only we could find where that came from <laughs> and uh, Tracy mentions in yeah. the chat room that yeah. the spiny eel was named after a gentleman named Nigel Merritt it's kind of mine it's looking like almost north right I think it's just over there to turn to I think it's just a small copy. Yeah, it was just a small guy. Be 
because we're on the move. Yeah, yeah. Because it was small and I didn't see any part returns in there. We should keep moving down the ridge here. Copy. I agree. All these heading changes help our watchers aren't getting too turn around. Okay. Uh, Caroline, if uh, Caroline, if you are still online, I'm not sure if you are. Um, Looks like the ridge can you um, offer to uh, the north and some information? Yeah, is it these down. depression? You, I think you mentioned it earlier, but uh, I'd like to hear it again. I didn't catch all of it. The depressions we're seeing on, in this case, on either side of this uh, topographic high or bathymetric high. Are they uh, are the depressions somehow associated with the um, the underlying um, hydrocarbon, uh, or are the uh, these elevations associated with the underlying salt or anything like that? Is what is the well, if there is nav. any obvious connection between the um, underlying I'm just geology with and these, the topography uh, of the sea features? Would we expect them to be on the Local sure high like this, yeah, or would they oh, tend to be are. more on the side of the slope? I said earlier, um, there's a, a salt sheet under the whole northern Scotland of Mexico. And if you were to look at a bathymetric map of the area, it looks like okay. it's been popped. So, our, in a very our, is our scale. search pattern ef so effective here? I mean, we're just kind of going back and forth across the local high. Salt diet here. So, these are uh, salt is less dense than the surrounding rock. It becomes mobilized under pressure. Also corals. And so these things yeah. that look like mostly like mushroom clouds kind of come up from deep deep in the sediment. And they often right. underlie okay. the high um, areas. Well, I think we're quickly approaching the back side of this first feature. So I think not, for not too long no from now, we're going to just move quickly across this flatter area obviously. up to the second so those mini basins are areas where you can get sort of regular sediment kind of piling up. The steep tend to follow. It's interesting. We're salt, seeing which tend to be around the edges, the top of the. I thought this was the side of the of the feature just sloping down and into the, the flatter terrain. Yeah, that's that's what but it is a big basin. Maybe we should hop down there. The rise I can turn there real quick. of these. Salt by appears up through the sediment. Yeah, there's nothing the in front of me. I think the move is almost done. So there's hydrocarbon in a lot of different places down there. Uh, Bridge, Ravi, now. Right, Ravi. Can we please bring the ship to an easy methane, stop here? Liquid, yeah, I can pass uh, it. Hydrocarbons we know about yeah, in so this area. I am getting a sonar return. You can range me out. So a lot of different things, the brines also get mobilized up to the fall. Bridge, we're on station. Thanks, Bridge. Stand by. Yeah, this is a big depression. Maybe we should hop down there. The what do you think? We're going to zoom down into the depression. Yeah. Video come in. Um, let's uh, let's get a move much. in that direction. Looks yeah, like there's some stuff that. down there. Copy. So that's going to be and, uh, a little we're west. We're looking down uh, into one of these depressions center. here. And, uh, yeah, there's quite a collection of mussel shells like here. 330. 330. We'll just go ahead and do 30 meters. Uh, Copy. Yeah, so this is getting a little bit more promising. Um, Bridge, are we now? We're actually seeing quite a, a you know a group of these Go ahead, shells with ship move please we'd like three zero meters again, bearing three three um, zero at zero decimal three knots Mariola shells uh, perhaps several different species right, i'm not I'm sure and they could be three, zero meters, clam three, shells three, in between zero, it's a bit hard three, to is that tell. correct that's correct um, um, stand by for but right the fact that we're seeing a slightly larger community that may have existed once upon a time um is promising, and then in the foreground we've got this halosaur um, fish as well. We can also see that the sediment down in the depression. All right, we bridge. Who's initiated three the, zero meters bearing three three yeah, zero speed pressure. decimal three? Um, it's slightly Copy. discolored. That black color indicates um, anoxic sediment, so there will be reduced compounds which turn the sediment into that black color as well as in some areas you can see some white glowing in between and that those are bacterial mats which move in to exploit these anoxic environments um, and are, can be very thick in some places sometimes and those will be the primary producers that I was referring oh, to geez. at these habitats. So this looks a little bit better. Okay, we may have produced a small avalanche. Yeah. 
Definitely the bottom of that. Um, Danny thinking acquire the top. Kind of the northbound ridge, acquire the northbound ridge. Yeah, why don't okay. we continue up and we'll go up the other side of this depression. And Can we just get there. a couple more views down? Yeah, this, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, and Sirius is moving closer to you, so you'll get some more tether here momentarily. Coming down in here. Just going to range your sonar down a bit, 30 meters. All right. Getting you closer video here. Coming down in the crater. Whole collection down here. Well, I'm actually standing up right. I think. Just be aware since we're moving down slope, Okay, Sean, so there's definitely a mixture you know, of yeah. both clam and, and muscle shells. The muscles yeah, will be the. It. Dark brown uh, ones are very lower, shiny yeah. inside. Okay, video you can, um, especially because I don't get out uh, see that larger than the right. clams, you but just video? at the bottom of the screen, right. about to go off screen, about um, just above, there'll be a more circular shell, uh, just to the left of the left laser, and so that is a clam shell, and so those are the two dominant chemosynthetic bivalves that you get at Gulf of Mexico seeps. Um, the clams tend to be buried down within the sediment where they can mine that sulfur rich fluid um, and so normally they are not easily seen um, they can be just below the surface with their siphons protruding perhaps a little bit of their shell or completely um, will be not able to see them at all oh, then so me. also there'll be the muscles which altitude. tend to sit with about a third of their body this. sitting within no, the I sediment really had one. and they That's exploit the methane right. rich chemicals um, or the methane rich fluid sorry in these uh, areas of seepage. So two different bivalves using two different energy sources, though there are some muscles, bathymodulus muscles, that do tend to use both um, sulfide-rich yeah, chemicals like tail is, uh, uh, as well as 12 and a half meters above the bottom. Fluids. Good. I guess it's just a way yeah. for nutrition to be spread between the various, um, you know, thousands of animals that could be found in these environments sometimes. It's a way to partition out that nutrition. There's also a little crab hiding below one of those shells, um, just to the right. As well as here you can see that, that reduced sediment much better, that black, those blackened areas, um, as well as the bacterial mats which will just be growing on top of those blackened areas. Okay, video, come wide. Move, keep moving here. Yeah, if pilot, if we could just move up this channel for yeah. um, just you know a minute or two. Absolutely. Think that moves about done. Yeah. So you want to move at three zero three five? That works for us, keeping pace. So. Yeah, watch, there's something else you wanted to zoom in on this kind of debris field before uh, we... Yeah, so just um, out of shot above us, well, yeah. further yeah, in yeah. front of us, um, they were just, you know, uh, it ca seemed to carry on this little channel of yeah, bacterial mats. So shot. I just wanted to make sure we yeah, covered everything that. before we moved out. Ex yep. Thank you. We'll do. It's kind of looking up the northeast side of this depression, and there's the top. So we're going to acquire the top on the north side of the depression next. RV Nav Bridge, we finished the move. Good, good copy. Ship moves complete. It's quite the depression, isn't it? Yeah. So maybe, Sean, if you want to turn your head. Yeah, kind of follow. Follow where D2 is looking now. That'll be good for keeping on track Copy that. and where science wants to go. Do you want to snap on this? I'm just, my curiosity's got me what this is. Just no, that's just a little uh, dark um, anoxic black sediment with a pale bacterial mat in the middle. Okay, video can come wide as I... And you can see the sediment has got tiny little yeah, holes like in it, zero two zero both uh, medium and zero large. Three zero uh, somewhere in there. Uh, well, very small, just a few millimeters, and and uh, 
less than a millimeter across. I think we might, we're yeah. going to start heading down slope here um, a bit. That agrees with the serious sonar. Um, I'm pretty much pointed there. Okay. Lined up with detail. Um, okay, you guys, what are you guys taking for the next move? Zero, two, zero or so. Um, we're going to start moving down slope on the back side of this feature. Copy. It's pretty steep. Yeah. It's okay. I can saddle it. Yeah. And it won't be very... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Sean, you'll just want to stay nice and high. Um, and what I'd recommend is, you know, we get, so you don't want D2 to be out too far it's in front. Over you want to yeah, stay more underneath, and yeah. then you can, you have the tether to kind of turn around, face into the slope, and look at stuff as we hop down. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Why don't we look at that first? <laughs> yeah. That looks promising. That looks promising. Perhaps. Oh, down and below too. All down, right. down there. Yeah. There's uh, uh, yeah. some shining yep. off in the distance. Let's, so uh, this let's get serious face we'll that direction. Down slope when so that's that looks east, east, very good. Right. So Don't this, move out these too are like far the first ahead. little pieces yeah, of the carbonate we're seeing. Um, orthogenic carbonate, which form um, as a res purely as a result of microbial reactions um, so in these areas of seepage. And just down so? to the left looks like a seep. Yeah. Maybe. Should we do 30 meters, one zero zero? Um, yeah, that works. Almost there, lined up. And is, this is that bearing sound right to you, Sean? Yeah, okay. I think that should put me right um, over top. Okay. Bridge, Jarvi Nav. Stood up a little bit of set it to my starboard side there. Bridge, ROV nav. Go ahead, ROV. Another move, please. Can we get 30 meters? That's three zero meters, bearing one zero zero at zero decimal three knots. Copy that. I'm going to read that back. Three zero meters, bearing one zero zero speed decimal three. Is that correct? Good copy. Copy. Stand by for input. Okay, the answer time with this. We're talking further over so you can look at this for now yeah, okay. until we get moving and yeah. then we'll hop down into the yeah. other bed there okay all right we now bridge moves initiated three zero meters bearing one zero zero speed decimal three copy so it's interesting in uh with regard to cold seeps and chemosynthetic habitats sediment, uh, um, in those areas, Cloud they can form in sort of two main point. ways. The first is as a result of like geological a, activity yeah, it's where they'll down be slope. fracturing yep. and hydro hydrocarbon rich fluids will uh, Not much current today. seep out of those fractures and create these chemosynthetic habitats. The other way that I've seen them formed is where there'll be a huge it, slump lateral. of materials. So on a very steep slope, away. for instance. Okay. Um, this was noticed at the Kikim Jenny submarine volcano in the Southern Caribbean. A huge part of the volcano side collapsed onto itself. And as a result, it covered a bunch of organic material. Um, and then over time, that decomposed and, s and created fluids that were okay, rich in methane and sulfides. And those slowly uh, emanated out of the seafloor, right, providing the time. necessary fuel right. for a chemosynthetic community. So obviously, very, it's the former in this today. case. Um, the Gulf yeah. of Mexico is an extremely yeah, really uh, geologically nice. active we'll area. Um, and of course, there is a huge amount of hydrocarbon seepage, as is evidenced by the um, okay. yeah. number of oil rigs out here. You know, yeah, every day uh, on the ship, we, can we see we pass several oil rigs per day. Um, and that's because they are exploiting the huge amount of oil and gas, natural gas in the region here and those so cold seeps and chemosynthetic communities are intrinsically linked with those hydrocarbon deposits so yeah. tracy Turn any on. idea what this is it's in it has its own little house yeah it's hanging out in a depression 
It's a it's an Ophidia form, a cusk eel, and if Andrea Cotrini is on the line, she would really be the ones that can tell these apart by sight. Thanks, Tracy. And I just got a, a notice from... Oh, go ahead. I was just saying I don't see her, so I'll take a screen grab and... Oh, wait, I see her on here. Yeah. So Andrea can tell us. I'll wait for her her chat. Okay. okay. And uh, just let me know while we're waiting for that, um, I got a note from Mike Vecchioni at Smithsonian um, that... Um, the red squid we saw dart by briefly yesterday. Um, he did some homework, and um, he's pretty sure that it was called Neotuthis theoli. There's another uh, species name named after someone. And it was very it. unusual, and he thinks that it's the first time that squid has ever been seen in its natural habitat, as opposed to uh, caught in a net and looked at under a microscope. Very good. Thanks, Mike. Okay, video. I think uh, when you're clear, this clear fish has uh, such a puppy dog I'll move on. look about it. So interestingly, the <coughs> expedition coordinator just came in and um, let us know that in the EK60, we're actually picking up really intensified bubble streams in the distance, um, which we are moving towards. So that's pretty promising. All right. We need to get you and, a little more uh, of a motion. Andrea uh, um, chatted in it that doesn't have this too much may left. be, and this meters. is a yeah. tough one to Do you like that same say. direction, or do you want to yeah, uh, Cate ticks. Okay. That's C-A-T-A-E-T-Y-X. As as Cate ticks. Lateceps. L-A-E-T-I-C-E-P-S. And we have... We have a Bridge, Arvi Nav. Look at that. Go ahead, Arvi. Yeah. Is that shit move done? Is that Brian? Uh, oh my god, 1.5 meters. Um, yeah, we're we'll approaching the end of it now. <laughs> okay, we have another move ready uh, as soon as you are. Go ahead, what do you got? Look at that. Another three zero meters bearing 100 zero zero at zero Looks like a three. distant view of a city. All right, it's a good copy. Three zero meters, one zero zero. Nice. Three decimal three. Stand by, the friend. Left side of it before I go. Thanks, Bridge. Up. Looks like we've uh, found what we were looking for. Is that a brine pool down there? That gray. Uh... It looks like it, doesn't it? Feel free to lose, kids. So we're going to be here for a while, so <laughs> don't put any ship moves in. Are we yep, we're just getting serious position to get views on this, and we'll keep it stopped. Actually a fish. Go ahead, Bridge. Hang out. Been initiated 3 0 meters, so bearing 1 0 0, speed decimal 3. That's and good before copy. we we'll probably in here, early, Andrea yeah, confirms yeah, that it is Kete yeah. Tix Latticeps. Yeah, but you can zoom in on fish before it gets away from us, and then we'll. <laughs> Get overview of this seat and uh, before we get to too, the so brine, maybe is this another one? Off. Looks similar, paler though. And paddle fins, look at that. So in surrounding the fish, we can see some more of these dead um, mussel shells as well as some live ones. So oh the yeah. live ones are more intensely colored. Um, and you can the see they're orientated so with okay. their Keeping bodies, bridge, and their hinges. Sure, can zoom out um, so that'll be the area we'll where the bivalve is <laughs> actually buried within Every the Every time sediment. I call up, there's a new voice. Uh, we're going to go ahead and bring the ship to an easy stop here, please. Easy stop by. Thank you. Just want to explore the extent of this watch lead. Yep. Just so I have a. We have an overview here. That's fine. All right, Pat. So I'm moving kind of to so the center. So yesterday we encountered a very center, small asphalt seep where you can actually see the zoo. viscous asphalt, you know, leaking out of the sea floor so right and forming these dropper, you know, you know extensions um, that was something I've never seen before in person and something that was sure. incredibly yeah, exciting um, to me zoo. personally. And like when down. I got on the ship, yes, I said the one thing that I accurate. wanted to see that is cool. was a brine seat, right. um, a brine pool. And nice shot, Levi. I do believe yeah. this is, I mean, it's not a very deep one or a big one, but um, I do believe this is a brine pool. How's your position, Sean, if we're holding here? Is that about I right? I think I'm pretty centered, yeah. Okay. That's right over top. smoky. Well, it does, doesn't good. it? Now, Bridge. So, brine pools are areas We've come to an easy stop or stationary. Um, Thank you. Super, super salty water is seeping out of the out of the floor. Um, that water can be three to eight times um, 
that of the normal surrounding seawater. And as a result of that saltiness, it's much denser than the seawater. And so that means that they basically settle yeah. out and form these lake-like yeah, environments that in some places actually have shorelines. You know, they look just like lakes on land, which we can see here. Sometimes they're fringed by mussels, um, which form this sort of beachy area. Um, Carefully don't touch your toe but down, stir it up. This is, this is amazing. Yep. I'm trying to get pretty low. And right on the left side there, as we uh, come over this, you can see exactly what Diva said. It looks like a shoreline right, with a different a zones, a gray yeah. adjacent to the pale Go brine the, uh, and a little uh, black uh, further on before seat, you get to the normal um, uh, underwater yeah, sediment. Just, so you're looking basically as it like a, a four, at a lake yeah. underneath the ocean. Yeah. Which four, is crazy. I've had us poke it with the uh, temperature probe before. Yeah. Yeah, watch, is there a specific area you'd like me to... No, I'm if just we could um, just kind of do an overview yeah. of the entire area, and then we may want to get some great zooms after. Absolutely. That'd be great. Thank See you. See the ripples yeah. down there on the bottom? That's yeah, video. You that would be great to get, yeah. Go ahead and zoom at will. So brine pools um, are pretty common right, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they're the formed as a result sure. of yeah. uh, the geological stops, so yeah. nature of the just area just during the Jurassic. Uh, the Gulf was a shallow it. sea that then dried out. So Annie's and it produced an extremely thick today. layer of salt, uh, make which sure was to get about a lot of eight nice kilometers shots if we can. thick, yeah, unbelievably. And as the Gulf then reopened to other oceans over geological time, it filled with seawater. We'll uh, and that salt wave slowly right be became, um, started to dissolve. Um, dynamic situation. But before it dissolved, it became very, very covered with sediment. And so continued to be covered by these progressive layers yeah, of sedimentation. And as a result, it became preserved. Video. Sorry, And then after that, the, um, yeah. the overlying sediment, again, this is over... You know, nice thousands, point. hundreds of thousands of years, if not more, um, millions of years. And uh, once that, that sedimented layer um, and salt bit, below yeah. it was preserved, the overlying sediment became really, really heavy on top of that Let's salt and deformed can. that salt. Um, and as here. a result, it caused a lot of movement, and so, which is kind of known as salt tect tectonics. And... Um, so then often what happens is the salt layer will then penetrate through the sediment and create this dome where it'll get potentially or get squeezed out. And yeah, that causes shot, sediments serious, to kind of yeah. drop yeah. away. This is cool. And so this when the salt the does hit the seawater, which is what we're seeing here, it forms this hypersaline solution that can be, you know, between three and eight times the salinity of the surrounding seawater. And that salt migration can then penetrate into hydrocarbon deposits, which is, of course, what is extremely abundant here in the Gulf of Mexico. And, of course, it then manifests as these lakes at the bottom of the sea. How's the lighting, Bob? Think uh, Carolyn has it uh, posted oh, some things bad. in the chat okay. room nice about right um, in front of us. Uh, using the uh, sonar to detect bubbles which will allow us to focus in on where the uh, seep is located. Um, I'm not sure I can interpret that. Um, Look, all right, Chuck, my point here had to do with the fact that uh, when you saw the bubbles in the EK-60, I think Brian came in and mentioned that to you guys, um, you're actually not very far from it as, as the ship goes. Okay. Um, of course, I don't know where the ROV is on the seafloor. The other point I made here we saw this action? from people on the line we'll remember a few years ago is that um, yeah, there are muscles here within the brine you got what? If you drive forward uh, I got turned around yeah I think if you drive forward fine I mean, probably because the brine came out and yeah just follow the, the uh, pool so there we did occasionally see like a little um, a little bathroom in the brine pool right? sometimes a few yeah. years ago where there would be right. live muscles but this is uh, you come in on these look pretty dead to me but when I always say something that? Thank you, Carolyn. Um, so, I mean, there's so much to say today. First out. of all, this oh, is exploration, yeah. people. Um, we were able to use our ship last night to refine our targets, and Sorry. it has led us to this exploration with our ROV, this fantastic new brine Looks pool. Like no one has ever seen this before. We had no idea this existed right. in this area this until now. Um, and Eric Cordes has just jumped on the chat right and said perhaps this clamped. could even be a brine river 
interestingly. Um, so, of course, here. that would just mean it sort of flows downhill. Yeah different species um, and as carolyn was saying this was obviously uh, had a different yeah. um area of, of seepage Weird once so. before yeah, where on. all of these oh, mussels yeah. were living That's and cool. then see the it basically propagate. flooded these mussel beds and killed most of them you can see they're sort of brown in color um or blacky in color and the shells may be open in some cases and then again on the fringes of these you environments you've the got live mussels or perhaps yeah, in the little, little highs within the brine um, you'll see thriving mussels because here. obviously too much brine um, or s some other kind of chemical within this isn't this uh, favorable yeah. for mussel growth. Um, Eric is suggesting that the, the white is probably barite precipitate. Um, but so the hypersalinity in this area is lethal, we can now see. And um, I'm not sure if many of you saw the recent BBC Planet Earth, um, not Planet Earth, Blue Planet series, Blue Planet 2 series. Um, they visited a brine seep, a brine pool in the Gulf of Mexico. And there they were able to film an e-like fish. I'm not sure if it was a snaffle branket, but it, they would dart into the brine to try and, I guess, get food of some kind, you know, perhaps eat some mussel or whatever it is they eat. And this particular eel darted oh, into cool. the brine a little bit too much, <laughs> and then it sent it into almost like fits, where the the eel then started like basically shaking uncontrollably and and writhing and into like knots and other things, and then sank into the brine. But then obviously it had like a last little kick of life and managed to pull itself out and swim away very slowly. Um, it was a really uh, dramatic bit of footage Eating? and not something I, I'd seen before, but I you do occasionally, I remember the Nautilus was diving here earlier, to, um, to maybe like 2012, yeah. 2015, somewhere so around thinking, there, and right they had some incredible imagery yeah. of brine yeah. pools there, and you could see the giant ice pods, those Bathynomus like, no gigantius, no. which are so charismatic, you can actually sediment. see them down in the brine, dead, so they'd obviously wandered over to the brine to, I don't know, find some food or whatever, and just maybe slipped or gone a little bit too far, and then that was the end of it for them. A, de a deep sea version of the La Brea tar pits. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, Diva, so I actually believe that the fish do the diving into the brine pool to kill parasites on them. Oh, that's okay, that's interesting. So, uh, maybe that's why I was doing it and then just did it away. one too many times. You and they look like there are uh, waves. I think Sirius is heaving sort of other and it's pushing this, uh, the in fluid the surface downward, of the brine, and then it's the, the causing the ripples to emanate from below where Sirius is positioned. Areas yeah. of that white that matches what we're seeing on D2. Barite yeah. precipitate yeah. moving yeah. across yeah. the brine, and there was an yeah. island yeah. Uh, uh, of uh, living yeah. mussels, a few good. living that's mussels still cloud. down there. Not uh, sure where that passed over earlier. Not sure where that's coming from. I mean, you're still so like 14 meters up. So most of our scientists are sure. Just this is just blown away by this sight. It's it really is incredible, and um, Eric soft, seems to suggest that yeah. this, those n ripples were perhaps natural, right. you know, evidence that it was flowing so downhill. And, and oh, he unless it's from before. suggests we may see the source of this further uphill. Which would be, I think, to so our just starboard. Because yeah, yeah, we right? came out of it. The uh, brine pool is the right starboard. Turn 180, and that's like, so it's coming from up But so the, the muscles surrounding these... Um, Brine pools can be, as we saw, they, as See, we said, they you know they sort of form the shoreline, so and in some places, yeah, bigger yeah. brine pools in the Gulf of Mexico, they can be Maybe at least three serious. to seven meters yeah, thick. Here, it's probably you know a little less than a meter in some places, but of course you do get other chemosynthetic um, com inhabitants of that community, S things like the Alvinacara shrimp we saw yesterday, um, narrated gastropods, Bathynarita natacoida. Um, so, as well yeah, we as some, some polychaetes, here. which um, I've only seen once before, yeah. the Methano large, large mammals, uh, yeah. which are, they're bright they red and very, very fluffy worms, and they yeah, basically Pretty thrive can, uh, off of up. the some methane in this Paris area. This um, those are described from a brine pool mussel bed uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and of course there are also like Munodops and squat lobsters, like we're seeing right in front of us, as well as scale worms, which are polynoids, and are the typical inhabitants of chemosynthetic communities. It's like a, it's that like also a looks like zoanthids or something. A big monster. I and we yes, some yes, those are uh, uh, the pale uh, polyps above that uh, white munidopsis look like zoanthid colonial anemones. And there's a shrimp. Is that yeah. Alvin Acaris next to the... Um, 
Unidopsis up there? Uh, perhaps. There are two Alvinacara okay. species in the area. I'm not sure which one of the two this may be. Those look a little bit different to the miracle I'm accustomed to, but... There's three of them. Uh, four. Like I over the pool because there's kind of turbid water. Five. Yeah. Um, wait for it to settle out before you move back over. Interesting little I'm community. Sure, I'm not sure which species of mussel. There may be, there may be more than one species. Um, perhaps some Bathymodiolus childressi mixed with brook's eye. Eric suggests that uh, at this depth, Alvinocaris muricola. Yeah, so, and as I was saying yesterday, a lot of these uh, species actually have quite large ranges. Um, geographically, they can be found from as far south. Oh, look at all those amphipods swimming around. Um, they can be found from as far south as uh, the Southern Caribbean and can come all the way up to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, video. Can you clear? So Dan, What's with, with all of uh, those little wavy things? Oh, whoa, things. what are those? Those look like little worms. Come in. Up and oh, they're and they're gone. gone. Oh, they're gone. Oh, yeah. my God, that was so weird. What so are they left. doing? That Take was it if you bizarre. Got it. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> That's bizarre. I think they're camera shy, too. A little they're below They're, like, wiggling here. into the sand to, like, hide or something, or? I think your toes touch down. A lot of, a lot of these amphipods. Away. Yes, look oh, at those okay. little amphipods all over the place. They look like little white commas. Uh, amphipods are in the same major group. Look at them all swarming. Are in the same major group as the isopods among the crustaceans. They uh, brood their um, eggs and uh, uh, early larvae in uh, can we, before a pouch. Before we zoom out, can we? Can we Curly worms, top right. Yeah. So look, these. I was just saying, there's an, a conspicuous absence of tube worms. Um, but if no. we're about to zoom in on more, what yeah. look like Sclerolinum contortum, which are um, a type of Sibilinid, mm. they are what we would have seen a couple dives ago, um, and they've got this extremely curly appearance, kind of like a ramen noodle. <laughs> And this is, so we've seen those curly worms once before, but the amphipods are a new, new thing. And uh, so we haven't seen them before all over the place. Tracking has been nice today. Yeah. Okay, video hundreds wide, and quick. hundreds of them. You watch, there's uh, anything else in this area you'd like to get a closer look at? No, yeah, if we could just or? continue looking yeah. around. Actually, if we could, does, uh, yeah. Find uh, some of those worms. Pan out and go down a little bit to the left of those rocks was the patch of mud uh, right center now, Kay. a little Come bit in. above right center now, where we saw those little, uh, we're a little bit above this. Uh, yeah, right about there was where we Got saw just briefly these little rapidly undulating, um, I, I guess there serious. is some kind of worm, come out of the bottom and then zip back in again. I don't know if we'll get a chance to see them again. You don't think they so? They were out very briefly. No, giving Sean oh. Time. Sean oh, I see. Don't, don't have co any clue it's what co they were. We got some... Uh, uh, we got a little dust in the air here. Love some me. of our... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll see them somewhere else okay. uh, uh, in the area. On, so on let's, the yeah, let's get out of the dust yeah. for a bit. It's like a it's our it's case. the cloud of sediment that we have kicked up ourselves. Yeah, we think maybe it's large mammals doing this. All right, what's going to be the direction here? That's so much. I've never seen that much sediment before. I'm trying to so I believe that yeah, Brian Lake or today. River was to our right, but then the slope slopes down again beyond here to the left. Hopefully. Well, I think they still want to look around like in this area for a bit longer. Um, before we leave this area, if we could yep. go back and get some, well, I'm not sure where the sediment dust cloud is. Yeah, I'm worried that. That might be over most of the stuff perhaps now. 
but just before we leave the area, if possible, if we could just get some more great shots. Yeah. And, um, and absolutely. then we can proceed. Of the pools you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'd very much like that. Yeah. Is there anything in this field of view you wanted to see, watch lead? I mean, sure, there always is. <laughs> just zoom in and we can see what's there. I'm sure there's a lot of small animals we're not actually picking up. Yeah, video, you can come in. Uh, you can turn lasers on. We can try to go back to that pool. Maybe the dust storm blew away. Maybe it's still there. Uh, we think it's possibly from Sirius heaving in a very light sediment um, situation. When, because we're going downhill, Sirius is closer to the ground than standard operating right. procedure here. Um, so I think that might be why. So these look like the ketopterids. They've got the tiny little tubes with the two palps extended out of them. And those are a type of polychaete worm. as well as some more dead mussel shells, um, a tiny little red shrimp on the underside of that carbonate overhang. Is this, um, 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 I guess Bob and Eric mentioned the pos well, I guess Eric first mentioned the possibility that the white material in the lake was barite and Bob uh, suggested the possibility that the white rocks are barite also. I don't know anything about that end of it. Let's do a little scan here. See if there's any new hair. Oh, squat lobster. Oh, yeah. The barite is very salty, and it can form as an evaporite, like scalite does. It can form uh, in a way that's mediated by biological reactions. There's a worm <coughs> waving. Yep, reactions. just went in. Um, it's often uh, in the world yeah, I Yeah, it's like in. they're it's pushing their way into the sediment or something. The marker bed. It's a sulfate reduction zone in sediments where there's been anaerobic oxidation. Just too fast for you. Um, no. But okay. all in all, barite is not an unusual occurrence in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, some places there are barite chimneys uh, that can build up uh, as a sort of precipitate in some of these steep uh, deep environments. Thanks very much, Carolyn. Okay, video, I think when you're clear, pilot's clear, and then. Uh, um, yeah, where would that, where should I drive to to acquire, reacquire seat, the pool? Uh, I can zoom in here. Should be directly after, right? Maybe. Yeah, it looks to your. All right, but you can come wide. Come to your starboard, and uh, it might just be so behind these, you a bit. Um, chemosynthetic habitats, brine pools, and um, cold seeps, and so on, are. Uh, as we can see here, a little oasis of life. I used that term a lot yesterday. Um, we just right, traversed nice a lot of sedimented emotions. areas. And yes, of course, there probably was quite a lot of animals, were quite a lot of animals living within the, the sediment, especially very small we're animals. But we came upon this brine seat or um, brine pool right. or river um, with these chemosynthetic communities. And you can see that there was this definitive margin almost where uh, suddenly there was just this huge abundance of life. Bingo. And that's because this area is extremely productive. Um, there is a huge abundance of food in the form of these right. hydrocarbon rich fluids. Uh, and then that is then used by the bacteria, which are here in quite high concentrations. And so that means that animals can then do you want a little move in that either direction, Sean? create their own food via internal or actually, bacteria maybe it's better if or stays away a bit. eat the bacterial mats, so which may be on the sea floor. And then on top of that, you'll get grazers Copy. coming in. Well, you'll get Crab sorry fish. predators coming in, such as this fish that's about to cruise by this, um, what Try looks like a macroorid as well as the Munodopsis squat lobsters and other um, large crabs and squat lobsters that will then make Bingo. the most of this productivity in the area. And even though they may not be oh. endemic to these areas, do tend to hang around and sort of capitalize on it. That fish had a really big parasite on it. What we could do is skirt serious forward, so but these also off the starboard. These chemosynthetic communities in the Gulf of Mexico tend to be less right limited by um, the geography, but more limited by depth. So you tend to get sure. different communities yeah. depending on the depth that they're at. So, we can move so it currently like we're at 1,620 meters. And so we kind of fall in, this seaport kind of fall into a bracket, which is 
deeper like than a kilometre. And so as a result, that will have... There'll think? be certain players, certain characters that like tend to exist at these seeps that then do not exist at seeps that are much shallower. You want to move a little, so a little further instance, away? So for instance, there'll be many snails, different snail species at, three, the, three at the shallower zero, seeps that then will... Uh, okay. be switched out in these deeper habitats for brittle stars and so on. Okay. Bridge, RV, Nav. Go ahead, Nav. Uh, we'd like a move of three zero meters bearing three, three, zero. And so zero this brine, as we were saying, is extremely dense. And in some brine pools, it's Roger, so dense that if the RV were to three settle zero down meters, on it, it would actually well float zero, speed on the brine. Two. And if That's it correct. wanted to, if the RV wanted to penetrate down into it, it would have to thrust down actively I just, I to be able to penetrate that brine. Bridge, RV now. Really incredible. Go ahead. Sorry, my mistake. I said 30 meters. I meant 10 meters. Ten. One zero meters. One zero meters, I. Thank you. So this looks like the Go dead end the of it off. right here. Mm. Thank you, Copa. Well, does it? I mean, there's not that many dead shells here. No, I mean the the of the pool. It looks like a uh, a dead oh, end of the pool. Oh, I see. Sorry. Yep. So there is a little bit of stuff in the water yet, but so you might consider flying at auto depth. Are those bubbles? So that you're not having to. Us? Yeah. Push too hard. That's still no, bridge. some of oh, our no, uh, sediment. Bridge. Position move initiated. Range one fine, zero fine meters, sediment. bearing three three zero. Speed decimal two. Good copy. Thank you. So it's really important for us to identify locations of these kinds of habitats because it'll then um, have repercussions in terms of the oil and gas industry, which is so pervasive in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the oil and gas industry as a result of BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, actually creates buffer zones around these types of habitats, um, which will mean that there can be no drilling of any kind um, within these areas, which is a really great... Uh, what's the word I'm well, looking for? It's good policy. Precedent. Yeah, yeah it's policy. Good policy. Good so by, by, by finding new areas such as this, um, we uh, can then feed that information back to BOEM and they can take the necessary. And could we have a quick snap zoom to uh, left of center or actually just in the center there that looks like a whole um, yeah, video little city of these fine upright tubes? There are so many uh, amphipods here. Which is very different to what we saw yesterday at the little so seeps. So these that are we both. These are the curly yeah. tubes and the straight tubes. Do we have any more zoom pilot? Yeah, video. Yeah, more um, zoom so yeah, so the curly tubes are Sclerulinum contortum, um, and I think those were actually described from the Gulf of Mexico. I'll rotate you down, video, to get you closer. And, and there's a little. Uh, is that a trophon <laughs> um, a gastropod? Uh, so it's uh, up above are. now. So, uh, it's but off then screen. there are some different, there are three types of tubes here actually, the super curly ones, which are the sclerolinum, then tiny little uh, thin white or black ones, and then also there was, oh, I just saw another th a third kind. I'm not going yeah, crazy. Yeah, There was one. just no, there definitely was a thicker three. one. Yeah. Oh, there's a worm a up there on below, the top. There yeah. it is. A couple of them below the right. But it's speculated that these amphipods these are not themselves chemosynthetic, but are actually bacterial grazers, making the most of the huge abundance of food in this area. That would make sense. Yeah, there's quite a, uh, a population boom of them here. Thousands. We have a cruise shift uh, going on right now. Another depression up there. I turned left, so you should turn right to maintain your turn. Yeah. Did you video? find a name for the amphipods? Uh, no, I'm not sure of the amphipods' names in this area. But in at least in the southern Car Caribbean where I've been working, there were actually 
swarms of amphipods. So they may not be the same species the on methane hydrate located there, spot. which is really okay. interesting because when you think and of methane like hydrate, you usually think of the ice worms, Hesiosica methanicola, which it was thought yeah. at one point when they were first found, because I mean, there are just so many Can't on this escape. methane hydrate, which looks like a big sort of snow cone. Um, you want to zoom in video? It was thought that they were using the methane. Um, the methane so chemicals, one of those worms. but instead it was found that they were actually grazing on bacteria which were growing on tighter? the hydrate, and it's thought that so the amphipods, amphipods could fill a, s a similar niche to that. Look at them all. Just They're busy. They're busy. Small ones, large ones. Yeah, so that could either be different species or perhaps different recruitment events. Yep. Different growth stages. You'd need a uh, suction device to collect one of the uh, some of these, or maybe you might get some with a core sampler. Now, Bridge. Go ahead, Bridge. Position move has been completed. Move complete. That was Thanks, great. Bridge. So we see another depression just over this little ridge here. Um, any interest in going and investigating that for other of communities? Course. Okay, we'll do that. So we're going to move on and investigate uh, another depression on the other side of this ridge. Where bridge you can see some of the Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like another move. Uh, one five meters bearing three three zero degrees. Uh, speed decimal two. Rock that uh, forms here, almost like Roger a broken that. Position pavement. Position move. Range one five meters bearing three three zero. And so this three, is zero, a great time to remind two. everyone that it was copy. close to thirty years ago. Is that right? No, more than 30 years ago. Um, that coal seeps, wow, more, oh, more. more. Um, <laughs> coal seeps were discovered in the Gulf of Mexico for the first time. So uh, that was in 1983 or 84. Um, and before then, 90, no, 1983. Um, ahead, so bridge. before then, there were no coal seams known. Five meters, um, the only chemosynthetic environments, apart from those in shallow Ooh, waters, like in um, anoxic mangrove beds and seagrass beds, that were known were from the, the, uh, the Pacific. Galapagos. Yeah, uh, so the Galapagos, we where hydrothermal vents had been discovered oh. in 1977. Uh, and that was a huge breakthrough. This is the first time that this oh. ecosystem was found uh, that existed um, without yeah. using, without I'll relying just, I'll just on take the a little sun peek over that exists on this completely new... Well, actually, uh, we're going to come back to this once Sirius catches up. We have we see a smaller depression just off the port we're going to take a peek at, and then we'll move down slope. Sure. It's kind of up ahead up here. Matt. Um, and uh, a, a little bit of personal history. I uh, I was on Is an Alvin real, uh, research cruise in the Bahamas just a small at... at that time and was offered a berth on one of the following Size expeditions to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, no. Could be a that, small, the one really that cool discovered seep. the cold yeah. seeps, and I couldn't make that's that. It's a young one, so that might have completely uh, changed the whales, course of my know, career. Anything. Yeah, definitely. Probably not. Doesn't so matter. in 1983, right, this deep sea expedition, um, following on might the heels of like those discoveries the in, in the Pacific in the Galapagos, um, where the you know of course these. Huge tube worms are found, meters long, with the bright red plumes, rifty opacoptilla, as well as this these Bridge over now. again oases Go on ahead. the seafloor. Yeah, can we hold present position, please? And so yes. during this expedition to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, on the Florida escarpment at a depth of about 3,200 meters, right. Alvin, the submersible, He's came across these dense muscle you, beds, Sean, um, which head. hosted such animals like limpets, snails, sea cucumbers, starfish, brittle stars, um, eel right. pout fish, like we saw so, yesterday. Uh, and of course shrimp, and uh, between those muscle beds were also thickets, bushes, if you will, of very large shoe worms that could be over a meter in, in length. Um, and of course, finding those habitats was extraordinary as it meant that sure. those chemosynthetic oases were not limited to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and Bridge at that time, Go ahead. nearly yeah, all like of the species uh, found in those meters, habitats were completely 10 degrees, new to science, one zero degrees. which is amazing. Two. I mean, if you look at this, there's at least 
at least of the big animals, we can see 20 Copy something that. species uh, also, position which tend to range dominate in these habitats. And all of those would have been one zero never seen before. Two. We Good didn't copy. know Thanks anything first. about how they lived, what they ate, there how they is. reproduced. <gasps> oh, yeah. Ooh, a, a long nosed chimera. Yay! Chimeras are a. a um, also, I guess you could call them living bit, fossils. Come up a bit. They are cartilaginous fishes, a separate anyway. group from the sharks and rays. Look at those dimensions. And they've been around for quite a long time. There aren't very many species of them. So this will be from the family Rhino chimeridae, and that those bridge. are known as commonly as the Move long nosed chimera, which one I, mean, I don't know why they zero name one that. Zero <laughs> speed decimal two. Good copy. Oh, that's a magnificent little surprise. Oh, that's the first time I've seen one so close. That's amazing. Ah, another amazing dive. So the snout actually has sensory nerve endings in it, and that can be used to find uh, food such as small fish. And on the first yeah, dorsal fin, high. just in front of it, you can see actually here a really great okay. shot of that venomous spine that it has, which is used, of course, in defense. I'm not sure what we want to eat these, but... They have that precaution for a reason, obviously. Um, the long-nosed chimeras like this one are found in worldwide, uh, occur down to, well, two, two, meter, two, two meters, <laughs> two kilometers depth. Um, and the largest they tend to get is about four and a half feet, which is pretty big, but this is a wonderful oh specimen. Oh, yes, absolutely. Look at the size of his snout compared to the rest of his body. <laughs> it's like a third of his length. Maybe he's been telling lies. <laughs> I was just about to say that. <laughs> now, this is a nice female, I think. Do, don't, don't chimeras have clasp? The males have claspers on their uh, pelvic fins? I don't remember if that's true. Yeah, I'm not Tracy sure. says this is Rhino Chimera Atlanticus. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Okay, let's let him swim off. I'll have to look that up. Unless, Tracy, can you tell us, uh, do the male chimeras have claspers like sharks? And I remember seeing something about a little knob oh, of um, oh, such good um, denticles on the heads of males. Nice. Nice job, if I remember nice. correctly, I don't know okay, if it's Yeah, they down. do have an accessory, accessory clasper on their head. Uh, which makes for a funny joke that, uh, that we won't That's the tell. old suit. <laughs> right, right, right. So I'll turn to port. But do they have claspers on the uh, pelvic fins also? They do. Okay, so that must have been a female, or I, I guess, I don't know, do the males have that from the get-go, or do they develop it? So would that have been, a, I didn't see any claspers, so that would have been a female? Yeah, this one looks mature, so it would have it by now. Okay, right. thanks. Video switching out. Thanks, very, Bob. very cool. A nice surprise. Coming down, Sean. So as we're moving down the slope, we've come Looks across like this yeah. this other down cold deep here. down here where there doesn't ooh, they don't ooh, a big crap, yep. where yeah, there doesn't Josh appear to be. Um, any brine oh settling, boy. but Still again, an, another area of, of some kind of seepage where we've, we've got these chemosynthetic communities Gonna thriving. This will be Wonder one of the large like predators that isn't touch. specific to these habitats, it's not endemic like to these habitats, like but it does uh, wander in, off. get Maybe a meal, and then actually. wander back out. Can we get a uh, snap zoom on that crab to uh, right. right of center? Yeah, we're making our way down into okay, the thank depression. You. Coming down, Sean. Yeah, you can see it's just trailing off the backside. Got some mud. And uh, briefly lasers also, if possible. Sure. We just have to move very slowly in this environment so we don't stir up those dust clouds. Yeah, no worries. But we'll get there. We have to take this one slow so we don't stir up the mud. I don't think this one is one we've ever seen before on this cruise so far. No, so this looks like a paralomus. So you can and so and this is not a true crab. 
Uh, you can see it's got its claws, short claws tucked in underneath in the front, and then it's only have, it only has Hi, three Roland. pairs of walking legs. So Played this is game. more Good. closely related to the squat lobsters. Saw the rhino come here and just couldn't crab. resist it. And that Last rhino pair of legs always shows up will be tucked bridge. up yeah. under the ahead, carapace. Yeah, she's trying to and the abdomen is tucked up, tucked down or forward under the the uh, Eddie the James five is tucked up run underneath the Copy. carapace as well. Yeah, Bridges is RV nav. Uh, can you confirm center so rotation is, is a frame? Also, yeah, so so he's in the same frame. family Great, as the king crabs that are fished commercially in the North Pacific. We saw a different one the other day. Um, this one is not quite as spiny. It's still pretty spiny. Yeah. <laughs> That's a gorgeous image. Oh, he's got something. He's picking up something. What are you eating? Oh, what is he eating? I don't know. It looks like mud. Or a muscle, or which a is muscle? ripping open. That could be. Oh, a dirt bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, tastes good. He's obviously. enjoying it. Spitting out the little shells. Got any more zoom? Rejecting them. Yes, Pull. I do. Go ahead. That looks like a, a lump of barite yeah. or carbonate. Oh, oh, there it goes. Oh. You lost oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> Dropped a snack. Uh, the problem with eating circular objects on a, on, on a hill. On a hill. Yeah. <laughs> Spherical objects. And now he's um, he's got a cleaning the out the mud. It seems to be drifting in and out on its Rejecting own. all of the stuff yeah, he doesn't and he want. Yeah, saying that yesterday. Want. Can't tell whether it's which or which. You can see those two. You but okay, those two uh, just appendages a touch. between ROV the bridge. claws. Uh, heading change complete. We're going to see how this uh, works for now. Rows so of fine good. bristles Thanks, on them. Those are the You're third welcome. maxillipeds. Uh, maxillipeds are thorax. Uh, appendages. They're not head appendages, but they function as mouth parts, as uh, all feeding legs. appendages for sorting and selecting food. Yep. That's wonderful imagery. Just going to get a few seconds of the full species or specimen here. And now picking up something else. So even after the crab picks up something to eat, it okay, goes through a lot of okay. uh, selection process. And it's again, got, feel, feel free to zoom uh, past the skin Multiple anytime. mouth parts, uh, uh, mandibles, ah. which are chewing and right. tearing. Um, the main event. It's got a pair of uh, other mouth parts that help select uh, and distinguish among Thanks. good or bad particles. Which, which do I want to eat? Which do I want to reject? Those are the maxillae. And then there are three pairs of maxillipeds. So there's a whole battery of small mouth parts you're settled down surrounding you're the mouth, okay. sort of stacked up. Okay, I'm going to come um, down a couple meters. Below the mouth. And they can sort Do all of these different color. particles, uh, yeah, selecting the, the food, which ones sure. go are in to the, uh, which ones are swallowed, and which ones are rejected. Try to take out some of that. And all of the crabs and the hermit crabs and the shrimp have uh, the true shrimps. Oh, look at that. Have that, that array of uh, just the current of of mouth part of appendages, those, mandibles, uh, two clamps, pairs of maxillae, and longer. three That's pairs of maxillipeds. Interesting. In addition right? to many of them I having the claws. Trust. That could be of serious one sort or another. heaving, maybe. Uh, no. Who's ahead of me? Interestingly, not a lot of live bivalves down here. Some of these, some what look like newly dead bathymodular oh. shells they still appear to be intact they have um a lot of like this stuff is just pigmentation really soft. intact i think it is yeah it looks like an abstract painting Pretty fine or a map of sea uh, blue sea Let's and uh, black uh, olive beads in the that brown, brown patch in the middle to the right and so again these blackened areas are um, reduced areas of sediment where the oxygen would have been um removed during or used up rather during the process of the
bacteria moving in to exploit the off. organic matter and the chemical-rich fluid Thank in you. this area. And they are a perfect indicator of um, usually seepage or some kind of uh, organically enriched dots. area. Which black dots are you saying? Uh, either the one uh, just Bob upper Carney left says the, the one uh, right uh, our position is right in the middle of the bones, the positive yeah. bottom Get anomaly. Down, I think at times I see shininess. And there's a little tube worm. A couple of them. So rolling earlier, we saw these little like of those amphipods. Little I can see creatures a few of them in the sediment that were like waving little arms around real quick. Did you see that? I saw that the little black ones. Yeah. While you guys were looking at the little shrimpy the amphipods. Yeah, yeah, we never yeah. got a super good view of them. Yeah. So if you see them again, try and grab and, them. And uh, on that mussel shell, you can see the growth lines. So the really squiggly two worms we were seeing earlier and um, I can't there's a couple in shot um, right now they look a bit like ramen noodles those are from the sa family sorry the yes the family Sibaglinidae um, and those are typically chemosynthetic tube worms usually here we can see some great shots of them and so they Can actually the have a, an association where they yep. in, within their bodies they'll have bacteria <clears throat> that used these sulfide rich chemicals so thiotrophic bacteria and they are found um, around the world, nearly, the species. Seeing some sediment in Sirius's view. Let's come out a bit. See that? Let's come out all the way. In fact, it's oh. almost thought of as a, a chemosynthetic weed. A good friend and colleague has uh, had nicknamed them. And they look, yeah, wiry, and they depend on this relationship with the chemosynthetic bacteria for their nutrition. Track, uh, and they yeah. have an, a, an amazing ability to colonize many different types of these reducing environments. So they were, they've been known, of course, from the Gulf of Mexico, but they've also been found as far south as the it's Southern Ocean, years, though. as it's well so as um, in an Arctic mud volcano. So they do. Really soft. It does appear that they are. Um, found, and you know, we're from kind of in a depression too, so the fluid from each pole the same to used, right? uh, the opposite side it of the world, really. Down. Yeah. Huh. Never seen that before. Big uh, muscle debris field here. Some live muscles. And so this is just—it's obviously uh, a species which so can adapt good. very easily to different environments um, once they're reducing environments. Yeah. Amazing that one species could yeah, have that kind of range. Center screen. Sure. So Just here we've got a, a lot of dead muscles. Um, perhaps that may be because the flow has waned in certain areas and so those muscles wouldn't have been able to get the necessary energy while well, the bacteria within those muscles wouldn't have been able to get the necessary energy um, to survive. But we can see a, little, a couple little patches here of the live muscles. You can tell they're live because of the way they're orientated. So they'll, be, they'll have their hinge sitting down in the sediment with just about a half of the, or two thirds of their body extending vertically upwards or diagonally out of the sediment. As well as sometimes they're usually yeah, partially open, I mean, and you can see their steady, siphons so extending it, out of the sea flo uh, out of their shell. Sorry. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, it's up to video. I mean, I think we're okay There's also now. you can see the glowing bacterial mats in between those muscles, and so those see? are the primary the producers stock, yeah. we're referring like to. They are like some of those bacteria which will then tangle. multiple animals will come into graze oh, upon, like, like grass in a terrestrial yeah, environment. Like Oh, it's a closed fuzzy one. Never mind. You want to zoom in video? Never mind. So I think um, Eric was Cordes had suggested these were Bathymoriolus brooksii. The and cool, the Bathymoriolus like brooksii yeah. tend to have sure. both methanotrophic and chemoautotrophic symbionts. So that means that they can use uh, both methane rich fluids as well as sulfide rich fluids which they tend those tend to both occur in in places um but it means they can exploit two different sort of nutritional pathways and switch between them depending on on what is happening in the sediments below 
We can also see in this community there are a lot of these little shrimp, Alvinacaris most likely, perhaps Alvinacaris muricola. Um, I do thought, think I saw a gastropod of some okay, kind at some point, as well as these tiny little anemones, perhaps zoanthids, growing on some of those dead shells. Partial. Okay. Going to back up a bit. But these uh, mussels, Bathymodiolus mussels, are known to be foundation species. And that means that they basically um, provide a substrate for many different animals to live on. <coughs> so just like we saw the zoanthids um, covering the shells, as well as you know, shrimp can go and hide in between them. They create habitat, essentially. And tube worms tend to do the same thing when they're found in the bushes. But mussels are also, as well as tube worms, are also considered to be ecosystem engineers. And so that means that this species essentially modifies the physical and chemical environment around them. So it will cause um, perhaps different, it will open up different pockets of seepage below the sediment and cause the flow in this area to change dramatically because of the um, upright structures of these mussels and the, and the abundance of them together. And so it means that they are responsible for changing things and that of course will impact other animals in the area. Can we have the lasers on for a second, sure. please, Pilot? Go ahead. Um, some of these shells look like they're pretty substantial in size, especially like that dead one just on the left bottom. Left um, bottom. That's at least, uh, sorry, right bottom. Right bottom. You know, the other left. Oh, yes. um, Yeah, so the, the one which is dead looks like it's there about nearly 20, cent no, nearly 20 centimeters long, maybe 17, 16 or so. Um, but, of here. course, when you think about, these mussels will, of course, be related to those which okay, we bye. eat. Um, but these are, of course, much bigger and also will have some compounds we may not want to ingest in them, such as uh, residual methane and residual sulfides. Can turn the lasers back off? I might just be below in my tilt. You can zoom in, roll in a bit. Amazing. Shrimp at the top, shrimp at the right. And again, just a reminder, this is a previously unexplored place. We had no idea that this cold seep and just above it, brine pool existed in because this area. Flow no one has ever seen this before one. until now. See the little That's pretty special, guys. All right, just a okay. shadow of the shrimps inside. We've also got amphipods, you know, in between these um, dead mussels. And even though the mussels may die, they will st still remain here and provide habitat for other animals. Just like we can see these shrimp moving around in between what looks like an ophiroid in the center of the screen. We can just get a little pinch of its arms. May not be an ophiroid. There's a little flow But you can there, see too. almost in the center of the screen, it yeah. looks like um, a little hazy. Yeah. And so that will be either um, some of the slightly dense salt solution or perhaps some slightly Try elevated fluid. Um, that temperature gradient will result yeah. in no, that sort of um, bring it out. Oh, okay. yeah. wavy it appearance of the, of the fluid. But you can see how thick this bacterial mat here, it's actually waving on the left, upper left of the screen. Oh, yeah. It's actually waving and has formed this, this very thick mat. No shot there. And so Eric Cordes has just suggested these do look like Bathymodiolus brooksii. And because they have those sulfide using bacteria within them um, and use that as their main form of energy, when you bring them up to the, to the surface and dis dissect yeah, them in the lab, they absolutely stink. <coughs> Rotten eggs all the way. So try not to touch down here. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys seen the flow before today? Uh, I did not notice it before. Okay. Did you? The what? The f any of that flow was that we just saw, the haziness. Oh. No, shimmering. no, no. That's the first time I've seen the uh, distortion and shimmering. Yeah. Yeah. So Carolyn Rupel is saying that, you know, these sediments seem super black. And I agree with that. Um, most reduced sediments I've seen, you, uh, yeah, they look black, but these are like really black. Um, compared to most of the Darker iron oxides that she's sen seen previously. So iron oxides is what would be creating that black color in the area. Oh, be careful, buddy. But Bob Carney is saying that, you know, Should they have seen these, this yeah. type of coloration Makes before. Um, 
very Find dark nope. and very yeah, fine organic detritus. Um, yeah, judging by the shadow, he's pretty close. Yeah. And he's always assumed that it's a mixture of both carbon and iron compounds that that lead to this, rather than, for instance, and oil seepage or asphalt sure. seepage, like we saw yesterday. Get the rope. Yeah, I'll, uh, directly aft. He's a ways back. Okay. Maybe we can get the. Oh, we'll leave his leaders on for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, watch lead. Um, what? Where would you like to go from here? I'm not really sure. Um, we can we can explore around this area, uh, or we could um, go back up to the brine pool. Hopefully that dust cloud is settled out, or we could uh, make our way up to the second feature up to the northeast. Yeah. So perhaps let's go via the brine pool, get some more great shots of that, and yeah. then move on to um, the second area. I mean, okay. this this may extend for a while, so. Okay. Um, Let's see how far that, that extent exists, and, and who knows what we'll find at our Should second we, bubble target. So maybe we could go up to the brine pool and just follow one side. Uh, yeah, yeah. If it flows that downhill. That sounds like a great okay. idea. All right. Which direction? Uh, we should be roughly lined up, right? You turned 180. Uh, we did. Yeah, south of you. So I'm going to come up. According to high pack, you're facing it. Okay. I think. I would agree. So the dive yesterday and the dive today have actually ticked, ticked off two of direction. my major deep sea bucket list Can things that I wanted to see. Yeah, we moved Sirius. Um, we had asphalt seeps yesterday, so we're which here. are we just so north. amazing. What was the last move? Um, there will be a highlight uh, video coming of that. Together, they ended up being as north well meters, as so. today, so. we've got. Oh, a really? brine pool, which I have never seen before, except for in videos, um, and so this has been yeah, that's gotta be it. A dream come true, and I know that sounds super cheesy, yeah, but right over the waypoint. Oh yeah. Um, well, true. we're coming up, and we're this noticing another depression rocks. off to the starboard side. Um, so I think should we try looking at that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you catch that wash lead? Sorry, we, uh, no, I didn't. What was that? We've got another large depression off to our starboard side now that we're up above this crater we've been in. Um, I think we're going to move over there and check yeah, it out. Yeah, they seem to be working for us, so why not? Yep. Let's do it. Or actually, is that where we were at before? <laughs> that, that's the first one that didn't have the seep in it. Range you see that? 20 meters. Yeah. Large fish at the top near the collapsed crust. I think so, Dan. Your face. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Well. Brian no, that's your opposite left. of where we want to go. Brian pulls to your left. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I'm gonna come back to port. So turn. Yeah. Follow this. Should be like right over here. Yeah. Keep going around. <coughs> I think I see something up there. Yeah, just ride that yeah. ridge around. Yep. Um, do you want to move Sirius yes. southbound? Yes, I see it. I see it up there, yeah. Okay. Do south okay for you guys? Yeah. All right. 180. Uh, how many meters would you like? 20? Uh, 30? How much did we move before? 30. Let's do 20 and then try to prevent Sirius from getting right over it. Gotcha. Yeah, I see All it right. out there in the distance, though. So. Bridge RV nav. So rolling, just so you know, yeah, we've, uh, go ahead. Been yeah, noticing like a move, a lot uh, range two zero meters, so. bearing one eight zero degrees, speed decimal two. When Sirius gets on top of the brine pool area, it stirs up a lot of sediment from the heaving. So we've been trying to keep it offset. Okay. Uh, can you read the bearing back for me? That is bearing one eight zero. Correct. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Thanks. So that's a uh, two zero meters, bearing one eight zero, speed decimal two knots. It's a good copy. Thank you, Bridge. Stand by for input. I'm not sure if that's from you before or if I've kicked up some stuff or stuff has fallen off the vehicle. It's pretty thick though. ROV nav bridge, uh, move initiated, two zero meters bearing one eight zero speed decimal two knots. Move initiated, that was a good copy. Thank you, bridge. Yeah, isn't that crazy? How much sediment? Clear over the high pack target, which is odd. Yeah, I think it's just off to my starboard. 
I'm just going to peek over this direction. So we'll find that brine pool and maybe just follow it down, maybe even downhill if it, somebody did describe it as a brine river. Maybe okay. follow it downhill. Do you want to try to drop those lower swing arms, see if that will reduce the backscatter? Right now I've got the black pressed, minus nine, and black uh, See, I don't, think, I don't think we were over in this area, and there's still all this particulate in the water. I know. It's got me confused. So perhaps because of the okay. um, the gases in the area, as well as the um, liquid seepage under the sediments, that may buoy the sediments up a lot easier and okay. make it a little bit See more um, definitely like flocky almost. And field. so as a result, what, just you just need a tiny little touch tiny or a tiny little disturbance, and that'll result in these huge okay. Um, dust clouds. Okay. So here we've got an actually an actual carbonate. Uh, a good outcrop of orthogenic carbonate. Um, this is probably the biggest one we've seen, even though it's not very big so far for this dive. And it's these orthogenic carbonates that in some places can host those incredible coral communities like we saw yesterday. Here it looks like there are a couple um, dead Bathymodiolus mussels, as well as some Munodopsis squat lobsters, as well as a tube worm. This is our first Lamellabrachia tube worm. Could we get a quick zoom uh, just under the ledge? Uh, go ahead, video. Oh, oh, I see it on the bottom. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So our pilots are about to do a, a watch change. Um, but I just wanted to get in this quick zoom for can. Uh, this looks like it's well. dead. Um, but this would be one of the more conspicuous and normal inhabitants of these seeps. Um, these Lamellabrachia tube worms. You also get Escarpia um, at these depths. And then you can see all these Alvinacaris miracola shrimp hanging out under the ledge. Perhaps a couple of hydroids as well as that Ceranthid anemone, tubed anemone. You see the fuzzy underneath the rock? Okay, let's come out. Uh, let's get over back to that brine pool. Since we'll be able to find it a little easier than Sick our... we moved. So I'm going to move back to starboard. Actually, Sean, would you mind coming up a little bit on the winch? Just, uh, oh, Josh is here. Okay. Thanks. ROV nav, bridge. Little camera Go ahead, bridge. Yeah, yes, that uh, move is coming to a close here. Uh, our bow thruster is ramping up pretty good, and the wind and the current are shifting around, so we're going to have to make a couple of heading changes. Okay, yeah. Uh, we're going to make two separate heading changes of five degrees each to starboard. I have copies. Sounds good. Thanks. All right, I'll get back with you when all that's complete. Uh, this last move is complete now, and I'm going to adjust the heading now. Copy that. All right, I'll get back with you. Thanks, Rich. So we're just going to sit tight for a little while while our RV pilots do a little switcheroo. It is lunchtime here on the ship. And so and if we're in order to keep exploring, we have to feed ourselves, right? Um, so that's why you're not hearing much of Chuck today. He's actually just nipped off to have a bite, and then we're going to trade places. <laughs> Can we experiment with turning off the lower light bar momentarily? All right, that was lowers off. Is that any better? That was lowers off videos any better or not? And back on. Yeah, I see that. I think it's because we're zoomed in a tad, maybe. Oh, okay.
So, Pilot, just to give you uh, video awareness, uh, that's with uh, my blacks at normal. This with the blacks compressed and the blacks squashed. Okay, well, once our pilots get settled, we can do Try some intros, some perhaps. Um, I do think we have one of the last shift left still left in here. He's looking very anticipatingly at the door. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> So, Pilot, are you up to speed? We found some brine pools and some cool seeps. Yay! I was watching in my uh, stateroom. Very good. Pretty cool dive so far. I think this is the brine pool, correct? Yeah, Straight so um, we were hoping to get a couple more shots of the brine pool and then um, continue on via that sort of channel, I guess. Yeah, copy that. That does not look like the brine pool. That's just muscles, is it? Uh, Maybe further off to the starboard. We'll get a little closer and see yeah, what we see. Yeah. Bridge, were you calling RV? Yeah. Uh, Nav, this I think is there the were bridge. muscles uh, in the brine pool. That there were. There were. And they're dead like because they, like, drowned. To starboard. Mm -hmm. Not drown, but uh, the we'll hypersaline environment is toxic, but and they would have been said, killed. Um, bit, perhaps they would have lived there uh, at one point when the brine pool levels were a bit lower, and then um, bit, they so were flooded. I'll and of course, if these if muscles need, cannot move once okay. they settle. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We're doing a so shift change result, down here, so you're going to have Chris talk about Roger that. Thank you. Okay, yeah, there it is. That's it. Yeah, it was pretty high up. Yeah. Coming down. Today is one of those days that kind of stays with you throughout your career, where you're like, this was an amazing day. Just like yesterday, um, two absolutely incredible dives happening consecutively. Is that a floating fish, bottom right? I think it's just a shell, but we can take a quick zoom on it. Go ahead and round The black one. The black one. The fish on the set. Oh, I didn't even see that. So that looks like a tiny but rat tail, a macro urid. Um, not sure which species. Oh, it looks like it has a black ring around the eye, so that would be Corophenoides mexicanus. Um, probably one of the easiest to tell apart. Now that I've said that, Tracy Sutton's probably going to say that's not that species, but um, that is what we heard yesterday from Kevin Rademacher. Indeed, if I could Clear. just jump in, actually, right, um, I was reading about rat tails last night. Oh, and great. I found out, well, their, Gre their family name in Greek means uh, great tail. So macros is great and ora is tail. Ah, I never knew that. That's a great little factoid. Very appropriately named. <laughs> so that uh, white poof in the middle, I believe, is... Uh, the pool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do we... Did we think it was going downhill in this direction or the opposite direction? Yeah, so you can actually right. see the sort of waves coming uh, towards you, I think. Tilt down and get um, that little cloudy section. That may be from section. us, but we did think it was flowing hey, towards ahead. us, I'm pretty sure. Let's kill the lasers, Don. Copy that. All right, we're back. Can we uh, center up Sirius? Yeah, I'm turning now. I'm trying to. The uh, white precipitate moving over the brine pool looks Video's like clear. Uh, yeah, we're on. viewing clouds from a fast moving clouds from above. Or smoke, fog Pushing on the. Pushing past the skid. I'm going to be tilting up a little bit. So Over the ocean. Yeah. I I think we have everyone here. If we want to do an introduction. <coughs> Hello, everyone on shore. This is Joshua Carlson, uh, piloting D2, and to my right. Uh, Don Liberatore on uh, co-pilot seat. And Chris Ritter on Navigator. 
And in the far right is uh, Roland Bryan, the video. And in the back clipping for a video is uh, uh, Caitlin Bailey. And we're all engineers and videographers uh, for the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. Thanks very much for those intros. This is Chuck Messing again from Nova Southeastern University. And I am Alex Avila. I'm a PhD student in fisheries at Oregon State University and a Nancy Foster Scholar, part of the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Very good. It well, looks like we have a uh, dense bed of mussels here, and a lot of them in the background look like they may be alive. Some sticking up left, uh, right of center, and uh, much more crowded further back. Yeah, come on in, Ron. Yep, those are live mussels in Partial. there. Do you see the brown is the uh, on the li on the live mussels? The brown is the outer shell layer, thin organic shell layer called the periostracum. And of course, the rest of the shell is calcium carbonate and some organic material. You want to just drop and these guys, this, uh, uh, even uh, though angle? they are uh, metabolically very sure. different, um, feeding on the uh, products of the bacterial metabolism, um, they are also suspension feeders. And like uh, other mussels, they are in the family mytilidae, the true mussels or sea mussels, and they will attach to the sea floor by a cluster of threads that they produce called the byssus, B-Y-S-S-U-S. The byssus is a, uh, a the cluster of threads. You can't see them here, um, but they're secreted by a gland. They're fluid when they're secreted, and they run down the slender finger-like foot a groove in the foot of the muscle and are attached and become adhesive and solid. And the muscle can, at least some muscles, can actually move by detaching some of their threads and adding others move along the bottom. I'm not sure if these muscles can. Yeah, you're getting into the live ones. And uh, interestingly, in Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Captain Nemo's crew made their clothing out of bissel thread, out of byssus threads. There's a little uh, couple of those shrimps, probably Alvin O'Caris, and we have more of those, uh, at least here, those ubiquitous little amphipods that look like tiny little white swimming commas. These are, those are crustaceans. You continue to get more living ones uh, further forward. Related to the pill bugs. And the possum shrimp that we've seen yeah. before. And you can see in some of these muscles there are two dark openings in the gray tissue. Those are the inhalant and exhalant openings uh, through which the muscle brings in uh, particles uh, if it's suspension, suspension feeding. Uh, particles of uh, suspended food that it filters out on its gills. And then the other opening is the exhalant opening. Of course, water comes in uh, laden with oxygen, and the exhalant flow is like breathing out. So it has the uh, exhaust, the carbon dioxide dissolved, and uh, fecal material may be blown out there or may be released um, Elsewhere along the margin of the Ready shell. for a medium shot? Sure. Come on up. Thank you. That was great. Let's see what else we have here. Partial. So that particular area is dense living mussels. Of course, some dead ones as well. But moving away from there and the... Uh, proportions of dense versus living ones um, changes. Here we have uh, along this very blackened substrate, we have a lot of live mussels.
Diva has, of course, uh, uh, discussed an awful lot about the biology, ecology, and uh, I guess you could even say biogeo biogeology, the connections between these organisms and the uh, gases and chemicals that are produced Can underneath and the bacteria. Okay. There's bacterial mat here. And it looks like a crust of carbonate, perhaps. That uh, tan at upper uh, right. There's an anemone off left. Can we do more on the mat, or are we at max? There we are. It's partial. Yeah, you can go. You can go all the way in, Roland. That's max. That's max. Right. This is the uh, max zoom. Can, I can come down a little bit. And that is an anemone of some sort. Carolyn, does uh, do I assume folks must know? I don't know if you do. Is it the? Uh, are Sorry. these Archaeans or are these true bacteria? Those little um, uh, know, elongated little curved structures, worm. maybe. Peanut yeah. worms. We collected there one. There uh, there's a scale worm right uh, below center. Uh, a scale worm that's a segmented worm, a polychaete. And its um, upper surface, that looks like, yeah, there's an, oh. Oh, oh. Wow. check it out. Huh? He grabbed Super. something. A lot of these have these extendable jaws that they can Did withdraw inside yeah. their mouths. And you just saw that reached out and grabbed something. I'm not sure what it was. These uh, uh, polychaetes have a series of disks attached by little stalks to their upper surface, which serves as uh, both protection and uh, underneath the disks, it serves as a respiratory channel. That was very cool. Don't mess with those guys. <laughs> Watch your lunch plate there. Yeah. You see the flow? Mm -hmm. Lots of those little amphipods on the muscles here. And there may be some small snails there. I can't quite tell whether some of those are snails, tiny snails, or amphipods. They're very small. I don't know if you guys can detect uh, on shore, but when I take the cameras slightly out of focus, you can see the actual flow passing. Well, thank you. Let's we can go ahead and do that, and we can see. Yeah, I see the little ripple effects, particles drifting by. Thank you. There's another scale worm on that muscle. On a squat lobster. Now, looks like the uh, curly arm of a brittle star sticking out. Quite a community here. Ready for a meeting? And yep, that looks like uh, there you can see right in the center that one muscle. Uh, you could see the bissel threads, the slender pale filaments radiating out yellow from the thing muscle. On the left Thank side. you very much, guys. Yeah, go ahead in. Let's see what this yellow is. Rocks. Oh, well, those look like juvenile mussels. I don't know if it's the same species or not, um, but they are smaller, certainly, and they haven't been covered with sediment or other growth yet. So my guess is that uh, there's a few things growing on them. A tiny little brittle star in the Max middle, a bunch of brittle stars. So I'm guessing these are juveniles, although they may be a different species. Scale worm.
I don't know if anyone uh, uh, sure can help us out. Just uh, strike with lasers across those guys. If anybody knows how long the larval um, planktonic stage of the life cycle of these mussels is, how how many days, weeks, or months do they drift in the plankton uh, when you have such spotty uh, communities in which they can survive? I believe the planktonic larval stage would be longer Push lived to give kids. the larvae more of an opportunity to find uh, an appropriate habitat to settle. You can see how the details of these communities vary just quickly over short distances. This is a, I don't know what this orange is, if anybody ashore can help. Is that a different kind of bacterium? Small amphipods. Another scale worm. A small anemone. Someone has suggested that maybe some of these little brown tubes uh, that we see lying along the seafloor may be There's created some by some of these crustaceans, right these small amphibots, or a different species. And what is that sticking out there? That looks like the uh, head. Yeah, there it is. That's um, Kiridota heheva. This is a sea cucumber. And it is. Um, Characteristic of cold seeps, although it's, I'm not aware that it is actually like chemosynthetic uh, itself. Feeders. It must sure. rely on the uh, sediments, the particular kind of sediment associated with these uh, habitats. This uh, sea cucumber, you can see its tentacles with their little um, multi-fingered-like tips for uh, reaching out and grasping wads of uh, sediment and detritus and stoking them into their mouths. This uh, sea cucumber uh, is a member of a group called the apodids because it has no tube feet along its body. You see that long pale line? That is the remnant. There's probably a muscle associated with that and nerve cords. That's the remnant okay, of where clear. the tube feet would be in uh, other sea cucumbers, yeah, and those white, well, he contracts there a little bit, he's unhappy. Those white uh, discs in its skin are clusters of microscopic uh, skeletal pieces, calcium carbonate, called ossicles. Sea cucumbers have them. Uh, they're the reduced skeleton. Uh, other sea cucumbers have them also. They come in a wide range of forms these Big ossicles crab. in in that uh, uh, Kiridota they are shaped like little wheels okay, go ahead, and they're important in taxonomy and here's another of the lithodid I think that was called paralomus earlier and really you can see its mouth parts going it's just uh, cooking along right there those are the those little slender portions are the palps they are sensory, and this uh, there's so the crab is picking up something and transferring it first to those little short legs uh, below its mouth. There you go, and they they grab it, and there's a those are the third maxillipeds, and they have a brush of fine bristles, CT, along their inner edge. You can see they're brown, and they will sort the material before passing it upwards to a series of other mouth parts before the selected items get to the mouth. Let's see if we can spot what he's eating here. Small pieces of things. Looks like whatever's growing on the mussels. Okay. 
We can move Sirius a little bit. I'm like again, a lot of. Uh, so yeah. there you can yeah. see two of them in particular on one so side. Those are the pouches, which up are segmented, uh, no. sort of finger-like uh, extensions not, from the mouth closer. parts, yeah. and they're tipped. Oh, he's eight got eight a muscle eight. there. He's pulled up the whole thing by the Bissell threads, and look at him handle it. Him or her can't tell whether this is a male or a female. Nav bridge, go ahead. Let's see what goes on. Boy, ripping and tearing. Let's see if we can get a little closer when uh, we're able. Bridge copies. Next move, one five and meters. And see if there's uh, uh, zero we can figure out what he is, speed, what the crab is selecting. Oh, bringing up bringing up the whole yeah. thing right up there. Yeah, go ahead. Tilt up. Let's see. So it hasn't broken the shell. The muscle is still intact inside. You can come down a little too. Oh yeah, you already did it. How convenient! It's lunchtime on now the ship as well. bridge move initiated. One five meters, bearing two zero zero. Speed decibel two knots. There you see some of Got the it. stuff that's being rejected. And putting it down. Let's see what he does next. Bob Carney suggests it's grazing on the byssus, but we'll see. Can we zoom in there again, if possible? Yeah, go ahead in. Thank you. Boys, really going at it, but very selective. It's extraordinary what our pilots Drifting and back. navigators and videographers can do, thinking that we are looking at this in 1,622 meters of depth down in the deep ocean, and we can focus in on something so precisely. It's just extraordinary. Well, he seems to have finished with that muscle. You may also notice that um, you can see on the claw that's to the left, that's the right-hand claw of the crab, has got large white molar structures along its fing along the claw finger, whereas the other uh, claw is much slenderer. Um, so you have sort of the difference between uh, Full a right-handed molar and a left-handed incisor instead of teeth although the mandibles inside the, uh, uh, within those, that group of mouth parts also has grinding and cutting uh, components. Video's clear. That was great. All right, come on up. Thank you very much. And this is a real field. Look at that extensive field of all. I mean, that's as far as the ROV can see that looks like living muscles. Just a huge panorama. And they all, almost all look alive. So we can, uh, anywhere you care to zoom in here just to ROV see what bridge. things might Go be going on, yeah, what critters. Stop our move there. We had about, like I about see one or two lot dead ones, but uh, the vast majority of these are live. Look at how uh, dense that is, cheek by jowl. This to you, but our wind is picking up There's some little tiny ones covered. growing on the big ones. We've already made a couple of heading changes. I think we're going to make another one here pretty soon. There's a web work of okay. uh, uh, fine filaments on some of these. Uh, I'm not sure what those are. They're brittle stars. The red, so. Lots of little brittle okay. stars. Uh, just, it's uh, just Bob Carney mentioned earlier that he saw yeah, some sure. limpets. So, don't worry about those. Uh, let's like see like what the, we can see um, here. Three meters. Don't, uh, we don't not sure what in. all okay. of that so discoloration is here for now. there yeah. on the left-hand uh, side. I think I'm gonna go ahead, since um, we stop, you can see a I'm little spidery-looking uh, guy. That's an isopod change to starboard, if that's all right. crustacean. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, I'll get back with you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, there's a few of those, I think. 
They look like little spiders. And I think those are isopods. There's scale worms. What an amazing community that just reflects the incredible producti productivity generated by the bacterial activity in the sea floor here. And of course the mussels have these uh, masses of uh, bacteria that uh, uh, are the basis for their metabolism as well. Bob mentions there are salt anomalies, salt bodies in the um, substrate. There's a pink scale worm. What an amazing, <laughs> it's just on and on. There's Alvin Acaris, the shrimp. And oh my goodness, there's an empty spot <laughs> and a dead mussel. Who knows what the slight variation in chemical conditions is that opened up that little pocket. So the brittle stars in their millions here are not, as far as I know, chemosynthetic, but they, sur they probably are grazing on the bacteria and detritus. This is just amazing. Yeah, it looks like little isopods, the little things that look like little spiders. Sure, we can pull Pale up. spiders are isopods. Thanks very much. That was great. <laughs> it's just extraordinary. Look at that. Partial. It it just sort of boggles the mind. I don't know. Um, I've I've had relatively little experience here in the Gulf. So I don't know if this is, if anyone ashore can help me, is this like the biggest mussel bed you've ever seen? Is this typical? Never. Are there huger yeah. ones? Good. Yeah, just be advised uh, that five degrees. And here we have this differently this colored crust. We're let this sit I assume that's now. bacterial. Yeah. We'll do your next. We'll do your Bob next says this on is a large happens. bed. Okay, sounds good. All right, thanks. I could only imagine if it was a yeah, small one what the others spots, might look lasers. like, but he says this is a large bed. All the of this bacterial spots. mats yeah, that right you right see on the, the black anoxic muscles. sediment. Right, right there. Um, anyone can help with the. Uh, nature of this sort of golden brown um, crust that almost looks like lichen growing over the seafloor. It's not, at. I'm sure, but but uh, I'm not sure what is, is it a different kind of bacterium or archaean, if anyone can uh, help. And there are those little ubiquitous amphipods again. Look like little white living commas. Clear. Okay, come on up. That's magnificent. Okay, onward, I guess, unless anybody wants us to stick around and look for something. It just continues. Look at that. Watch the nav. It's a nice view from Sirius. Yes. Hey, so we have a uh, couple of options here. We can stay here in this depression and explore a little more or we can move up to this next feature to the northeast, uh, which I believe is a target that we want to get to eventually. Okay, I think so. Diva just sat down, and okay. uh, uh, I'll let her weigh in. What was the question? Uh, whether we move on or uh, look I'm further here. Um, can, before we do anything, what's the scale of this? Scale of what? This entire enormous muscle bed. Can, do we have like a gauge of... You look um, at Sirius's view. Uh, how big is how big is D2 again? Nine like feet wide. A meter across? Nine feet wide. Yeah. So this is probably, I mean, it extends back beyond us, so this is probably at right, least in, 50 feet across. 
I'm not sure if you said this, but yeah, camera two, the Sirius view, absolutely amazing. Yeah, to I get forgot that. Yes. Great scope of the area where we're hovering above this enormous muscle bed with all of these brittle stars, these Chiridota um, sea cucumbers, um, polynoids, Alvinacara shrimp. I mean, this is your classic deep water seep environment here in the Gulf of Mexico. And these Chiridota um, sea cucumbers are known from many different uh, organically enriched habitats, so things like cold seeps as well as wood, woodfalls. And they're known from across the Caribbean as well as in the Gulf of Mexico, this particular species at Clear. least. And these um, brittle stars zoom in on this uh, patch right here. are likely, Patch as I said soon. before, they replace the Bathy Narita in uh, seep endemic Can't snails as well as Pravana sculptor, which tend to be found at shallower seeps in or the Gulf of Mexico. And so this is likely either Ophiura aces or Ophianigma uh, spinalimbatum. Um, that's quite a mouthful. But here they replace those those um, gastropods. But you can see, I, I'm sure you talked about this, Chuck, all their, their feeding appendages. Yes. Really yeah, amazing. Really, you can see them much better here than we saw them before. It's like they are multi-fingered little palms that will, they have tiny little papillae on them and they will grab the sediment, curl in and stuck them into, stuff them into their mouth. Just wonderful. This yeah, is incredible. And again, a reminder, these are previously unknown cold seeps. This is the third area of seepage with a chemo associated chemosynthetic assemblage that we have seen today. Um, never before seen by anyone. So if you're watching our feed and following along, you are one of the first people on the planet to see this. It's another crab. Yeah, is he different? Come on in. True explorers. Just out of the light. That's another... Um, Paralomus. Oh, and here monster. we can also see the Chaseon Feneri, the golden crabs. And so those oh, yep. are um, one of the, again, like this Paralomus, they are two of the main predators in this um, food web. The, they both are known to eat mussels. I saw when I was eating lunch that you could, one of them actually had an entire mussel held up by the byssus threads. Right, um, right. And the Chaseon do something similar. And actually, I've seen the Chaseon Feneri eating these Bathymoriolus mussels. It was Childressi and... Um, there may be, again, a mixture of species here. I'm not sure which species it is, but at seeps further south of here in the Caribbean, that, um, I've seen some great footage of the Chaseon Feneri, these golden crabs, eating the mussels, and when they're eating the flesh of the mussel, all of these amphipods are suddenly swarming around. It ends up like a, a swarm of flies <laughs> around the mussel, and then you can see they're trying to pick off any little scraps that might be falling off. Uh, two questions, Diva. One is... Uh we saw a cluster of much, much yeah, smaller mussels right. that were all yellow. Yeah, I assume those were yeah, juveniles crab. rather than a different species. Exactly. So when the mussels are smaller, they do tend to be this golden color, which we can see here, a great example of. And you can see as they get bigger, the gold sort of is limited really to the tight. extremities yeah, of the running. shell, and then they'll get to a point where they may not have any gold at all. And so this indicates that there has been um, ongoing recruitment at the site. There are, is obviously mating happening um, and then settling of the larvae, or perhaps the larvae settle from elsewhere, but it does appear to be um, happening continuously or at least on multiple occasions. And this chasing Feneri, again, looks very good. Good shell. Yeah. Um, looks like it may have molted really recently. And um, yesterday or the day before, we saw one or two of these uh, Kiridota hehevas. But here they l appear to like clustering together. So that could be for a number of reasons. Perhaps um, whatever it is that they, they eat um, is concentrated in one little area. Okay. Or also, um, deep sea holothurians are known to get together in aggregations to 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 spawn. Okay. So they release their gametes into the water him. column, and because of their closer proximity, they can then um, have a better chance of that being successful. Right. Yes, right. Coming out. And uh, you lunch. can see our lasers there, so the carapace of this um, uh, Paralomus red crab here is just a, a little over four inches across. So it says in this paper I'm reading that the Kiridotas actually feed on a mixture of sediment, wood fragments when they're available. I have seen them at yeah, Woodfalls an in the Caribbean. Um, and also suspended material. 
suggesting that the species can derive its nutrients from a variety of sources. So basically they inhabit these organically enriched but if you look at habitats. Here, they want to get up remarkable. to this northeast feature eventually. Yeah. And this there's quite a number of those paralomas. We'll see what they want to do here. This oh, but that might be... Oh, is that something else? Oh, maybe two species? Two paraloma species? Or maybe just know. a difference in Let's size? It means a different in difference in um, color? Oh, he's a little farther well, That out looks too. different. It yeah, looks like the better. spines are much shorter on this one. But it's still a lithoded. Yeah, this one definitely looks different, although I'm not familiar uh, with the details at first blush. Yeah, so these, um, these are, as we've said before, the normal inhabitants go of Gulf of Mexico seeps at this depth, a depth I, of about 1,625 so. uh, meters, and that many of these animals extend all the way south to nearly um, the tip of South America around Venezuela, where there are seeps along the way. Okay, pilot, um, where were you suggesting we head to next? The waypoint two in that direction? Um, yeah, northeast. Sorry, Nav. I think, uh... Yeah, we can come out. Um, I think you guys want to hit this northeast section up here. Is that correct? The next kind of feature? Depression? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the... That sounds great, going. but would it be possible to sort of move in the general... Trending along these sort of seep-like habitats to see if they continue on? Is yeah, that, we is can... Is that possible? We can, uh... Um, I mean, we can do whatever you guys want to do. I mean, we can stay down in the southwest section and then just kind of follow out around the brine pools and rivers too, um, or pick one that goes northeast and try to follow it. Yeah, as far that's as we more can. what I meant. So okay. basically, on in the on the way to waypoint two, trying to follow these gotcha. chemosynthetic little rivers, if you must. Okay. Yeah, I'll um, I'll talk to pilots and we'll we'll figure out a plan. Get it in motion here. Thank you. Sure. A uh, nav is the um, is this a depression or is this a is this a depression or a high? It looks like it's sloping up, but I didn't couldn't tell whether there's um, mud up. Yeah, you know, I guess it looks like there's mud up above. So, but not sure. No, you're right. This um, if you're looking at high pack, the we're just to the east of this uh, kind of mound, um, but. It, I meant uh, there were some smaller depressions where the brine pools were. That's what I was talking about. Sorry, um, but yeah, this is a this is increasing in um, depth as we go to the right. So, thank you. Sure. So. Um, so it appears then that uh, this muscle, you can see okay. the slope going up if you want to in the distance. Sure. This uh, yeah, bed doesn't necessarily Copy appear at the bottom of no. the depression, yeah, but along the slope. Follow these to the northeast. Yeah. And, and a good mix exactly, of juvenile yeah. muscles, um, adult muscles, as well as dead muscles in this in this we bed. Can, it's really quite extraordinary. Okay. Yep. So yeah, Again, the Sirius view is there. amazing. Please do switch to camera two if you can. Um, it really gives a great northeast. overview of this area. So it looks from this view as if this bed is in a bit of a swale, a slightly depressed area, but it runs up uh, upslope uh, huh? to our left at, in this view um, and ahead of us. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, whichever yeah. way you want to go, it yeah. doesn't matter to me. All right, let me let go me, the uh, other way and take the turn out of it then. Well, let me, let me push up first. Okay. So that when you come around, mm -hmm. I'll be in your view. Okay. Yeah, there you go. There's your view, Diva. Oh, yeah, there we go. Amazing. And it looks like it continues off there to the right, too. Yeah, so the in the series of view to the right, lower right is where that river feature was. Okay. And we were just up 
Oh, okay. North, All right. and now I'm, I mean, not north. We were up up in Sirius's view, and now I'm coming back down. I'm going to follow this little patch here and see where this heads, because this is generally north. So. Thank you. All right, Don. I think okay. you're good to. So with this view from you're in that view, is Sirius should just or give us a quick rotate right to like side to side with the RV. Sirius is going to do a 180 right now. Very okay, I'm just going to show the edges with your lights. Sorry, say again. From Sirius, it's I camera. said with this view from camera two, one wonders if we're on top of some sort of slab of carbonate or something because the edges are super abrupt here. I don't know if there's any topography on those or beneath on those edges. Uh, I can't really tell, but when you look at the uh, ROV view, you see that the uh, the abrupt edge there is um, uh, just, uh, it's on the edge of sediment, which goes uphill gently. Yeah. Um, so it's um, uh, tough to tell what might be underneath this. So we've just done a 180, or in the process of completing a 180, and... Um, Was our heading northeast? Look at that. What yeah, is that? Is that all sea cucumbers in north. among the we'll mussels? Okay. So the no. red the red crabs we've been looking at, which we've been calling paralomas, actually are not paralomas. Okay. That was a mistake of mine. Um, they are Neolithodes agassizi. Okay. Um, so thank you, Mark Benfield, for pointing that out on Twitter. Twitter's an amazing resource, people. Um, no, but, yeah, so Neolithodes, actually, which is still, I think, in... Oh, no, it'd be in, they're all in the family Lithodidae. Lithodidae. And here is... Uh, that looks like another bristle mouth, maybe. That's it. I can't tilt down anymore. Stay out of the brine, bristle mouth. <laughs> that was a lantern fish, man. Didn't look very good. Okay. No, he looked like he was sort of sagging there in the water, huh? <laughs> yeah, that we saw that at all probably meant it was. Uh, not doing well, maybe impacted by the water quality. Right, right. Right, let's move on. Thanks, Tracy. So as we cruise over the bottom here, and this is mostly dead shells now with a scattering of live ones, um, there's a discussion going on about whether we should stay in this area or move to the next um, site that we've planned, um, which is, that's always a gamble, whether we'll find something similar or different or nothing or things that are relatively less interesting won't say not interesting at all but uh, so we're just casting about here for a moment and we'll be back on track shortly
Chuck, I heard you in the control room, but not over the mic. Um, this is the same general area. Uh, I don't think that we've seen this feature before, but uh, we haven't moved the ship in the last logic, uh, 20 minutes. That was on that uh, shale above that layer to the left. See it right in the center now. Back soon. So this is another little carbonate outcrop. We're in the same general area as we've been. Yeah, um, waiting on a decision. I leave that to uh, uh, Diva and some of the other uh, folks here to decide. They've been more in involved in uh, deciding exactly where to go and the different waypoints, the mapping, for example. Here we're going down into a, a depression. Um, that looks like it's dropping away um, considerably deeper than we've seen. Come on in. And yeah, let's see what that round thing is. Is that a muscle? Yeah, that's a muscle just buried most of the way. And you can see it siphons uh, it really extended there. And it's got a cluster of little anemones and brittle stars on it. Again, that's uh, the uh, any old port in a storm where there's suitable hard substrate. Got a worm. Uh, it's a tube on the right with two extensions out of it. A couple of the uh, curlicue uh, worms. Oh, and uh, palp worms there. The Ketopterid with its long, pale gray palps collecting uh, particles in the water. Those palps are ciliated. They have a ciliated groove. And the amphipods. And Diva, do we have a, a, uh, con a um, Video is clear. decision? Okay, coming out. So we're going to keep in the spirit of exploration, as amazing as this site is, um, where we found brine lakes and um, two seeps, one of which is pretty extensive, a big muscle bed. Um, we are going to keep in, moving. So if you can look at screen three, um, you can see our, our nav screen there. And so we are just off the bottom of the screen. And so now we've got to traverse quite a way to get to our second seep target. Wow, look at all these sclerolinums. Yes. That's just amazing how abruptly the fauna has changed here. That's just, and, uh, and the huge number of amphipods. Just, it, bo it beggars the mind, boggles the mind, beggars the imagination. So we're gonna, so we're gonna move from this uh, local high where we are now, where we had one seep target, up to the seep target, which is also on another high, um, northeast of here. And so that is going to take quite a while, potentially as long as an hour to get up there, moving quite quickly. So what is going to happen in the next hour or so is that we are going to be moving along the bottom pretty quickly. We probably won't be able to stop very often. So won't be able we to get um, very long shots, zooming in of things, Stand maybe quick one. zooms, um, but definitely no collections or so on, unless it was something truly we amazing. Um, so yeah. continuing on with the exploration, who knows what could five. be at waypoint two, where we also have a seep target. Um, but we're going to continue five. on in the and remaining three hours of this dive. Meters away. Thanks for that, Diva. So if you guys are comfortable with moving point three, I will ask Bridge if they are. Yeah, we're good. Yep. Okay. If you guys want to, you guys are already lined up for that. Okay. So onward. Now, Bridge, go ahead. Good with the. Hey, I just uh, want to uh, touch base with you here. We're going to be lower going swing arms uh, out like that, or you want to bring them up? Going going let's bring them up to the normal position for uh, a while here, like 600 and some meters. Um, and we'd like to go 0.3 if you guys are comfortable with that. I don't know if you. I see the wind is kind of veering around uh, the north, little zero one zero maybe. So or it's like that. going if you guys to be. Want to change head before we start the um, long move. Uh, that's, that's fine, whatever you guys want to do. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's going to be about an hour till we reach our and, next uh, uh, destination, okay. and we'll be so moving above the bottom uh, relatively okay. rapidly. And, uh, you want me to get back uh, you'll still be able to see change? the bottom, yeah, sure. and we okay, will let me do five degrees head change to starboard uh, when necessary. And I'll get right back with you. Good copy. All right. And, um, there's also going to be a um, okay, guys. We're going to do a quick a, heading change, uh, so we don't have to Facebook, do it along the uh, way. Event here Copy that, that um, uh, Brian Kennedy, our expedition coordinator, we'll and start Diva, 50 meters, uh, are going to be involved in, and so some yeah, of the uh, video feeds we're, will not be available, 
but I'll still be crazy. chattering on uh, on the science Let's feed look around as I bit see while things. We, uh, while we wait for the ship to change settings. Zoom right here, Roland. Start guessing. Hey, right, come on out. Nah, bridge. Good. Yeah. Uh, if you want to try uh, that move at that speed, I think the head looks good. Uh, I'm willing to try it. Okay, sounds good. We'll do it in uh, 50 meter chunks. Okay. Uh, let's do range 50 meters, bearing 035 degrees speed, 0 decimal 3. All right, bridge copies. This move is going to be range of 50 meters, bearing 035 speed, decimal 3 knots. Yeah, that's a good copy. Okay, we'll try this out and see how it works. Okay, sounds good. All right, stand by for input. You want to bump up serious sonar to 80 when you get a chance? Sure. Thanks. Eighty. You got it. Nav bridge, move initiated, five zero meters, bearing zero three five, speed decimal three. Good copy. All right, let's see what happens. Sounds good. Okay. All right. I'm live. Okay. Um, right now, let's see. I don't think I need that. What's wrong with it? Uh oh, <laughs> that should. That happened okay, I've I repositioned e myself. You know, We're uh, all reoriented. Yep. And uh, as I said, we'll be moving along the bottom. Um, and uh, it'll be about an hour to our next destination. The seafloor is rather uh, undulating here. It's really uh, interesting where it looks like we're going over a drop off there. And uh, as I said, Diva will be occupied with a live Facebook um, interaction for a half an hour, from beginning at uh, 1 o'clock and running to uh, 1.30. So they're setting up now. Uh, Alex yeah. and Brian and Diva will all be involved in that. And so um, they'll be on. Yeah, we have another bed down here. And take just uh, sort of slide down there, I guess, and pass over it just so we can get an idea of what's there as we... We don't have to slow down or anything like that. Okay. I'm ex I expect it'll be pretty similar, but you never know. Uh, I'm, I was told now, uh, yeah, but it's unlikely. Um, okay. Okay, all right. Understood. So my um, conversation, I'm not sure if you heard both sides of that. Um, we're talking about if there's something extraordinary that we need to stop and collect, we can do so on the run. Um. All right, Shoreside, this is uh, Roland speaking. This is just to let you guys know from this point on, you'll only be able to hear Chuck on the uh, conference call. I'll be switching the transmission audio over for the event. 
Thanks, Roland. Roland, that's me. I am. Can you hear me? Okay. All right, test. Testing. Test. I feel like we've been here before. Yeah, we've been in the exact spot before. How much intro are you going to do? Not much. Okay.
do. We stand here when you do these events. Good afternoon, good morning everyone. I'm Brian Kennedy, live from the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer in the Gulf of Mexico, and I'm joined on my left by... My name is Diva Raymond, and I am one of the biology leads aboard this expedition. And Alex? And I'm Alex Avila. I am a Dr. Nancy Foster Scholar, which is sponsored by the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, as well as an Oregon Sea Grant. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll spend the next 30 minutes here on Facebook Live uh, answering your questions and talking a little bit of our current expeditions in the Gulf of Mexico. We've been underway for about 14 days now. Um, we've dove most days. We did have a couple days of really bad weather that made us all appreciate the invention of seasickness medication. It was blowing about 40 knots and we had between 12 and 14 foot seas on and off for about three days. So we certainly couldn't use our remotely operated vehicle. Uh, and it was even some days there was too much choppiness in the um, water column um, to, uh, to even do any good sonar. Um, so please put your questions into Facebook and pass them on to us. Uh, and we'll be taking them now. Uh, David, do you want to give us a little update on what we've seen so far and what we're seeing today? Yeah, so this has been an amazing expedition. It's the first time the Okeanos Explorer has been back in the Gulf of Mexico in three years. So it's, it's really great to be back. But so far, we've explored deep sea coral gardens as well as um, a shipwreck, which was absolutely phenomenal. And then yesterday's dive and today's dive have been particularly amazing. Yesterday, we had huge deep sea corals, you know, nearly 10 feet in width in some places, as well as as asphalt seeps and coal seeps and today we've just found these never before seen coal seep habitats we had no idea existed until today huge mussel beds huge brine lakes you know a lake at the bottom of the sea it just it's been an amazing dive so far today alex oh my gosh yes i've i've loved i've never seen these uh, seeps before I've never seen a brine pool before <laughs> very exciting learning so much of being on the ship actually from all the biologists in the chat from all the scientists here on board uh definitely loving every moment here this cool chimera we saw earlier today was awesome surprise um and just all these odd looking cool fish we see on the bottom <laughs> yeah absolutely and, and one of the things we're just seeing now um is some methane hydrate which is pretty <gasps> unusual oh, to see. No, we're missing it. um so <laughs> methane hydrate is a really interesting thing you only see in the deep sea where when methane interacts with salt, uh, salt water, it forms what's known as a clathrate, and it actually turns into an ice. Diva, can you elaborate a little yeah, bit on so that? Yeah, it, so it has to happen in really specific pressure and temperature conditions, which are obviously being met here. And as a result, it looks like this kind of snow cone um, that, it, that traps underneath overhangs, which is exactly what we're seeing on our live feed right now. And it is a source of these amazing chemicals, which many of the animals in these areas, these chemosynthetic habitats, use sometimes. Sometimes you can even find ice worms living on these methane seeps, the uh, Hesiosica methanicola, and they are found only on methane hydrates. Great. Well, we've got our first questions coming in from our, our Facebook viewers. Uh, Tristan O'Malley asked, the other day when you were exploring a shipwreck, uh, I didn't see you collect anything there. Are you not allowed to collect artifacts from ships, and why is that? Diva? I feel like that? that's a Brian okay, question. Okay, well, I'll take that one, <laughs> not, not to give myself the first question. <laughs> so, um, on the Okeanos Explorer, we uh, collect, uh, we do what's known as non-disturbance archaeology, so we don't actually collect anything. We treat these um, sites as uh, potential graves and with a great deal of respect. Um, so we just image and document what we see and we don't actually collect anything and we leave the preservation um, on the sea floor to preserve these artifacts for later researchers uh, and people to come back and we try and use our high resolution video imagery uh, and in this cruise we're even experimenting with a uh, 3D mosaic that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has been doing uh, producing from our video to allow uh, people on shore to experience these um, historical sites in their uh, pristine nature. And I must say, that mosaic looks amazing. Yes. It's like you're walking Super around cool. that shipwreck. Yeah, so that's not been posted yet, but we certainly will get it up there once we, um, we get past some of the beta testing on it and get it up on the website so you all can see that. 
Um, Victoria Gill um, is interested in what was the hermit crab. Cur- excuse me, what was the <laughs> hermit crab encased in a couple days ago when you were diving again? So I s- think she may be referring to that the anemone. anemone. Mm-hmm. So we've quite a couple times during this expedition, as well as in the Pacific, we've seen some hermit crabs that instead of having shells, they actually just have anemones. So it, it, at one point they would have had a small shell, and those shells eventually dissolve. Um, an anemone will will. Well, the anemone lives on the shell and then the shell dissolves. So it's left with just this anemone and the inside of the anemone will actually become curved to fit around the, uh, the tail of that hermit crab, which is very um, almost spiral. So they have a perfect you know, union um, in, the, uh, in the anemone's base. Yeah, those things are always fascinating to see, like the decorator crabs that have put different things are wearing different animals in that symbiotic relationship. Um, so, well, next question. Donna Lynch asks, uh, do you expect or have you seen any sharks? I guess Alex, being our fishery <laughs> biologist, you want to take that one? Uh, well, chimeras are kind of closely related to sharks. Exactly. Uh, they're the closest ones, actually. Uh, so, in a way, we have seen something like a shark. Uh, we haven't seen any other types yet, uh, but probably either in the water column, uh, either on our way up or down, we could probably see some. Um, I'm not, there are some deep-sea sharks, but uh, we haven't seen them yet. But it'd be really cool if we could get to see some. That would be really exciting. Yeah, I haven't seen any deep-sea ones, but I think during recovery on dive two or dive yeah. three, we saw either a mako or a white tip. I couldn't quite tell exactly. Oh, it stayed that. pretty far away while the RV was being recovered. You could just see it hovering under the surface. Oh, very so cool. we do see deep-sea sharks. Not uncommonly. Um, six gills, Greenland sharks, six things gills. like that. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll, we'll still encounter a few of those on this expedition. Um, Servas um, Wallenrevens? Sorry. Wallenrevens? Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, I just heard that there will be another shipwreck dive on this cruise. When will that be? So we're planning on visiting a wreck on Thursday, so two days from now. Um, this wreck is much more of a mystery than the first one. Not that the first one wasn't a mystery. We have no idea what it was or what not. But we were very sure, due to some high-resolution mapping surveys, that it, had, it was going to be, in fact, a shipwreck. Uh, our dive target for Thursday is a much bigger question mark. It's based on some uh, very coarse-grained side-scan sonar, so we can basically see a lump that is an odd shape for the deep sea and what looks like a debris field around it. Um, But what that's going to turn into be is really anyone's guess. Uh, Sorry, there's a really famous example from, I think it was the 2014 expedition on this ship in the Gulf of Mexico where they were explore, they were intending to explore the shipwreck feature, again, similar to the one we have coming up. It was just a little blip on the sea floor, and uh, they assembled an entire team of archaeologists ashore to tune in and be able to comment on what we were seeing. And when we actually got down there, it was in fact something that has, has never been seen before of that scale, but it was a tar lily. And so that's basically when asphalt is extruded from the sea floor and it had split into about, I think, like 10 different petals, essentially. Um, and it looked like this giant flower of tar on the seafloor. And, you know, that was the beauty of telepresence, being able to work with teams ashore of ex- different expertise, because we were able to say, OK, archaeologists, we don't actually need you today. And um, we do need a bunch of geologists. And they were able to move in really quickly and give us that expert knowledge. Right. All right, on to the next question. Uh, Zachary Andrew Jones asks, what is the strangest invertebrate you guys have seen (laughs) since diving? This is always a hard oh, question. Oh, that's such a hard it question. It really is. Alex, you're, you're kind of new to the deep sea. What, uh, what stood out to you? Everything. No. <laughs> um, honestly, well, I think the the hermit crab with the anemone has been the coolest possible thing I've seen so far. But we saw a lobed or lobate comb jelly that was green, which I've never seen a comb jelly that's colorful before. That's pretty cool. Um, I don't know. There's so many things to pick when I've learned so much about corals here. I never knew anything about corals, and now I'm learning a lot about corals, and I've become like, oh, that's actually really cool. I never knew that. So hard to pick. <laughs> what about you, Diva? Uh, it, m- it may have to be the tube worms that we're seeing today, um, the lamellibrachia tube worms. They're found only in cold seep and hydrothermal vent uh, habitats, usually, and they actually don't have a, m- a mouth or a gut. Um, they instead have an organ in their body known as a trophosome, and that is packed full of bacteria, and those bacteria use chemical energy, chemicals, to create food for that animal. So just a really weird um, worm that can get to, you know, nearly two meters in length in some places. Yeah, uh, I'm going to cheat and actually go to a <laughs> previous cruise. Uh, one that's of, not one, fair. Eh, that's what I get to go for last. Um, so... One of the coolest things I remember ever seeing was, I believe it was actually in the Gulf of Mexico in 2014, we came across a tinafore, a comb jelly, that had recently eaten another tinafore. Oh. Uh, and so you could see the entire 
Tina 4 um, swimming along, all closed up, mouth closed, but there was another smaller Tina 4 swimming around inside of the larger <gasps> no Tina way. 4. So that was one of, That's I think, one of the coolest invertebrate things I've ever seen. Well, we're going to cheat. I just saw a video that Roland, our video engineer, just showed me the other day about a previous Okeanos expedition of a shrimp <laughs> eating a squid. Which I, I, when you first said that, I'm like, nah, you're kidding. You know, it's like, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's actually real. <laughs> that it is. All right. So next question, Victoria Gill asks, uh, what is the difference between a Portuguese man of war and oh a tr God. true jellyfish? So this back is to your like invert zoology. invertebrate <laughs> biology right here. Oh no. So a Portuguese man of war is known as a siphonophore. It's a type of animal called a siphonophore. Whereas um, jellies is a kind of broad informal term that y is used to describe a whole bunch of different um, gelatinous animals that float through the water column. So in terms of this conversation, Portuguese man of wars are actually colonial. Um, they are made up of many different organisms that call zoids that all work together to basically in like in almost in a in a community based type of organization you know they all work together they all have different functions and they work together for this big organism to benefit from and that's how they survive whereas jellies tend to be that is just one animal um, made up of different cells so it's it's this weird um biological difference in terms of like functional anatomy i guess yeah all right moving on uh so the next question we have from alex marshall is can you see previous whole feeds of the dives there's a couple different ways to access them. Um, the simplest is probably through a program called SeaTube. It's hosted by Ocean Networks Canada. Uh, if you just Google SeaTube and ONC, you'll find it. Um, there's whole dives from our expeditions. There's whole dives from other expeditions they've run. Uh, it's a great resource for rewatching entire dives. You can also go to what is known as the OER, Ocean Exploration and Research Video Portal. Uh, and download and access all of our archive video data sets uh, for the entire history of the ship um, through there, both in what's easily streamable, what we call a proxy resolution, uh, and in full high definition glory that you'll probably need to send us a hard drive to get all <laughs> 20 terabytes per cruise of video for. But it is addictive, so be warned. Yes, yes it is. Um, all right, Teresa Burton, uh, I have always understood brine lakes to be cold water phenomenon. Can you explain brine rivers and lakes and why we see them in the Gulf? Okay, so in the Gulf of Mexico, going historically back in the Jurassic period, um, this actually used to be um, a contained ocean that then dried up. And so when it dried up, it left a whole, like, a whole bunch of salt, like a, like kilometers worth of salt layers in the Gulf of Mexico. And then it, that eventually was flooded again and sedimented over. So these, again, kilometer layers of sediment then compressed that salt down and deformed it and made it um, change shape. And then it was sort of extruded in different places. And as a result, that, that saltiness leaking out forms these extremely, these hypersaline, extremely saline uh, bits of areas of water of hypersaline brine that seeps out of the seafloor and because it's so salty it's extremely dense and so it sinks down to the bottom and there it is it is actually difficult it's so dense that it you know if the ROV were to rest down on it it would it wouldn't sink it would float on that brine um, and they as you say they are found only in the deep sea um, I'm pretty sure and uh, apart from if you can include the Dead Sea but that's not, I guess that's a different geological thing going on there. But they, um, they do tend to be found in the, in the deep ocean. And of course, we do need to have certain pressure and temperature variables or characteristics in play to make that a possibility. Great. Thanks a lot, Diva. Uh, next question for Mariana. Uh, have you seen any impacts on climate change? Well, really thinking about the deep sea, um, the deep sea, so little is understood about it, it's even yep. hard to to gauge change. We don't have a baseline. So that's a yep. major part of what this vessel's mission is, is to go out and collect that initial baseline, do an initial characterization of the area, just so we know what is standard. And, and regrettably, we're kind of behind the curve with ideas of yep. climate change and human impacts in the deep sea, is we don't have a baseline of what's pristine or what hasn't been done. So we're kind of playing catch up now um, and trying to get a better idea of what is normal so we can gauge changes. Diva, Alex, do you guys have other well, things you I want to add? I was just thinking what we see all the time. Uh, at first I thought, oh, deep sea is, is escaped from climate change. It's too far down, too far away. But then we see human debris down here. So maybe it's not out of reach of climate change impacts. So. It definitely is not. And I think both of those answers were perfect. The deep sea is not a pristine place. We are already having huge impacts in this place, which we know so little about. Great. 
All right, our next question is the wreck from Saturday. It looked like a merchant ship, was it? Ooh. Well, that's a hard one. They paid attention. They did, <laughs> obviously. Um, well, none of us are, are archaeologists. We are all <laughs> biologists. Um, but the archaeologists uh, were definitely speculating that that was a distinct possibility. Uh, mm -hmm. the, it was definitely not built for speed, and it was well built. Um, so they're hypothesizing that it was some form of merchantman, but I think there needs to be a lot more research done on the site uh, before we can say anything definitively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Matthew asks, how much distance is covered by the ROV uh, with all the mowing the lawn and such in a typical <laughs> dive? <laughs> Diva, do you want to take that one? So we don't really mow the lawn that much unless we're doing mosaics um, like we did at the wreck dive. So typically, we tend to map out um, or decide on a dive track, which is the most we'll do is a kilometer. It's usually about 800 meters in length. And we tend to cover that depending on the gradient of the slope in areas of very, very steep cliffs and so on. We need to move a lot slower to ensure we keep those vehicles safe, our ROVs safe. But when it is flat, we can make as much as a kilometer. But again, it depends on how much cool stuff we're seeing because then we'll stop and zoom and sample and do all these other things that take up time. And of course, we've only got about eight hours or so, depending on the depth uh, at our sites. Great. Thanks a lot, Diva. Tim Tricks asks, uh, would it be possible to hear sound if you had a hydrophone on the ROV? Who wants to take that one? So I know, I think it, it definitely would be. Um, there was a study that came out a couple years ago from the Mariana Trench where actually they put... Um, hydrophones down there and they were able to pick up whales in the surface layers as well as ship traffic. So even though, you know, it's kilometers above, they were still able, these sounds did make it all the way down into the deep. So I'm not sure whether there are sound, there would probably be sounds down here made by animals and so on, but also surface sounds would probably make it down here. Remember, yeah. like sound always travels faster, uh, it travels further and faster underwater than exactly. it does here. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and ROVs are loud as a general rule. While D2 yeah. has got electric propulsion, which is generally fairly quiet compared to some of the hydraulic propulsion system other ROVs use, um, I truly think if you put a hydrophone on the vehicle, um, you more or less would only hear self-noise yeah. on, mm -hmm. on ROVs. Um, but certainly there is acoustic environment and something to be aware of. And there's very little to no research in the deep ocean. And truly there's very little research in even the shallow waters about how mm -hmm. soundscape affects animals and, and how much noise humans are putting into the water. Yep, definitely. All right. Kara asks, uh, why do you have LED red lasers when the red f light frequency is one of the quickest to be absorbed mm -hmm. by the water? So, you want to yeah, take that one? Well, okay. No, you go for it. <laughs> um, honestly, we don't have to shoot, shoot the lasers that far, so we don't need uh, a far penetration. Um, I think it was more of just a purchasing um, decision to buy a red laser versus a green, which many other ROVs do use green lasers. Um, I don't actually know of a specific reason why it's red, other than that was what was available at the time when we purchased them. It could also be that there are so there are so few red substrates in the deep sea that I mean, if you look behind us or at the feed, that most of what the deep sea floor looks like is either you know a dark color or um, this sort of white, off-white siliceous ooze, and so that, that red contrasts really nicely with those backgrounds. Absolutely. All right, Jennifer asked, did the recent hurricanes impact the ocean floor? Uh, and how much impact did they have on the oceans? It's funny because we got this question on Twitter yeah, a couple of days did. ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I cannot say so much for the deep sea impact, but as far as like the sediment goes, we don't see much disturbance from hurricanes. But in shallower waters, there's definitely an impact on habitat, on coral habitats, on seagrass beds. Uh, so definitely an impact on the ocean floor in shallower waters. But definitely, in mm -hmm. at least in mesophotic depths, and perhaps a little bit deeper, so the shallower regions of the deep sea, which would be like 200, 300, 400 meters, it is known that when a hurricane is coming, sometimes animals like lobsters, for instance, the Caribbean spiny lobster, is known to migrate down into deeper areas. So that may be a trend which perhaps a lot of other animals do. They migrate away from these rougher areas down into the safer, um, more uh, cushioned depths, I guess. All right. All right, well, our next question, Servas asks again, uh, we have seen impressions of whales in the sediments. Is there a risk of accident with uh, accidents with big fish or uh, mammals? So um, generally, for the most part with RV operations, we are slow, loud, and bright. <laughs> um, so trying to have an ac having an accident with a animal that is designed and, and intelligent to live in the deep water um, is probably very, very slim. Um, that being said, Alex actually has a particularly <laughs> interesting story about uh, ROV operations and um, sperm whales from a different different cruise. Alex? Uh, so 
a few years back, I was on the Nautilus. Um, they also do deep sea research, and we were with a crew of scientists that were uh, ocean physicists, and they were studying uh, bubbles from methane seeps. And so they were throwing a bunch of radar and sound waves into the into the Gulf, and this cute little sperm whale came to check us out in the middle of the water, and actually it made it, it go it went viral. Yep. <laughs> actually, this really funny article in BuzzFeed that scientists lose their sperm <laughs> whale. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was really cool. It's, I've I've never seen that before, and so uh, they came to check us out, and yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> I know there's another really famous example uh, with the Alvin. So it, that's probably the most famous of all the deep sea submersibles, the ones that people actually go in. Um, a couple decades ago, when they was being used, uh, the scientists were down at depth doing their surveys, and all of a sudden they heard this enormous crash. And they, they felt their vehicle shudder a bit, and they were like, what the heck was that? Because, of course, at those depths, I mean, the smallest thing in that pressure could have a huge impact and potentially kill you. Um, so I think they were a bit worried, but they checked all their signals and all that stuff, didn't see anything that was awry. And then when they brought up the, came back to the surface, brought the vehicle on board, they found a swordfish, a huge swordfish, like six, seven meters long, Whoa. actually stuck in the side of Alvin by its nose. And it was, I mean, at that point it was dead, but yeah. Wow. Pretty crazy story. And I think they had it for dinner that night. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, next question is: How deep are you guys diving right now, and what is how is the water? And is the water cold? So, Ooh. let's see. We are at sixteen hundred and thirty-three meters right now, and the water temperature Usually is four point three Celsius mm -hmm. degrees. So, uh, yep, it's fairly cold, and that's um, warmer than a lot of mm -hmm. sections of the deep ocean. Yep. Um, and that's a pretty typical depth for us to be operating in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, when we bring up samples, the cold water stays pretty cold on the ROV, and we have to put our hands in there. It, it's <laughs> kind of painful, actually, because it's so cold. Yeah, some of the deeper reaches of the Pacific, I've seen, what, one and a half degrees C? Yeah, You've so seen? it tends to go down to, like, one and a half, two. Um, I think in the Antarctic, it could, e could even be a little less. less. Um, but yeah, it is pretty safe to say that most of the deep ocean is a cold place. Not um, only cold, but dark and very high pressure and very food limited. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing some of the uh, evolutionary uh, adaptations that are, have different species and animals have uh, developed in order to compensate for living in such a harsh environment. Yeah. All right, Annie asks, um, hi team, is the OMZ that exists in the Gulf uh, has always been prolific and a testimony to monitoring runoff rates? Have you seen a rebound in species of late? Ooh. And can you mention anything about the stratification that exists in the Gulf? So that is much shallower than I'm accustomed yeah. to working. Do you know anything about that, Alex? No, I'm a shallower person in commercial fisheries, <laughs> per se. Yeah, I'm afraid you've got the wrong group of scientists <laughs> for that question. Um, we are definitely deep sea people or uh, west coast fisheries people. So yep. <laughs> we'll have to try that one out for a different group. Um, Carol asks, uh, how, does, uh, how does anyone know the reproductive strategies of Bathymoliolus? And I mispronounced that terribly. I apologize. Uh, could they be brooders? That was definitely a diva question. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and most of that work is, is done by we collect samples from the deep sea, bring them up to the lab, and then we're able to do um, gametogenic, uh, sorry, histological sections of their reproductive organs. And from that, we can tell, you know, whether some of these muscles are, for instance, hermaphrodites, which means they're both male and female. Or uh, we can also collect them at different times in the year and see how their um, reproductive organs are developed. Developing. And so th from that, you know, gauging the size of the eggs in their or sperm in their in their reproductive organs, we can tell when it is they're ready to spawn. And um, of course, we can do other studies where we sample the water column to look for the larvae, um, which tend to be planktonic and you know float around in the water column. Yeah. All right. Our next question: How do you keep? How long can you keep the robots out for? So, <laughs> Deep Discover is powered and controlled by the ship. So. Theoretically, we can keep D2 down for days and not or weeks on end as long as the ship has diesel fuel and we have people to pilot D2. Um, it can stay down until um, something goes wrong or, or it needs some maintenance. Uh, that being said, on this ship, we generally don't keep uh, D2 in the water for more than about 10 hours, mm -hmm. uh, eight normal. And that's a, a choice for a couple different reasons, from staffing on the ship uh, to us being an exploration vessel and wanting to move on to a new area. Um, the longest I've heard of a research ROV being down, I think, is 120-something hours. Mm -hmm. um, Jason that sounds right. uh, uh, set that record. Uh, and I would imagine some of the industry ROVs and stuff um, that work in the Gulf, um, e the Gulf oil industry that's all around us right now probably mm -hmm. stay down for much longer than that. Some autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVs and the like, can um, stay down for 
months or even years at a time, depending on how they're powered and what kind of work they're doing. Yep. All right, Bree asks, as brine pools are found in areas... Hi, Bree! <laughs> <laughs> uh, ...are found in areas of the deep sea uh, other than the Gulf of Mexico. I think that's uh, Yes, you. they are. Sorry, I had to read the question because <laughs> I was telling you hello and didn't register. Um, so they are found in other areas of the world's oceans. I know there have been some found in the Antarctic as well as, I'm not sure what the other ocean is, I'm blanking. But yes, they are known from other areas of the deep sea, but they are most well known in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there are so many records from this area as well as some incredibly spectacular footage. Great. Uh, Shireen asks, uh, can you give us an overview of the food chain in seeps? Okay, so um, basically it's, it's just like a normal food web on land. You know, you've got various different levels, primary producers, grazers, primary, primary predators, prim uh, secondary, well, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and so on. But it, how it's different from shallow and uh, terrestrial ecosystems is that instead of there being sunlight, which powers plants, which are, of course, the primary producers, there is no sunlight down in the deep sea. Um, and so instead of using sunlight as the form of energy, chemical energy is used at seeps. And that chemical energy, instead of being used by plants, is used by bacteria. So then that bacteria, which can either grow in mats, which we've seen during this dive, a white film on the, on the seafloor on animals, it can also grow within animals um, and provide them with a di direct source of food. And so that's, the, that's generally the primary production. And then you'll get snails and uh, other types of little grazers that come along and munch along on that um, bacteria. And then you've got larger predators, such as those big crabs we were seeing, a couple different species we saw today, that then can come in and also nip off any of those little animals that may be you know, straying too far or not quite concealed enough. Great. Thank you, Diva. Um, next question. How many missions do you plan on doing in 2018? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the Okeanos Explorer has three additional ROV uh, cruises in 2018 coming up. Uh, sorry, I say additional because we're already in the federal fiscal <laughs> year of 18. So this is, <laughs> this is a 2018 cruise in my mind. Um, but we have three more uh, all in the calendar year 18. We have one additional one in the Gulf of Mexico uh, in April. Then we have one along the South Atlantic Bight in uh, late May, June. Uh, and then we'll have uh, a project in uh, the can Canadian U.S. border area of the North Atlantic uh, Canyons Complex. And then we'll have another three or four mapping cruises and technology demonstration projects throughout the year as well. Uh, that you'll all be able to follow right here on uh, No Ocean, Ocean, yeah, Ocean Re I can't talk today. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> Noah's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research's Facebook page uh, and oceanexplorer.noaa.gov. Um, so, next question, Jennifer asks, what technological advances do you see coming in the future of ocean exploration? Do you want to start with that one or do you want me to? I feel like that's a, a Brian one. Okay. Um, so, this one is, I, I get really excited about some of the technology that we use. Um, so I see lots of different things. One of the biggest things is what we're using right now, telepresence. We're using a high bandwidth satellite connection to talk to all of you. And as that technology improves and the throughput and bandwidth of the ships and the latency is reduced, I think that's going to be, you're going to see more and more automation on the ship, people being able to do research and projects from home. We're already experimenting with running mapping operations from shore, uh, where we sail fewer people on the ship and offload workload uh, onto people by just sending all the video data home. Uh, so there's some real technology improvements there. Um, honestly, AI and machine learning are going to be huge um, in, improvements. Um, being able to, I jokingly talked about the 20 terabytes of cruise of data we collect, and, and I'm serious, we literally collect, I think the last cruise I sailed on before this one, we brought back 17 terabytes of video data for the total of hundreds of hours of bottom time. And trying to get people to go through that with the relevant expertise is really difficult. So. Having a machine that's able to go through that and categorize and annotate that video, at least in the first pass, will save uh, human research hundreds of hours of work and, and things like that. And being able to put platforms out autonomously to collect data and work collaboratively without human intervention is really going to open the, open the floodgates on some of these deep, harder access environments. I think also um, being able, you know, with technology, the increasing, we're going to be able to push into uh, less easily accessible areas of the deep ocean. So, for instance, right now, there is no submer no vehicle whatsoever that can get down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest point in our ocean. Um, we lost Nereus a couple of years ago, which was the only one at the time that could do that. And since then, there isn't a replacement yet. So I think that those increases in technology will allow us to access areas which we haven't been able to explore before. 
That'll be really exciting. Yeah, so it's really exciting. Uh, if you look at the ROV competitions that they're having at high school, college levels, um, I actually help out with those. The ROVs that they're coming up with is absolutely amazing. So who knows what a few years from now what the ROVs will look like. And I'm sure we'll definitely be able to penetrate those and barriers. It'll, and it'll probably be become more um, more accessible to, to right. normal people, you know. Right, yeah. Who knows, when you go to the beach, you might have your own little ROV. I know there's like Open ROV and various other, pla mm -hmm. various other platforms that you can, it's an affordable you ROV that kit, you yeah. can take with yeah. you to these places and explore yourself. It's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, wrapping up, I guess our last question, Liz asks Alex um, what it's like to be a Noah Nancy Foster Scholar. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Honestly, it, it's amazing. This scholarship has given me a, an amazing opportunity uh, to first to go to grad school. I'm trying to get my PhD in uh, fisheries at Oregon State. I would not be able to go without it. And also, it's more than just a scholarship that helps you pay for college. Uh, every summer we have training and they give us amazing training on science communication, what can help us be better scientists and how to get our research out there and it challenges our skills and pushes us up further that most other scholarships don't normally do. So it's absolutely amazing experience and same thing for a Sea Grant. They have given us so many opportunities and I encourage everyone to look into it. Anyone who's interested in marine science uh, to look at the Nancy Foster Scholarship at Foster fosterscholars.noaa.gov and Oregon Sea Grant, depending on what school you're in, uh, each state will have their own version of uh, Oregon or secret sorry but yeah it's definitely an amazing opportunity I would not be here without them especially specifically on the ship I'm here <laughs> because of them and it's been an amazing experience well we might we really appreciate you being here yeah, and, and experimenting with some new <laughs> formats for data logging like you've been and so well I think that's all the time we have everyone so thank you Alex and Diva for joining thank us you, Brian. Um, thank you. And uh, I encourage everyone to continue to watch along. We, uh, we're switching from one area of what we expected to see some gap, gas seeps, and we found them, and we're moving to another area. We're hoping to find some additional gas seeps. So stay tuned with us this afternoon. Uh, and as we've got another about 10 days left in this cruise, so we'll be diving hopefully every day, weather and mechanical issues permitting, uh, until the 20th of December. So thank you all so much, uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Um, um, how long to our target, do you think? Hey, Vashley, this is Nav here. Oh, um, sorry. We have another audio transmission has been reestablished. Five minutes. Thank you. Something Thank like you that. very much. Okay, appreciate that. Sure. So we have another thirty-five minutes to our uh, our target. Okay. Thank you. Interesting, we've seen all of these little trails and no perpetrators. Zoom in right here, Roland. Or perpetrailers. Ship's still stationary now, right? There's a fecal mound. Uh, yeah. Somebody pooped out on the sediment surface. Very precise. So we've just completed the uh, Facebook event. Now yeah, let's see what that is. That looks mostly like sargassum. Yeah. Will do. Zoom in here. Oh, okay. It's another uh, C pen. All right. Let's let go.
want to fly for a bit, Chris? We're done. Go ahead. Okay, pilots, we're back underway, doing another 100 meters, same bearing, 035, same speed, 0 decimal 3. Copy that. Copy that. And we're about halfway. A little, little more, actually. We're chasing the wind around. Yeah, it keeps... Veering. Like every time the ship changes its heading, it just keeps coming around on them. How many knots? Fifteen. Yeah, it's, it's been somewhat consistent since I've sat down at least fifteen to twenty. There's a blind fish going off bottom. Very small. Black. Yep, he's gonna get dusted. Sorry. Yeah, it's a little late there. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to spot him sooner. Something here, if you want to zoom. A little cave. Go ahead in. Now there's somebody's old burrow and some trackways in front of it. Okay, it's coming up. Watch the nav. Go ahead, nav. Hey, we have a little less than two hours left on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And how are we making? Are we making good uh, way to the new waypoint? We are. Yeah, 
We're right. a little more than halfway and about a half hour left. And we, we actually might start seeing things before the actual waypoint anyway. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Um, so, we, so. so we're going to be coming off bottom at 5.40. Uh, sorry, 3.40. <laughs> a Wish, here, little wishful right. thinking. <laughs> um, ye yes. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Thank you. Yep, no problem. There's one, one another one of those um, relatively straight furrow trails running off in the distance with uh, no indication of who made it. Um, well, it's impossible to, I suppose it could conceivably be some tiny little weight dragged on the bottom, but here you see another one in the here. middle that's wiggling and another one running off in, in at different angles, and the other one curved around here. So uh, I don't think they're human. And um, they are not all in the same direction, so they're not little rocks sliding down a slope. These ones look a little curvy, so I'm thinking yes, yes. Something like that, at least. Uh, some deposit feeder, and they're crisscrossing each other. So it doesn't seem like a physical phenomenon. Another umbellula in the distance. There are, I believe, two species of umbellula in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, un one is umbellula, umbellula, umbellula. Umbellula. You say potato, and I say <laughs> potato. No, that's uh -huh. a sea pen. Yeah. And. Um, I think one of the species is Lindall eye, but I don't remember the other one. Ah, that Bob Carney suggests that those trails may be hermit crabs dragging shells. Oh, that's a good one. Which makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, because those guys often look like they're on a mission. Zoom in here. And the fact that the trail remains indicates how long, how slow the process of uh, modifying the sediment surface takes. But then you see these uh, fecal pellets. And then there are these fecal pellets, right. So somebody's buried in the sea floor or um, <laughs> has taken a step aside from the trail and, and uh, you know, done a rest stop on the side. I don't think that's They're the very case. regular. They are extremely <laughs> regular. Looks like like rabbit food or like, I don't yes. know, yeah, rabbit fish pellets. fish food. Yes. Which in a way, I guess it is fish food. Black object next to the line might be a fish. Might worth it. So we're we are a little snap. more than yeah, halfway to our waypoint. Our Oop. next destination. That looks like either a, a stick. Uh, partially buried piece of. Well, I can't quite tell. What do you think? I don't know if that's a seagrass blade or a piece of shell. Max. All right. Uh, maybe uh, shallow water seagrass rhizome. It's a little group of white things lower right. Fish upper right. Mm -hmm. Possibly a shale, it's not moving.
get in, Roland? Yep. Out by its lonesome. Yeah, so this one's actually been like crunched on the front, on the top of the edge mm -hmm. of it. So maybe that was um, indic as an indication of some predator like that big um, Neolithodes crab munching away at it before strewing the, the empty wrapper. Oh, look at those icky urine spokes. Oh, yes. As well as the mound. I mean, that's like classic icky urine right there. Mm -hmm. So icky urines are spoon worms. And um, they live within Snapper. the um, sediment in a U-shaped burrow, right, right, Chuck? Yes. And so at one end, there'll be this huge mound where they're pushing out all of their sediment. Mm -hmm. And on the other one, they'll have their head where they can extend their proboscis out and pull okay. in particles which one? with um, the, which have organic matter in it. And look at this very poor, what's left of an umbellula with a little uh, the claw oh of, a, of a little uh, crustacean on the other side of it sticking up. He's like, made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sort of looks like it's only been retracted. Oh, that is quite sad looking, isn't it? Yes, it is. It sort of looked like it's only been retracted, though. Well, Are these able I, to retract? I don't know if they can retract that far. I honestly don't know. Let's see if anybody from... Because uh, sea pens can retract, can't they? I think the crabs on the other well, side. Well, the whole colony can with... The other species, the whole oh. colony can withdraw into the sediment. Right. I don't think umbellula can do that. But I suppose it's possible that these polyps are withdrawn. I don't know if they... I, I've it never seen that before, so I don't know. I Certainly when you put them in alcohol, they don't do that. Right. I think the crabs on the other side, right? They're yes, peeking out. Yes, Looking down on you. Holding on for dear life. <laughs> Looks like a, a uh, squat lobster. Yeah. <laughs> it's single tentacle Looks like it's holding on for dear life. See that single yeah, so tentacle? I don't know if yeah. that's one regenerating, maybe? Uh, or, or a tentacle. Well, it looks like a tentacle sticking out from a withdrawn polyp. It does look like that. Let's see if anybody says anything. Roland, that's a great observation, though. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> hey, coming up. He's our honorary biologist. <laughs> honorary engineer. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so you can see the yes. perfect spokes of those urine tracks where it's obviously extended way out like a meter and then drawn in all that sediment, and it forms these sort of bicycle spokes um, from, a, like, a bicycle wheel. And uh, echiurins are another example of a, a worm that, um, uh, like the... Um, the siboglinids, the chemosynthetic worms that used to be in separate phyla, the Poganophora, the Poganophora, and Vestimentifera, have now been uh, included within the annelids, the segmented worms. So have the echiurins. The echiurin spoon worms used to be a separate phylum. It was acknowledged that they did have uh, bristles, keti, like polychaetes, like annelids. Um, and molecular evidence has now submerged them within the phylum Annelida. Okay, guys, another hundred coming your way. Copy that. Ship seems to like this new heading. Left. Or holothurian. Fish. Come on in. Oh, there's another uh, Ophidia form. See if we can get an opinion from Tracy on this one. This one has... Going uh, to uh, feed to Andrea on that one. Okay, this one Andrea has got has those uh, elongated, I guess they're pectoral fin rays in the front. This is beautiful. Yeah, we saw this one yesterday. I think someone came up with a name yesterday. I don't... I remember it having 
a couple of them, but I don't remember the pectoral fins being quite like this. Okay, maybe it's different. I don't. I mean, I could be totally and wrong. And it's got those puppy dog eyes again. Oh no, we did see two with yes, the extensions, one didn't with we? One very long ones yeah. and dorsal. That was a. Uh, That's the one I was thinking of. Right. So might maybe a dry clone in Tronigra, which is one of the ones we saw. I just wrote it down from yesterday. Dicrolini, mm -hmm. in Tronigra, perhaps. It's a Cuskio, possibly. What magnificent. Okay, we're we'll looking straight down on you again. Thanks, Don. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I'd go with that ID. That sounds pretty good. It's got this free pectoral rays, and there is a spine on that, a purple. It's just covered with a skin flap. Oh, right. We can see that. Yep. Yeah, it's a little uh, flattened spine for uh, cover, yes, on the, uh, the operculum behind the eye. Okay. Now we're looking back at you. Yes, clear right. when you are. Thank you. That. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. no. We're, yeah, okay. <laughs> I see the brine pool, yeah, where we're mm -hmm. at just now. Nice. That would be nice. Semi-transparent. See, uh, Diva, give me a spot right there that's a discontinuous trail. Yeah, so I know with like some sea cucumbers, you can actually see where the little okay. tube feet have, you know, walked along the bottom. I've definitely seen that in the Pacific. I'm not suggesting that's what that is, um, but you th those tend to be like little dots all on mass to okay. each other. And it's, right. um, it's pretty cute, actually. It's not an underwater rabbit. <laughs> Cucumber top. And there we just might have a culprit. Maybe. Hey, come on in, Roland. The business end is in the left. Uh, uh, stick up us. Pseudo different fecal question pellets. mark. Um, this is a sea cucumber. All right. Is this something we want to pick up? Because it's questionable. I don't know how many specimens exist. Bob Carney, um, he says it's a synelactid. Um, in uh, Pawson et al.'s uh, paper on the... Um, Sea cucumbers of the Gulf Let's of go Mexico. To that front left side. Um, I think this one had a question mark next to it. Uh, possibly. And um, oh, uh, Bob says Paroriza, maybe. I get it. 
No, never mind. No, we won't pick it up. So Bob Carney suggests in the genus Pararyza. Yeah, okay. I'm going to disagree with Pararyza because they tend to have like um, little, like tiny little papillae and they look sort of rough um, in their, in their okay. morphology, whereas this one looks pretty smooth. So I think your first guess, your first, not guess, your first um, lead was much better, which was the, um, which was the pseudostichopus question mark. But in the Porson paper, it says, hold on, I'm trying to find it. Yeah, it doesn't, it just says it may belong to the same species, but I'm not sure what it's referring to. Um, perhaps in the genus Pseudostichopus. Interesting. That's the first time we've seen that one. Yes. And another uh, ostensible halosaur. Yep. Altravandia. Just hanging out there. Oh, I've never noticed that, like, um... Fringe along? Yeah. The, yeah. On the underside. Now, Tracy, do you can you tell us what the um, what looks like that little oh. transparent scalloping along the uh, uh, ventral lateral margin might be? Yeah, those are uh, enlarged scales. Oh, okay. Just, uh, laid in in a single pattern that, that kind of reflects light like that. Can we have a quick okay. zoom on that? Um, Very good. Thanks. Pump to the left. It might be a sea urchin, or it could be seagrass. You can look at it. Pretty sure it's yeah. Just a quick zoom. Awesome. Yeah, I Come think it's really awesome. Yep. I got excited because I thought it was one of those um, <laughs> those uh, spatangoid sea urchins. No, not the no. spatangoid ones. The oh. formosomas. Which oh, have right, the, yeah, right. Which the, have the, the um, sticking up. The pancake urchins. Yeah, exactly. Come on up. Yeah, there's a there's a whole family of uh, deep sea urchins called pancake urchins because uh, they're somewhat inflated. They're they're like cushions. They look like cushions. Their skeletons are not rigid like a normal urchin, like a regular urchin, uh, but they're much uh, softer. One of the reasons, uh, and that goes along Two with a shares. lot of other deep sea organisms, calcium carbonate in deep cold water is much more difficult to extract in, in order to build your skeleton. And so these pancake urchins have a flexible, uh, very flimsy skeleton by comparison to uh, typical urchins, right, and on. when you bring them on board, they collapse, and so they're called pancake urchins. Which I never knew until Chris Ma, he does such a great job with his Echino oh, blog it, and yeah. his Twitter that he posted a photo of one from a museum collection. It must have been in Paris where he is now, and yeah, it was totally <laughs> flat, and I had no idea they did that, and that's why they were had that name. And that was like a couple weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, also, if I recall correctly, after the um, uh, after the first uh, stalked sea lilies were discovered in deep water off Norway, uh, the early British deep water expeditions in the North Sea, I believe it was, or the Northeast Atlantic anyway, uh, collected the first pancake urchins, and I believe they were also previously known only from the, the um, uh, late Mesozoic. So another living fossil, if I recall correctly. Is that a Uri? No, that's just a very small, dark, dark halosaur. What did you think it was? I thought it might. S I'll tell you in a minute. All right, come on in, Roland. I can see the, there's the eye. It's a little black one. All right.
So what do you think, Tracy? Come in tight. Or um, that's Max. Andrea. Yeah, Andrea's Confirm. on the A line. A nice contrast to the last specimen yes. we saw. Yes. Another silverfish way off in the background. So I can't really see the uh, the scales over the eye, but the color uh, looks like Halosaurus. So okay. we really have two two guesses there. When we first saw it, before Andrea we Andrea might know exactly which one. Right. When we first saw it, before we zoomed in, it reminded me of a photograph Video's taken clear. years ago, I think in the Northeast Atlantic of one of the midwater um, yeah. Uri pharynx, the gulper eel, the black gulper eel, long and slender, that had been spotted near the sea floor. Um, one can only hope. Straight down on it. Come on in. And another Halosaur, again, most likely Aldrovandia. You can see ob the obvious difference between this one and the previous. Urchin, pink, right of where lasers would be. Go ahead, Carl. And what an eye, a tiny sea urchin. Boy, you guys are good. You guys are very, very good. That is, looks like a tiny little sidarid pencil urchin. And the little cloud eyes it's sponge next to yes. it. Yes. Out in the... You think that's a sidarid? Well, it's got those very large... Let's Still see if I can around. get a better look at it. Bob may able be able to help me. Tell me. Um, or a plesiodi... No, maybe yeah, this. I yeah, was plesiodiadema. Plesio plesiodiadematid. Yeah, I was thinking more along. Yes. Yes. Focus yeah, for a spidodiadematidae. Uh, that's right, a spidodiadematidae. Uh, but I know, the family. isn't that the, um, the anal cone? Yes, it is. Uh, it is. I've never seen one this pale, but I've never seen one this Video's small. Clear. But those long, so, so very yeah, delicate, right almost filamentous back. curved spines are characteristic of this family, Aspidodiadematidae. Yeah. Yeah, right. Come on out. And this looks like Aspidodiadema, if that is found in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, or maybe Plesiodiadema, but yeah, definitely from that family. Yeah, but I think plesiodiadema, if I remember correctly, is much shallower. Ah. It's darker, and I've seen it in like 200 meters of water. Ooh, what's this coming up? Mounds. Who's that? Oh, over there, over right. Interesting burrow. Yep, again, another there. one of those um, uh, circle of burrows with a mound next to it. So underneath the sediment, that could be like a whole multi-chamber, <laughs> right. like mansion going on That's there. That's right. And there's there. another one Can beyond, uh, beyond right. You can get a really, if you the flip over to camera two right now, you can get a really great view from Sirius of those. Right, there's a couple burrows. of them next to each other. <laughs> oh, is that a Coke can? Or a Coors. It is Coke. Uh -oh. And a nice little anemone. Oh, and an adorable little polychy. Yep. That looks like an um, Ophiotroca or a, actually, this no, maybe Hesionid. And I think, uh, is that a uh, gooseneck barnacle up right? Or is that, yes, I think so. Or is that, it's not on the sediment. No, it's on the can. Yeah. Oh, oh look at these little polychaetes. To push out. Wandering yeah, around come on there. Up. Amazing, and if you think that's, think about how small that is. That's the mm. bottom of a Coke can we were just looking at. Those were probably, what, a centimeter Sorry. across, if, if even? No. Well, what is that? Cloud in front of you. What, is what is all that? Left? That pale, um, that's serious light. Is that a, a rise in the seafloor? I think it's serious as lights. Ah. ah. <laughs> 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 
You guys might start yep, seeing that. that series uh, is lights. We were all like, oh my God, some kind of like weird, yeah. you know, fog in the deep sea, some kind of like you guys white copy that? smoke or something. You got okay. that hill coming up in Sirius. Sonar. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Roland. Look, <laughs> thank you. Look at uh, Sirius's view and you can see several of these perfectly circular clusters of burrows with a big mound in one corner, uh, one uh, part of the circle. Very interesting. Might be the phone. And there's quite a number of them. Hi guys, here. Willis. Go ahead. Willis Pecklinot thought that those circles would be made by Glyphokrangon, a shrimp, oh. but he didn't offer much for evidence. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you, Mary. So everyone, that was Mary Wixon from Texas A&M. She's an arthropod expert, especially of shrimp. So I think that's a great time for us to do like a little situational update and sure. do some reintros. Um, currently, we are at a depth of 1,600 nearly exactly meters. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico at a site known as Green Canyon area in St. Tammany Basin. So, so far this has been an incredible dive. Um, we've seen brine lakes and two huge cold seeps with loads and loads of mussels and other right chemosynthetic um, habitats. And it looks like maybe we're coming on to another one now. Indeed. Like mussels in or there. something or down there. Rock. I think maybe a rock. Um, but now we're currently moving from that area, which was a, a local bathymetric high, to the next area where we've seen these bubble targets we got in our mapping um, data last night to yeah, our second mapping Come target on, where we suspect there may be bubbles of methane here. gas yep. escaping from the seafloor as well as um, a topographically high area, um, which we expect would be a good place to find more seeps. And these look like contracted anemones. Uh, I don't know about the big oh one. Oh, no, on sponge. sponge. Look at all the That's pores. That's a sponge, yes. Yes, you're right. An anemone in, uh, in the center. Pretty sure does. Maybe a demo sponge? I would say, not a glass sponge. But um, so we're currently moving in this very sedimented sort of a uh, low between these two high areas. Um, and as a result, there just hasn't been as much to see as what we were observing earlier this morning. Um, so my name is Diva Raymond and I am one of the biology leads on board this current okay. expedition of the Oceanus Explorer. I'm currently based at the Natural History Museum in London as a research fellow where I work on chemosynthetic habitats as well as human impacts on deep sea fauna. And I'm Chuck Messing. I'm the other coast science lead. I'm from oh, Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, focus and I'm an invertebrate zoologist. My specialty is the crinoids, yes. the sea lilies, and feather yeah. stars. There'll be another one. But I work also on deep uh, sea coral and other hard, hard substrate environments. And just this looks like, before I pass it on, this looks like a, the Dima sponges uh, with possible uh, little white zoanthids. And I don't know what that, that looks like. That looks like a little bivalve. Yes, it does. And who's next? And I am Alex Avila. I am a PhD student at Oregon State University in Fisheries, and I am here as a Dr. Nancy Foster Scholar, part of the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And I am also an Oregon Sea Grant Fellow, and I am helping out here with data logging and processing samples when we collect some. Oh, which reminds us, we don't have any samples. Yeah, we don't have any samples. Not on this trip, no, this dive yet. Another halosaur. Do a snap, really. Aldrovandia, most okay, likely. Let him go. Uh, Bob Carney said that bivalve looked like uh, a museum, which is a scallop. And uh, I remember we would dredge up something at least back then was called proprium museum it was a glass scallop because the shell was so thin and transparent like the one uh, like we've the seen we just saw Sirius here on that rock ROV have diminished lots of little uh, burrow indications little pale spots on the sediment
something ahead of us to the left. That looks like uh, I'm not sure what that was. Getting back on our heading. Oh, good. Yeah, that's just another mound and crater adjacent, adjacent to it, a couple of them. Fish. And that looks like, oh, that's different, I think. It, look, it looks like it's smiling. Unlike all of the other fishes that we've seen, this one looks like it's smiling. Tracy, what, or Andrea? <laughs> yeah, this is the, uh, this that spiny, spiny eel, the same thing we saw okay. uh, earlier. So this is uh, good. Protocantha notus. No, that's not right. Something in Cantha notus. <laughs> So we have a whole group of visitors here in the lab, and so they're watching you, uh, watching me, watching you talk to you on the phone. <laughs> where, where, where you guys We're from Slayton County yeah. Public Schools in the Atlanta, Georgia metro area. Great to have you following along. Thank you for coming in and, you know, joining us for this exploration. As we prepare to um, lead or participate in activities that will connect to activities that our students and teachers will be doing. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, you're most welcome. And that's, this is one of the amazing things about telepresence. We are here in the southern Gulf of Mexico. At our ROVs are down at 1,600 meters depth. Um, we are mid-exploration. And... We are being joined by people all over the world, um, you know, just Pretty members of the public who may be at home. My mom was saying at home in the Caribbean Haven't that she was watching. We've just got this school, which was joining, well, You're Tracy, right who's joining from Florida, right, right. Um, has visitors from the Atlanta, Georgia area, educators and so on. And then as well as just members of the public or science communicators who may be following along, we have other stakeholders. So folks from industry, folks from government, folks from um, sanctuaries and so on. And then, of course, we've got our scientists ashore who may be following along passively because, hey, deep sea TV is cool, um, and so is deep sea exploration. But also, we have these scientists ashore who are participating with us, such as Amanda Demopoulos from USGS, Asako Matsumoto, who's joining us from Japan, um, Dan Wagner, who, well, I know he's hey, normally based up. in the US, but I'm not quite sure where he is now because <laughs> I think he's traveling, um, maybe in Europe. Um, Eric Cordes, who's joining us from the U.S., Masi, Jim Masterton, uh, Les Watling, who's in Hawaii right now, uh, Mashkor Malik, who's with NOAA OER, Megan Putz, who is in at the University of Hawaii, Megan McCullough, Mike Vecchioni, who is a Kephlopod expert from the Smithsonian, um, Mike Ford, who's a midwater expert, and it looks like we're coming upon some seeps, and who else we got? Rachel Bassett, Bob Carney, Tina Maltsova, another amazing international participant from the Russia, and, Tra and she's a an, uh, Nidarian expert. And then Tracy Sutton, who's been our fish expert that you've been hearing, uh, hearing from quite a bit during this dive. Thank you guys for joining us, and they are the reason that we get to sound so smart. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like we're moving into a more geologically active area. Um, a reminder that last night we did map over this area and we did find a bubble target, which Ooh. indicates an area where methane is escaping from the sea floor. And methane is one of the chemicals that fuel these chemosynthetic habitats. So we can see we're getting into this more undulate, these more undulating features like we saw earlier, and we are definitely about to hit a seep. And what are those down front and center? Come on in, Roland. Anemones in the Venus flytrap uh, posture. And there's a glyphocrangon shrimp. And one of them was in the Venus flytrap posture, but that's not the same as we've seen before, certainly. Now these are the ones we saw yesterday that have oh. the mouth slightly oh, raised. Oh, that's raised. That's right. I'm trying to remember what and I'm look at the tentacles are sort of in clusters there. So it's in the family Actiner Actinernidae. Actinernidae. And we've also got a heterocarpus shrimp, oh, which right. are a commercially fish species, and a squat lobster. I wonder why all these anemones are just suddenly hey, all of a sudden, all in of this a little sudden. area, like a little patch. 
could be a clonal group. Uh, anemones in uh, uh, the California intertidal form mats of clones, even though they're individual polyps. Actinernidae. Trying to get the group. If you look at that uh, shrimp, a bit you can see that the maybe. second, the side of the second abdominal segment overlaps both front and Mouth rear. Overlaps both the first yeah, and right the there. second of first Looking and third down on you now. Uh, abdominal segments. Go ahead. And that puts it in the group Caridia, uh, C A R I D E A, along with a lot of other. Um, Commensal shrimps, some commercial, a few commercial shrimps, and uh, uh, quite a diversity. Cleaner shrimp, some of the cleaner shrimps as well. Snapping yeah, shrimps. But interesting, yeah, we haven't seen any picture. of these anemones today, and all of a sudden some there's four of them, or here. five. Aha! Uh -huh. What have we here? That's pretty rugged topography by comparison. So, Carolyn, I'm hoping you're still there because you sent us a really informative email about features such as these. Um, so, I'm hoping if you're still on the line, you could you could actually just explain it for us. Um, if not, I'm happy to go back to that line. Sirius coming to a stop, Chris. Right, so ship can't stop. I yeah. think we're still there. Okay, I don't think she's still there, but um, Carolyn Rupel from USGS, who has had extensive um, experience in these types of habitats, especially with hydrates, she was saying in one of her emails to Chuck and I that at very slow rates so. of um, fluid flow, so these fluids, the hydrocarbon-rich fluids, which create these the types of habitats, so at very slow rates, um, you tend to get these chimneys and mineral deposits. So like we just passed over something that looked like a little miniature chimney. And so perhaps once upon a time, there was very slow fluid flow here and formed these orthogenic carbonates, of course, with um, bacteria mediating that Something process. Something purple in the center of that rock that's coming in. That was probably center. terribly yeah, explained. Uh, no, I'm I think that was, I think that was pretty clear. Copy. I think that was pretty clear. Thank you. And so, of course, we can see also here some very thick bacterial mats growing all over the floor. Okay, guys, fish I did not hiding out in between move. these orthogenic yeah. carbonates, yeah. which, yeah. again, are intrinsically linked to these chemosynthetic sites. Um, they're formed via We're microbes, which the of course there are many different microbes anyway, taking right? part in all of these different um, reactions here. But they are usually uh, found in areas of the general seepage and just this after some time gotcha. can Anything host can very large coral colonies like we saw last uh, during yesterday's dive. Something yellow in the white stuff. That, um, ooh, is that? a squat lobster, I think oh you can yes. see it beating its tail. That's right. And it had kind of all of its claws had kind of streamlined, so it was a little difficult to... Good eye. But I feel like, yeah, we're on the cusp of something here. A lot more shell hash coming into view, some more fish. You know, these are, I was speaking about it yesterday, you, you follow these kind of breadcrumb trails to find these environments. You get the odd shell here and there as we were coming through the sedimented areas. Then we begin to see, you know, some undulating of the terrain, and then we get, you know, these more uh, densely accrued areas of shells, that some of which Still may be very old, here. as Let's well as patches of reduced black and sediment with white bacterial mats, and you just kind of keep going, and then you start to see again, hey, we've got some of these little tube worms that we saw a couple dives ago with the tiny, Go tiny little take. red plumes. And so, you know, you... you it's a little smidge here and there, and you sort of put the pieces together to find these habitats. And just above in the left-hand corner, there is a live lamellibrachia tube worm. And so though it may not seem like there's a lot of seepage here, 
these tube worms can actually extend their roots deep down into the sediment where they're where there are probably higher concentrations of the, of the chemicals, the chemical-rich okay. fluid that Coming these out. animals need Still to survive. So all of those sulfides those tube worms need are much much further down in these areas, and so they c their tube can then mine down and, and then suck it up so that the bacteria within their bodies can create food for them. What's over the edge here? What do you think, Chuck? I'm holding my breath. <laughs> I think it's something amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's always amazing, Roland. <laughs> something no one has seen ever before. And that's a g this is a great time to remind everyone of that. You know, we are exploring an area of the seafloor that has never been explored before. All of these habitats um, in this area, everything we have seen throughout this dive, as well as through all of the dives during this expedition, no one has ever seen before. So Skip if you are fish. tuning in, you are among the first people on the planet to be seeing these things, which is amazing. There's a, that looks like a rat tail. It's got a barb. And it's got the, um, the ring, the black ring right. around the eye. So uh, Corphenoides mexicanus, probably, but it's got a couple of parasites on it. I'm going to change my heading to keep you in. So Megan yeah, Putz has Two mentioned burns. that, an, that uh, about the anemones we saw, a species called Actinernus nobilis. <gasps> Two worms. Yes, uh, has been found in the Pacific, uh, but it looks a bit different than the one we have, so it's probably a different species. So again, here we have here this environment, which doesn't seem super chemosynthetic. Um, you tend to get mussels in the areas of very high fluid flow Let's or um, where there's the much the shallower uh, seepage. Whereas here, it doesn't look like that exists. Instead, you've got these tube worms, which can extend probably, you know, a, a couple of feet. Yeah, or maybe okay. even a meter down into the sediment where they can tap in to that seepage, those chemicals they need much, much deeper down. And so that's why they're able to thrive here. But a lot of the other animals, such as the mussels and the clams, it. are not. Copy. Following. So at these depths in the Gulf of Mexico, there tend to be a couple of species of these tube worms, but the two main genera are Lamellibrachia and Escarpia. And you can see the rock here is uh, what the giallop. Pull it back a little bit. And the front end, first the front end of that worm that looks like a little concave cap that acts like an operculum closing the tube uh, when the worm withdraws is called the obturaculum. And it's the first part of three of the worm's body. The next part is the... Well, the lamellae are the all the The lamellae are plumes. in there, right? That, yeah. are, that contain the um, vessels for um, uh, with the uh, hemoglobin. blood pigment, right? Hemoglobin for pulling in oxygen. Just uh, like we have. That's right. And um, then the rest of the body is the trunk. And then within that, they've got the trophosome, which is that organ which instead of a mouth and a gut these worms have this trophosome and it is packed full of bacteria sites so the bacteria that this worm needs to create the food that it needs to survive the bacteria will use the sulfides in the um, chemicals seeping out of the seafloor and take those sulfides and make food using that chemical energy and it's it's a sort of a parallel process to photosynthesis Basically, photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and water and the energy of sunlight and uses that to manufacture sugar and releases oxygen. And in this parallel system, these uh, chemosynthetic bacteria use carbon dioxide and water, but also hydrogen sulfide, H2S instead of H2O, to manufacture uh, sugars, basic carbohydrates, and give off oxygen and um, sulfur, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and so tilt up that's and maybe exactly a right, Chuck. And the so group. at these cold Let's seeps, sometimes you tend to get um, zonation. Oh, look at that one. Got its plume all extended, and it's... Uh, that's, that's much better to be able to see the, the morphology of that plume. 
but so it seeps sometimes you get zonation um, in the in the areas of actual seepage as well moving away from those so oh, that's great look at that I'm gonna take that photo and use it in my class yeah it's beautiful uh, I was just going to say uh, about those anemones, Actinernus, um, the Pacific species nobilis, and I went on the uh, World Register of Marine Species, which is like the current arbiter uh, in many respects, tries to keep most up to date for all of the species, genus, family names, etc., of marine Ooh, organisms. Lovely. Uh, from sponges to uh, whales. Um, and under the genus Actinernus, there are no species listed, which suggests that the taxonomy of the group has yet to be worked out in detail, or they need to find an editor who's willing to upload that information. Okay. Hold on one second, Marilla. Oh, just give me the view. So you see anemone taxonomists, get on with it. I think... Uh, Daphne Foten, who is a felt it. Um, major force in sea anemone taxonomy, has retired. And one of her students, who I apologize, I cannot remember the name, Megan. She's at, what is it, Ohio State? Who's this? What is this? Um, one of Daphne Foten's students who has sort of taken up the cudgels of... I know Estefania Rodriguez has. Yes, that's and right. And they work really closely together. Yes, and uh, sh that's another name I forgot. Sorry. And uh, so right. uh, they're a very difficult the group uh, and require a lot of histological work as well as uh, gross morphology we and molecular yeah, work. Do you want to get serious back on head or? Yeah, head over that way. So we can keep going northeast. Whenever you guys are ready, let me know. I just have to relate this quickly while we're moving over the bottom here in this cloud. Um, I get an email feed from the uh, Sigma Xi Society, uh, Biological Research Society. It's called Smart Brief, and it always has interesting articles posted. So this one, it comes in weekly. Up to seven new silky anteater species been, have been found in South America. They're terrestrial and difficult to find. Uh, we keep finding new species else, you know, who knows where. Okay. Um, okay. Back on heading. Trees recently. in the Amazon produce okay. huge amounts of methane gas. Who knew? Let's do 40 um, meters. And let's Come see what else. Researchers turn human waste into bioplastic. There are some remarkable studies going on, not just about ocean science, but of course in all aspects of our world. I was just I had to put that in because it just it beggars the imagination how is much another shrimp new information is left? coming out. It looks white. And that looks like Glyphocrangon on the bottom. Snap in, really. Yep. Got uh, a very thick uh, exoskeleton with strong ridges and sculpturing. Yep. Coming up. Cool face. Ah, interesting. So maybe my page had not loaded. Tina Molotsova. Uh, linked me to the Actinernus page, and this one lists uh, four species, Elongatus Michael Sarzai. Michael Sars was the guy who found that first deep-sea sea lily off Norway. Uh, no, and it was also the name of a research vessel. And okay, guys, Nobilis you got 40 meters coming your way. Copy that. Zero Not through sure five. where they're good. found, though. Let's see. 
I'm guessing, uh, well, we'll see. I'll we'll look it up. So one of them is from the Antarctic, one of the Actinernus. Let's see where Robustus is from. Here it looks like we're following another one of these um, areas with some shell hash, most likely Bathymodiola shells or perhaps also Vesicomyids. Um, and you can also see some lightly blackened areas and some also white areas of bacterial mats indicating that below here, below all the sediment, there is probably um, quite a lot of seepage happening. This whole area may be geologically active. So we're just about to do a pilot change, so we may be hovering here for a little while. But sometimes what happens in these chemosynthetic habitats is you get um, very clear zonation. So in the areas closest to the flow or to where the seepage is happening, there'll be mussel beds. And with those mussel beds, there'll be a menagerie of invertebrates. Thanks, guys. There'll be a menagerie of invertebrates that live in these mussel beds. And then outside of that mussel bed, moving further away from the obvious flow, there'll be tube worms living amongst, for instance, just like we just saw on those carbonates and other animals that still need use chemosynthesis to um, create energy but right, also not necessarily completely reliant um, on being super close it. to that high flow so and I then outside of that we have animals which don't rely on the chemosynthesis at and all but still utilize seats. those orthogenic carbonates so lo like yeah, yesterday's zero, three, diet, five. we saw these huge coral colonies which are suspension feeders taking particles from the water column as food They'll be in the outside yep. of that, and then potentially also uh, shell beds like we're seeing now, or um, sedimented areas where there's still some um, influence of seepage and chemosynthesis. We're seeing, you know, uh, blackened areas and white bacterial mats, as well as some shells. And yeah, even though it doesn't up. look like there's much here, there is probably quite a niche bunch of macrofauna living in these sediments uh, compared to what you would find in a completely a inactive area, really which will again be the final, you know, ring outside of these chemosynthetic seeps. So Fire. they tend to be yeah. zones away from the zone, working your yeah, way away from around. the zonation. Yeah, really interesting so I'll do my best. <laughs> so yeah, guys, we're we're just checking sonar and uh, generally headed northeast. Yeah. This is another one of those uh, kind of mounds that we're finding little pockets of life in. Great. We're on four five. We're on uh, three five. Three five. Three five. Three yep. five. Lining up on zero three five. There we go. That's about it there. Scroll over top of our uh, not so high res. Oh yeah, look at that. That's cool. Where'd you find that? So we have just over an hour left in this dive. Um, about so an hour and five minutes. It's pretty much a straight shot this entire time. We're hoping that we're going to find some more chemosynthetic habitats around this second topographic Has high we've approached. since the last big pasture of seeps? Negative. Copy. Found some tube worms just now. Well, and saw some tube worms. Mm. I don't think so. Just be some fluff within the sonar. Yeah, so I was going to say now that we've done a watch change, if um, we could, now that we're here on this second, close to the second uh, target, if we could just kind of, um, basically we're looking for chemosynthetic areas or hard ground 
um, which we should be able to see maybe on the sonar bubble streams or yeah. um, you know you know what we're looking for right yeah. so yeah. if we could just stick around this area and look for those things that would be great sure no problem we're um, we're not going to stay stationary if we're not seeing anything obviously so we're just going to kind of move around like you said in this area and we did pick up good returns on those kind of pockets of life on sonar so we'll just look for that again okay great and um, just confirming we have finished that extra big ship move right we have yeah okay, yeah we're just doing small ones from now on thank you you got it and um, updated off bottom time is i think i told you uh 340 it's going to be about an hour from now so perfect thank you A black fish, bottom right. Or possibly a shrimp. That it seems like the weather. Uh, video. Weather's coming back. There's around. a little uh, shrimp. Nematocar sinus shrimp, with its daddy long yeah, legs. Yeah, winds have been veering Just all day. Amazing long slender Come legs. Around his and like zero two zero or something clear. like that. Down to keep in the air. Thank it. you. Big wide video. Sixty degrees. We've had to change heading here. Plenty of time. Bunch There's of sort of a ring of a uh, faint ring of burrows. Yeah, understand. Now look at that, almost oh, a yeah. circle, not quite complete. Coming back. Lots of little burrows in the sediment here. Those little pale spots. Josh. Okay, guys, that last ship move is complete. Um, do you want to just keep it rolling, or? Yeah, Should I think so. Should okay. we see what one of these bright white dots are on the scene? Is that a bright white dot video? Yep, I'm seeing them in like a bunch of places. One? Yeah. Go for it. You don't see any sonar targets, do you guys? Nope. Okay. Yeah. We'll just keep it at zero three five. Yeah, then we have Drop here it. just a sounds good. Little tiny bit of bacterial mat, perhaps. Come partial video. Can't quite tell what that is. All right, you can go back in. I think we can call Maybe it Shiva. I want to take a look. I don't know. Maybe broken exoskeleton. Station exoskeleton. Yeah, or shell. Yeah. Thank you, pilot. Top right. Oh, he's out there. Yeah, it looks like there's a big fish out there. Playing room, you get it. Copy Which that. Which looks weird. Video go for zoom. Ooh. Oh, oh, it looks like one of the duckbill eels. Very small. Maybe. Peak. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, so one of the netostomatids. Yep, you're right. So we saw hundreds of these at uh, during our shipwreck dive Small we had earlier this sign. week, um, including some which were oh. very the rotund in the abdomen. Um, they so which meant they were either there as some kind of mating aggregation Spaces and were clear. very uh, gravid, or they, they had come back some very big meals. Um, perhaps again because they were all together, some kind of cannibalism. But Thank you. we'll never. Well, we won't know, but. They were there in a huge abundance, and I think um, actually one of our fish experts ashore, I think it was Ken Sulak, Alex. Yeah, he was. He said he's never seen aggregations of those of those species like that. So that pretty one. pretty interesting spot. And uh, Tina Molotsova has just reminded us we have not seen any of the whip 
Pretty sure he's on. Bamboo corals today that we saw the other yeah. day. Instead, we have the 100%. umbellula. I don't forget a thing like that. And uh, I can't remember. How deep was our dive yesterday, um, Diva? Do you remember? Was that deeper? Shallower. So it may be a bathymetric well, zonation down, we're phenomenon at a delta 13 with uh, or 15, umbellula in so deeper water slope. and the uh, lepidisis there. bamboo Rather whip in uh, yeah. somewhat shallower Come water. Down with you a little. Copy. Yeah, it's weird. This, this that sometimes shoes. gives you a very good hint. The it seems depth like it's that right you're in general, but there's definitely often a gives ton you a very good hint as yeah. to what species you may or may not have because of the it uh, up a little bit to look into the depth distance. distribution limitations that different organisms have. Some, of course, <laughs> the deeper you get in the deep sea, because conditions don't change that much, a lot of organisms have rather broad yeah, depth distribution, sometimes both. over, you know, well over a thousand meters. Let's say you're found from, oh, 1800 meters down to 4500 meters. But on the other hand, in shallower water, the depth distribution of organisms tends to be much narrower. Um, and it varies also with latitude. So for example, the uh, deep sea reef building or mound building coral, Ophelia pertusa, um, can be found as deep as 2,000 meters off the coast of uh, uh, east coast of Florida. It's typically found oh, in uh, 300 Probably to yeah. 700 or so meters, although there are a couple of shallower records. Oh, snaps it but then in the Norwegian fjords, it can be found as shallow as 50 Copy meters because snap. you have much colder and water uh, closer to the surface. Oh. And here is another one of those sea cucumbers, Pseudostichopus, perhaps. And it's got a little a um, friend. Uh, fellow traveler there, a small shrimp on its left side. Yeah, a little amphipod on the top of it. That's Cut what it looks like. Come wide then. So we're in, uh, the uh, so, uh, the other name for this. Bob Carney gave us, and I'm trying to remember, Pararyza or Pseudostichopus. Again, it looks like we're coming into some areas where the sediments may be a little bit more reduced. Something. You can see some bacterial mats kind of glowing in the distance. Doubtful, but it's worth investigating, considering. It's just kind of approaching our track, so we'll find out soon enough. Sorry, video repeat. Oh, okay. Okay. Is it on screen or sonar? <coughs> Copilot, we had you out at, out at 80 when we were doing that long trek. Do you want to uh, keep it there? Or? Yeah, I'll keep scanning at 80, see if I can catch any hard bottom. Sounds good. A bit of a depression off right, but I don't see much in it. Nope, just a depression. Thirty-five is not really in the cards for keeping my heading. It's either thirty or forty. <coughs> I serious when I was compiling earlier, I was having trouble deciding. I was going like plus or minus ten, but never really falling in the middle. Yeah. Crab. That? that looks like a big ne Neolithodes crab. It's walking towards your and right. And that means it's probably coming from or going to one of those seeps where we've been seeing them, mussel beds. It's on its way to dinner. Copy that. Video, you want to come in? This guy. Got some lasers on him. Man, 
Copilot. Oh, yeah. So this is uh, Diva, this is Neolithodes? Yeah, Neolithodes Agassiz. Agassiz, we thought. Agassiz I. Agassiz I, there you go. Tilting down. So again, these uh, lithoded crabs the are not true crabs. Serious. You can see, unlike true crabs, frame it. Uh, posterior to the claws, yeah. which are uh, curled underneath, they only have three pairs of walking legs visible. The fourth pair are much smaller and tucked underneath the carapace. And uh, these are more closely related to the hermit crabs cool and the squat serious. lobsters yeah. that we've seen on this expedition. Another group, some second. of you may be familiar with, see what I can another do. group in this large group Thanks. of crustaceans called the Anomura uh, are the, um, sometimes they're called beach fleas. Okay, there you go. Um, they are little egg-shaped uh, crustaceans that live right in the surf clear? zone. They burrow in the surf zone. They have digging appendages. They look uh, quite different the from these shot. guys, of course, much shorter yeah, legs, streamlined, oval, egg-shaped, but camps. they are also anamurans. And another group of anamurans that look like crabs, another sort of independent evolution of the crab-like appearance, are the porcelain crabs. Oh, huge. And they look very crabby, yeah. but they have, um, again, lying. they don't have the full complement of earlier. four pairs of walking Maybe legs. The, the last end. pair are reduced. And uh, they have very Very large third maxillipeds, uh, which I talked about earlier on these lithoded crabs, that have long um, uh, fans of CT, of feather-like bristles, and they sweep plankton out of the water, much like barnacles do. So among the anamurans, we've got the hermit crabs, the squat lobsters, these lithoded king crabs, the oh. porcelain crabs, and uh, there's is a there beer a bottle, I think. And the um, Just a label. Uh, beach fleas. There's another name for them. I can't remember what message. it is. Uh-uh. So a message in the bottle says, do not litter. <laughs> <laughs> They're called mole crabs. Mole crabs. Thank you, Mary. Mole crabs. Recycling, put it in the rock box. Sometimes the words just don't come. Tracy says the bear brand is Lewinbrow. <laughs> oh, yeah, Chris is so here. Oh, 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 oh. A little something up off right. A little something, something. Black anoxic sediment leading Go. somewhere, perhaps. Follow the breadcrumb trail. Like Hansel, was it Hansel and it. Gretel? A little yeah. tilt up the in the distance. Of Oz. Well, that was breadcrumbs, yes. Yellow Brick Road was the Wizard of Oz. Oh, another one of these Neolithodes, I think, down this hill. Gonna give us a spin side to side and just look around. Maybe a meter or two up. Meter or two up. Spin side to side. Take your workshop. So we've got that anoxic dark gray sediment surrounded by bacterial mat. So or overlaid bit. by bacterial well, mass overlaid, in some yes, cases. Yes, thank you. Yes, but yeah, it's a really nice contrast, right? That the black almost looks gray because of the white okay. um, blending in with it, but the white bacterial mats just seem to glow. Like you can spot them mm-hmm. from really far off in the in the depths of the ocean because of that bright whiteness. So, there's something right there. Want to go that way? Yeah. Which is still pretty much straight. Yeah. I see something white on the hill. Copy. We're going that way. Now, do we move in? 
You want one? Yeah, do you want to do 30 meters? Um, <coughs> Navigation is telling us that they do have a sonar target. We might have something. And we're heading in that direction. 22 out. Sure, what was your, uh, what was your bank? Between three 20 zero. and 30 Please. meters three zero. out. Yeah. Three zero meters at so three zero beyond degrees. Our, uh, the penetration of our lights. I saw this guy too, so I figured we'd cut the difference. Three five, three zero. Copy. Um, that general direction, I think will be good. There's something out there in the distance, can't quite make it though. Yeah, I'll make a wide one just in case we miss anything. So as we were saying earlier, this entire area maybe is likely geologically active. So all beneath the sediment, there'll be um, various gases and uh, liquids filled with hydrocarbons and perhaps even um, these orthogenic carbonates below. There's probably a lot happening below the sediment that we can't see that's powering all of these um, manifestations. So the things we're seeing on the sediment surface, such as those black bacterial mats, um, sorry, the black reduced sediment, the white bacterial mats, and there's definitely something dead ahead. Yep, we're making our way there, but... Yeah. Ming, 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 ming. You can see it just in the distance. <laughs> oh, sure. Ooh! Deep sea skate. After oh, this. yes. Yes. Hold on, I can tell get you. Get it this is. Uh, before we get in, in case it swims away. Yep. Something it. Roger. Yes, exactly. Or <laughs> 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 uh, not video. Close. Uh, it's Finnis uh, Dryer. Sorry, what was that, Tracy? It might be Finnis Dryer. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. Fenestraya, uh, perhaps Plutonia. So the end video? Um, that's the species we get in, in the Southern Caribbean. Um, Looks quite similar, but I think you need to do a bunch of stuff with those spines on the back and all kind of things. Right, well, right, Tracy? Sorry, as good as we get for now. Kind of rotate a yep, little bit. that's right. We're on our way there. Yeah. This is the first, um, is this a, so Tracy, is this a skate or a ray? The videographer sitting next to me is like, it's a skate diva. Come on, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got to. correct, madam. That is a skate. <laughs> so what's, what's the difference, Tracy, between those two <laughs> categories? <laughs> I think the videographer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, skates lack a, uh, lack a spine. And they usually have a, a, uh, a fin on the, on the whip. Whips are not normally so long, so they... Actually, do have a dorsal fin back there, and like this one demonstrates, uh, many of the skates have a line of spines going right down the vertebral column. Many of them also have spines out on the out on the wings as well. So, uh, shorter tail, no spine, and usually some kind of caudal fin, and lots of spines on the on the back. There you go. I'm gonna center up Thanks his very eyes. Much. Center up eyes. What I can do. Max zoom. Getting a little bit of a leash. Let me sneak in a little. Copy. So the uh, Tracy, the there's an opening behind the eye, the spiracle, and I forget is that intake or exhale with the gills underneath, the gill slits underneath. I can't ever remember which way the water goes. Take you don't want to intake. Uh, it's primarily intake, but so they often will oh, intake and exhale out of the same hole. Otherwise, they would be blowing water yeah. out from underneath where the gill slits are. Right, and I guess if they were taking in from underneath, they'd be sucking in mud, too. That makes sense. Uh, it's amazing footage. 
And so, everyone, just a reminder, we are one over one and a half kilometers deep, and we are sitting here looking at a skate. Something is laying on his back and hanging out. Oh and yeah. he's looking it's at us. Very <laughs> still. He or might she. be blind now, but you know. Yes, right. <laughs> or she. All right, Bidio, you want any more of this? That one's a sure. she. It's close to she. Ooh, yeah, how can you tell? Do they have claspers? Let me pull out so you can see how close you are. Um, yeah, they have pretty, uh, pretty handsome claspers, it. really. So you, they would be readily be visible. Commercial. That's the public pin in the back. So they would be between the yeah, edge of that first like pin, the they only just pin, and enough the light public to pin. Properly lighted. And they'd be long and narrow. So in male, that's what males have, claspers, and the females don't have them. Right. Let's try to get his whole tail in the shot as well. That I can do. Looking good, Chuck, Sean, you may not tether. remember this, but we yeah. had uh, one of the last Johnson gotcha. Ceiling guys degrees, uh, where we, we filmed an, right on track. Uh, a skate called an Underworld Skate, awesome. and we filmed it on June 6, uh, 2006. So we got our Underworld Skate in on the okay, uh, printout Thank you, uh, for awesome. the picture good. from the Johnson um, Ceiling that said six <laughs> And we saw a skate, I remember, um, where was it? It was uh, on Tammy Frank's cruise. Oh, we've got something in the distance there. Um, on Tammy Frank's cruise in the Gulf of Mexico, we saw a skate with a, a, a little projection sticking up and out from the front of its uh, snout. I don't remember that what that was called. I've got some video of that. I can reach out to either one. This one's more on track. Oh, yeah, one. that was called the Canthabatis, and it's one of the deepest living skates there is. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks very much. Looks bigger. And here we have some orthogenic carbonate. And the Canthabatis, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Well, a couple of those uh, actinernus anemones, squat lobsters, dead mussels, and very convoluted, irregular, buggy carbonate here. I know, vuggy is a great word. Vug is a term for small uh, uh, holes or uh, cavities in rocks. So when a rock is filled with them, uh, geologists call it vuggy. The um, squat lobsters, white squat lobsters, White squat lobsters are in the genus Munidopsis, I think. Is that right, Mary? That's what they are. Anything else you want? Nope, that's good. Great. Thank you. Let's take a couple of peeks out. For a scan to go by. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it. We've got about 40 minutes left in this dive, and we are on a hunt for either chemosynthetic communities or Some. orthogenic carbonates with big corals on them. Ooh, there's a big fish off in the distance. Yeah, there is. Holy cow. Not one we may have seen before oh. today. I'll turn my face, turn my head, and keep you in view. Zoom from here. Yeah, go for zoom video. Or maybe Ooh, we have, was this one. the one in is the this, burrow? Um, okay, is this that dicrolini or was that something else? All right, kill lasers. This is different. How about we saw a bit of earlier, Keta Tick, and that's oh, that's a looks Thank you for copy. somewhat similar, but not quite the same. The other right, one the had a longer uh, snout. Complete. Copy. Thanks, Tracy. It's an early Tag looking. on another 30 meters, I think. Oh, the same like it's been beaten up yeah, a little bit. Yeah, been through a lot. I guess we're not life. really seeing too much. Um, we saw some it looked like depressions this direction, but not exactly what we're looking for. So yeah, three five I think is fine. 
and uh, how many meters? How close can you get to it? 30. 30. Uh, got a little bit more room. Get closer. He's actually, you can just drop. He's, yeah. He's pretty much. These pretty just look close. so prehistoric. Mm -hmm. They really remind me of there's a freshwater fish um, called an arapaima. Yeah, if we get yes. it in the South Amazon. America. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And they really do look like they've got that evil like tail. They've got that sort of angry looking face. <laughs> I think Alex this do. Looks like so at a bima, actually, if you look at the now. teeth, it's very human teeth, and it's kind of creepy because it's like a person's like to put in mouth. Ship move. These guys don't have that. So. <laughs> three zero meters. Bearing this looks zero like three a, five. Uh, an enforcer Speed for the mob. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> it's getting real close to you. We'll make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> Two feet ahead. Tell me if I start kicking anything up with my tail. It's a nice shot. You're looking good. Your crosses will fit you with styrofoam fins <laughs> and will make you sleep with the humans. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, you just paint it down the side if possible, one or the other. Um, yeah. The opposite way. There we go. Yeah, and you can see underneath here the. Uh, I that guess those are the pelvic great. fins that and have moved forward and out are reduced to those little Come barbels, sensory barbels clear. under Great. the. Uh, out. Um, under Off the head to the abyss. And he was just showing yeah, that's right, Chuck. Cool. I, I think from the size of the mouth. Pretty far to the so port. Again, I'm, I'm not uh, really uh, 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 off, so all that good at these ophidia forms. Uh, Andrea is, is really is much better than him. Uh, just based on the size of the mouth, that looks like uh, Bacidigus. Bacidigus. Bacidigus gillite. Spot. Yeah. Thanks very yeah, much, Tracy. Oh, uh, I took some screen grabs, and I'll, Another move in, I'll look at it more until Andrea can tell us what it really is. Great. Video quick, Sam. Um, Megan asked in the um, uh, you know, chat room, a little what is the way, maximum yeah, depth that the map. skates yeah. and the rays right, go to? Do you have any idea? I have a couple little possible returns yeah, off to my starboard, so when you come around, I think... Uh, hypothetically, it's about 4,000 meters, well, and then they lack so. the, the physiological great. machinery to out. deal with the pressure. So that's about... Um, in, hypothetically, that's about when the elasma brings... Uh, Peter, feel free to lose skids. That is actually okay. much deeper than I thought you were going to say, Tracy. Way out there. You might have to come a little closer before you strike across. Yeah, Teleos can go deeper, but that seems that. to be about the limiting uh, yeah, if you point want, for uh, us. I break. prefer right. also 20 degrees. a higher tilt angle. Higher tilt angle, yeah. too, that I can do. Yeah, it gives us a I remember when I was in graduate view. school, I think Bas uh, Basagigas was one of the, if not the <laughs> deepest, uh, bony fish, and I want to say between five and six thousand meters. I don't know what's current. Oh, though. I'm pretty much lined up on thirty, and you can see this strike out here. It's my it, it was for a long it. time, but now it's the snail fish. Oh, there you are, my snail right. fish that was described by um, Alan Jameson and his cohort uh, at the University of Aberdeen when Monty Creed was there. Uh, and that's, that's the sand, now there. But you're catching it's something. It's a hadle uh, yeah. snail fish. Mm -hmm. Over 8,000 meters, and I, uh, Paul Yancey and, and Jeff Drazen, Drazen have done some really nice work showing how deep should a fish be able to live, <laughs> and that fish supposedly is it. It's about 8,900 meters, I believe. Wow. Yeah, so that work was actually done by Mackenzie Geringer um, when she was in Jeff's lab, and now she's actually at the Friday Harbor Labs with um, Adam Summers where she's doing her first postdoc, and yeah, absolutely incredible work that they did there, yeah, looking at the physiology yeah, of those yeah. fishes. Large on the left edge of that view. And we're coming up on so some hard ground again. Left edge of that view is good down with that large Big rock or something. Five L's. Those are living. So take a snap on the living in the center. Yeah, go for uh, living. There's a couple of few live cruising. muscles. Live muscles. Woo! Okay, so we have found um, our first megafauna chemosynthetic community on this particular um, 
bathymetric high. So this was in the area where we found our second we'll seep signal cruising. last night, the bubble plumes. Um, this is likely not the area that we would have detected in our surveys, given that there aren't any bubbles here. Um, but this right. is an indicator, again, over. as we're following yeah. that yeah. breadcrumb trail, yep. that there is probably somewhere that is much, some community that is much larger yeah, um, and much yeah, more active. But yes, live bathymoniolus there, as well as bacterial mats and reducing sediment. Lots of stuff around the edge. Go see yeah. if it is. If it is, it's worth running out there. Copy. It's well within reach right now. Great. Yeah. I'm going to sidle over to get it in view here for you. Is a, uh, another space, fish below now centered, and this uh, extensive, right. uh, more extensive, uh, autogenic more carbonate. As well as we can see some chew worms poking up Thank between the autogenic carbonates. Move, as please. well as hey, you can see this is an example of the donation. The exactly seepage right. is obviously right where these mussels are, um, and you can see the bacterial mats and the reduced. Um, sediments in the area, as well, well as a couple little animals in between, and then outside of that, you've got uh, more autogenic carbonates with the tube worms, worms where you can't actually see any reduced sediment or bacterial mats Let's close by. See. And lots Much of higher. little squat lobsters. If any of them are alive. Hi, Diva, this is Nav. Hey, Nav. What's up? Uh, just wanted to let you that know one. we have about that 30 minutes left be. in the dive. Yeah, we're coming off at 3.40, right? Uh, yeah. 3.38 like yeah, yeah, something around there. Okay, great. Keep Sounds going. good. Thank you. Copy. All right, let's just see, check out the other sites. Ooh. Uh, well, this is weird. Are those all anemones in the distance? I don't know. Yes, There's they one are. on those. Yeah, look at them. Oh, wow. Some Some of them. This is very strange. Yeah we, can east. Can, yeah, we can do a move to east. Go ahead. <laughs> Give us a nice rotate side to side. Wow. Oh, is this a good collection target? Yeah, I would that's why think I said so. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I was lens. going through, um, <laughs> well, I was going through the and worms, like, well, and there were four there. species of Actinernus, and um, I don't know that any of them were recorded from the Gulf of Mexico. If anybody's online who we knows. Do a, do and also move? if they've been found in such yeah. close association so, uh, with these right. reduced uh, at least 30 habitats. Meters. 30 this meters at 90. And certainly yeah, it's an abundant works. enough organism yeah, that's characteristic. If we could get one of these. How does that sound as ashore, folks? Is Do you think this Actinernus would be a good Bridge collection? Um, just a reminder to folks ashore who are listening. Um, like to request our a ship move tend to be pretty limited here with our ROV to discover. Nine, zero, we tend to pick up as, zero as many. Knots. Our maximum will be six per dive. Sorry, um, that needs to encompass both geological and biological specimens. And so with regard oh, to yeah, our biological, they normally correct. are um, something that is rare, something that is poorly known, something that is completely unknown. Um, or also something that's pretty characteristic of the area. So and I this anemone may tick What's a couple that? of those boxes. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, so if we can get one, Trim perhaps the on one. Pilot, do you think we'd be able to collect one of these? Uh, yeah, absolutely. On the so. um, uh, directly uh, right, uh, well, not that, that's got on a big rock. How about the one uh, to the left there below wow. the shrimp that looks like it's on a small rock? Copy that. Right center. Yeah. That may now, be would you want the rock, too? Sure. I mean, if we can, if yes. it's small enough and it's loose, it's definitely. Rock, yeah. it's I would so guess that the anemone the would, uh, dump it. That's that's would uh, stay attached yeah. to the rock, and a small one could go in the bio box. All right, that moves in, by the way, gentlemen. Now, this, um, uh, traditionally, I, I wonder if we can get anybody on shore to comment traditional yeah, traditionally anemones would be preserved in formalin with a small piece uh, at least in alcohol for DNA um, and I'm yeah. guessing that's what we will try to do you go for zoom? here okay. um, Hydraulics what we could yeah. try oh, to yeah. do yeah. also it's right, got ophiroids on it too that set. could be a bonus I'm thinking it's possible he could let go of that rock. Uh, that as looks well. like, um, yeah, four inches across or so. I'm that might it's possible. be just the right uh, size. So. If that Maybe. happens, we can we'll scoop him up. We'll get it. We'll show him the full. Um, and what we can try to do when we get it on board, assuming well, that it contracts, I think there are other is we'll try to uh, leave it in cold no, water thing. as um, for a while and see if we can expand Probably it and it relax it. Like so that we can tugs. preserve it in the relaxed condition because frequently 
when you collect anemones, they Copy that. It should be good. curl Video's up. Video swapping out. Contract. Copy. And right. it's more Let's difficult to work with. You're all spun up, ready to go, buddy. Do we have samples? Nope. Great. Great. You go anywhere go you want. Port. I have extended both pins. <laughs> you will get to choose at your pleasure. That's amazing. Thank you. Arms coming on. Arms up. Just so you know, you've, you've settled off, a little bit. By the way. On a uh, side note, folks who may be on I'm Twitter while we're setting up for this, so um, we just but, uh, started a discussion between um, NOAA, uh, NOAA's so Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, or the Ocean Explorer um, account, as well as the Schmidt Ocean Institute account, as well as EV Nautilus. So those three deep sea exploration vessels, which do conduct telepresence um, exploration. And our discussions about, you know, what is it that you love about telepresence? Why do you love exploring the deep sea or just exploring our oceans? And so if you do have Twitter, please do jump onto that and please do reply um, to that thread. There's some really great little snippets coming out of that. Um, which I'm going to share with the team on board later because a lot of them are just so wonderful. And um, Tina Molotsova has told me, told us, that uh, through the Beautiful. chat room, wow. that uh, we should put a small uh, piece of that this rock's in probably uh, gonna be pretty crumbly, 95 percent alcohol, a piece that. in yep. the uh, <laughs> You're accurate. Um, uh, there you go, you got buffer now. for DNA, and most of it should go right, in for the obstacle out of the way. Is up in port. Drawer. And it looks Extending. like we crunched most of the substrate, but this looks like a pretty firm anemone. It's Might not uh, very flaccid. It. It's holding its um, shape. It's all right. That's interesting. It's, it's not nice. And we'll Real have clear. to deal uh, with right. this with gloves right. because we don't know Where how nasty the sting of this uh, might sure. be. Replacing it. There are mm, some yeah, anemones that produce an extremely painful sting. Not me not most of them. Not many of them. Maybe. But there are yeah. some that do, so we'll have to be careful. That's going to be cool. That's our first anemone collected on this expedition. Oops. And it's really interesting. I mean, we didn't see yeah. any on any of the oh, previous dives. Right. And then all of a sudden there was a cluster of them. Then we didn't see any. Then we saw a large number of them, Great. and we didn't see any. And here we have a large the number of them again. So just starting to drift off our serious. And that view. was a successful collection. Thank you very much, pilots. Anytime. That was great. Let's see what's out there. All right, arm is off. Like out back. Down. All right. Caitlin, our video clipper, is reviewing this and it's going you backwards. Guys. And I, um, I looked at it for a moment and I looked at okay, her so video uh, for a moment. Like I said, no, no, don't let it go. Or no, she was, shooting, she was reviewing the no, video it. backwards. Yeah. So you're doing fine. Look at them all. Are we still moving? Oh, we did a due east move. Yeah, so we did a due east. 70. We're, uh, the ship is track. Yeah, super right. stationary, I think. Yeah, you're like fine. They finished that move. Just, just scan the area. There's no reason. No hurry. It's just all over the place. Now, anemones can reproduce sexually by producing eggs and sperm, releasing them into the water, or um, the sperm will be taken in by the anemone to fertilize the eggs within, or they can reproduce asexually by... As they move along the, the underside of the anemone, the base is called the pedal disc, P-E-D-A-L, as in pedal, and uh, uh, it has cilia on it. And so the anemone can glide along on that cilia very slowly and can leave a little bit of its own tissue behind, which will separate and produce another anemone. So they can reproduce asexually and... Uh, there's, uh, I know one, sure it's more of them, but there are anemones along the California, along the U.S. West Coast in particular, Anthoplura, that are in very shallow water, intertidal, right along the tide line, and there can be large masses of them that have, uh, that are basically clones. They originated from a single anemone that reproduced asexually by leaving bits of its, um, 
tissue behind and growing into additional and anemones. See if see anything. And there are huge Good. mats of them. So this may be an Couple example of that. Perhaps dance, all of these much. anemones the are uh, yeah. uh, and the number three backwards. genetically identical. Hmm. It's possible. But I'm, uh, I don't know enough about um, uh, not the details. Thing? Tina says she has handled this Kinda genus like yeah. without yeah, gloves. Way. It's but some people may have an allergy um, to it, so uh, we'll here, be careful. Quick. Thanks, Tina. Pilot, is it all right to zoom past this, kids? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Great, yeah. thank you. It's more of here, too. And she also says that the anemone cannot withdraw, cannot contract entirely. What have you had? What do you have that you're driving by on the right? More, more of the stuff. Up oh, here we get into some more stuff. Fly bivalves. Yeah, so we go this way. So here we can see these little, how patchy so these seep like habitats little bits can each be. Direction. Um, you know, they kind yeah. of well, pop up in areas where there is the seepage, and it's, it's almost like the it. the plumbing below the sediment is really leaky, yeah, and so ah. you get this. Like you know, every now and again it'll spring a leak bubbles. in a certain place, and Video these seeps zoom. will pop up ah. at the surface of the sediment there. That's a great analogy. Got like twenty. Muscles, yeah. bubbles. Yep. So these are likely Bacchymodiolus poopsi, oh, yeah. I think we were saying earlier. Video, I'm gonna rotate down. And hey, yeah, we've got bubbles. So this yep. could bubble have been exits. the target awesome. which we detected last night. And it always amazes me. I mean, this is and not a vigorous stream of bubbles. No. This is, the, and they're so tiny as well. <laughs> and yet we are able to detect them with our ship one and a half kilometers up in the sea, f in, at the sea surface. Just blows my mind. Technology is amazing. Could the pilot put the lasers on for a minute? Sure. Got it. Video, you might have. Oh, never mind. There we go. Caroline, can you see that? Yeah, I can see. Yeah, so these different. So just for the people it's listening, close the lasers too. are 10 centimeters apart. How far off? So are these we bubbles are going to be sub centimeter. Normally, uh, uh, the water depth might see bubbles that are say three millimeters or so. Yeah, about 40. So this is meters. pretty standard, so and you notice the bubbles are coming out of what so essentially is bare seafloor. There's no, any, no community uh, that we can see, yeah. at least on the surface, right by this bubble emission. And so sometimes that's how it goes, that the seafloor is basically bare in that case. It could be it there's like too much sulfide or something else that just makes it not very uh, good for habitation, or it could be a new bubble site that hasn't been colonized yet at that very particular spot. Excellent. Very good. Yeah, they're tiny little bubbles. Thank you very much. Zoom a little more. Um, yeah. Oh, sure. Thanks. Thank you, Bridge. Oh, yeah, there's a little bloop, bloop, bloop. Wasn't there a song back in the 50s? Tiny bubbles. That is way before our time, Chuck. <laughs> it's not before my time. <laughs> uh, something like that. I have it from a 13-year-old that, quote, that is so cool, Mom. <laughs> oh, yay. So these bubbles are methane, Carolyn? So, Chuck, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to interrupt. There's another bubble sure. stream going much slower, sort of at the upper center left there, coming out of that whitish area. Yes. Oh, there it is. You see there's another little bubble stream? Yes. Much slower. Okay, so the bubbles there are coming up and they're kind of growing into an elongate thing before the pressure is enough for them to break off. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's all right. I was just asking, these, are, these bubbles are methane? Uh, well, we can't know for sure. Um, you know, in some places, like on the Atlantic margin, you know, they're pretty much all methane. And the awesome. problem in the Gulf of yeah, Mexico is wide, that you've got an abundance of uh, what we call higher area. order hydrocarbons that, that uh, have more carbons in them and that Sons can also be gaseous. So you can have a mixture of gases oh. at some of these sites. But the first yep. guess would definitely be methane. Yeah. Okay, so, but Watch when you said higher oh, order, yeah. would that be things like, what, propane and butane? Uh, sure, any of those sort of higher order hydrocarbons that are gaseous at these, at these depths. Great. And then yeah. I know that Eva's worked with Kickham Jenny, and I think at Kickham Jenny, don't they have carbon dioxide? Yeah, so in the summit of Kickham Jenny, they definitely have carbon dioxide plumes. 
And there was some fishing line on the left, which we'll try to avoid. I will pick bubbles. Video, you want to come in a little more? Yep. That was so very cool. Two for two. Let's see if we see anything. Yeah, great work more. today, team. Yeah, some, some big bubbles. From the, on this that. was, a, right. again, a great example of using all the tools available. You know, we had That's these, right. this incredible bathymetric map. Um, which we were then able to pick out interesting features on. Then last night we ran over these areas with somewhere. the ship's multi-beam as well as the EK-60. <laughs> um, and so we were able to not only detect these bubble streams, but also look at the backscatter. So that means how, how hard the ground is in various places. So that can give us an indication of whether there is, um, for instance, carbonate in some places or uh, shells yep. or Let's soft see. sediment. And from all using all that information this morning, you know, we were up super early and we made a decision yeah, together um, to basically where we should dive, given all that evidence. And that led us to these two spots. Um, and they've really proven that this works. And of course, that we lowered our ROV over the side this morning and have been exploring on the seafloor since. And a couple of days ago, we did some similar exploration, but weren't able to find those actual bubble targets. Whereas today and yesterday, we've been much more successful at doing that. And it's been really spectacular. The crab. Do you want another move? Yeah, watch. Do you want us to stay at this spot, or do you want us to keep looking around? Keep exploring. Always. Great. Just right. keep um, swimming. Just keep swimming. So then. <laughs> <laughs> it's at the end of the dive when we begin to go right. a little loopy. You know, yeah. we've been sitting here for however long. Sing, you know, singing all is good. good. Amazing do things, and it just. Um, 30 meters we had that awesome Facebook it'll, Live. There's awesome Twitter chat going on. It just. There's a lot happening, and it's. It's great. Just want to go right to the waypoint. And singing is day. always Let's singing see. is always good. There might be stuff there. I'm facing east already, so I'm happy to do that. Um, but there was other things to scan about. Some of this. Yeah. That's all within reach as we go east, so you can look at it as we go. Yeah. So yeah, how about 40 meters? Well, let's do like uh, maybe 100 or something. 100? Yeah, 100. Bearing We're still instead not of doing quite at oh, waypoint two where our second yeah, yeah. bubble target was. Mm. I mean, it could, that could have been it because these aren't necessarily um, accurate to uh, sure general areas. Uh, maybe even hundreds of meters sometimes, depending on the current. Knots. But it does look How's like there's some stuff ahead. Sounds good. Or do you want to go slower? I think it's fine. Yeah. Point two. If we find anything great, we can. It's close enough. We can just kind of backtrack. Very Javi Nev. Cresting ship move, range four zero meters, bearing one hundred, speed zero decimal two knots. So that's up slow. Look at all decimal these bacterial two knots, mats. Thank you. That is a lot of food for someone. <laughs> Didn't pick up the bubbles on that guy. Maybe we should crush the. Push those it down rings and crush in, it a little the, bit. in the distance. That's um, can't tell what those are either. Get better luck seeing it. So yeah, for some maybe Carolyn can help explain this. But for some reason, the bacterial mats seem to be growing in these ring-like structures, and I'm going to assume that's something about the seepage. Is this something you guys have encountered before? I, I've seen it. I think other people have seen it. Right. If you remember yesterday, we saw those sort of concentric rings we'll of different back. biota as well at, at one that? of the sites. So, uh, I mean, it's possible. I don't think we have any real explanation that links don't the physics don't have any mouse of the plumbing on system to the Jeff. seafloor biology what? at that level of detail. The mouse. Oh. i got to yeah. restart the Thanks, KVM. Carolyn. Oh, okay. I can click. I just can't move. Oh, weird. Unless, oh, actually. Yep, oh, never mind. just doesn't read on this table. Yeah, you gotta put it on the paper. You know, mouse pad. All right. There, there are a couple there. more of the actinernus anemones back. on these orthogenic substrates. Ooh, there's so much cool things. Yeah. And so the depression, right. that depression that may right. have some interesting stuff in it. Dark anoxic sediment. I say this is where it came from, but yeah, okay, probably. Just making sure. Yeah, because that's my dust cloud. 
Yeah, so we've been here before okay. because that's our Great. dust cloud. Yep. Don't go that way. Back go up. Go around that so, way. So uh, the pilot will your, back uh, up the ROV. Go towards your, spin towards your port. Now you're starboard. You don't want to put a turn in. So just a reminder to all the scientists who are joining us ashore, um, we're going to be leaving the bottom in about 15 minutes. Um, so we're going to have our post-dive call to discuss tomorrow's dive as well as the following day's dive um, at about 3, 3.50 um, Central Standard Time. So that'll be 4.50 Eastern Standard Time and you can calculate the rest. Turn in there, it? So 10 to 4 Central mm -hmm. Standard Time. We'll put an equal half turn no matter which way, right? Uh, no, I mean, once I unwound, it would have been a full turn. Uh, okay. I've got a half turn in. Copy. Okay, so yeah. That's where we were. The camera's not responding at the moment. There it goes. No, it's there we go. Alright, so these are level location. Ten minutes left. Copy that. Push this way. Is this an area we've been before, or is this new? So, this what we area. just passed over is where we were, but this area here is new. With all of these anemones, so these are new, a new collection of anemones. Correct. Okay. So, what may be happening with these anemones is that because seeps are a, a hot spot of productivity, primary productivity, um, you get a lot of bacterial mats, and you get a lot of um, flock, which may end up because of all the activity in the water column. And so, as these anemones can be um, suspension feeders taking okay. particles from the water column. They may be here for in the fringing areas to make the most of this um, huge abundance of production in this area. Or they could have some some other kind of link, which we don't yet know about, some kind of chemosynthetic link. And, and wow, look at this. It's like a, a little trail of Can anemones and shell mash going up the slope here. Want. And um, this Seeing is something, uh, thanks for mentioning that, Diva, mind. because um, I usually do that once uh, a Of course, I don't know, uh, I do and I don't know if people. any of the team here in the chat room knows <laughs> whether this is a new species of anemone or not. Um, I'm sorts. guessing it's been seen before, at least, if not collected. Is that out there? But when we bring it on board, mm -hmm. we'll uh, take a whiff or two and see whether uh, it's got any hydrogen it sulfide smell in it. And amazingly, if you were following the dive it's yesterday, rock, right? we collected yeah. a rock. Yeah. Carolyn right, actually helped us choose it. And we were hoping for some carbonates. And I am not a geologist, but that rock definitely was not only carbonates. As soon as that ROV kit came on deck, it smelled like bitumen, like pitch, like fresh pitch. And there were soft bits of asphalt, asphalt left all in the bio box. And now that it's in the lab, it's kind of like oozing asphalt slowly. And it just it reeks of that fresh pitch smell, which is amazing but it definitely does also look like there's some carbonate in there so it's a bit weird and we did discover on that rock actually uh, uh, we didn't expect to see and uh, that we didn't see any attached organisms in initially but when we brought it on board um, Alex has got brilliant eyes uh, and she spotted a couple of tiny little mussels on it and there were a couple of worms, and then we saw a couple of uh, cypunculin peanut worms as well. We we're talking all, everything is less than less than an inch, or uh, some some of them were a quarter of an inch. So she has excellent eyes for spotting these things. And more of those anemones. Look at that. This is the first dive we've seen them on.
Yep, that looks like a sea cucumber in the distance, like we as we've seen before. Now this is a different anemone. This may be one of those hormatheids that when fully expanded um, Video, go for quick takes on that right. Venus flytrap posture. You can see it's got that Get orange disc and all of the little uh, pale knobs along its column. We've seen this before. Have you seen this one, Shlid? Uh, not today, but we did see a similar one yesterday. Copy. Do you want views of it? or? Uh, yeah, sure. Going? If we could get a good view of the um, the front of the... Yeah, copy that. The oral surface. There Rotating. you go. That, that thing. Coming down. Giving you a little more. Copy. Let me know if I tug you. Just okay. over 10 minutes left on the bottom, folks. Yeah, Tina tells us that this is indeed Hormatheidae. That's five minutes, Tina. Oh, 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 oh. We've been corrected. It was uh, five minutes. Five minutes left on the bottom. Sorry, everyone. So we'll be leaving at 3.35 Central Standard Time. Looks like the, uh, almost looks like the column is made out of corduroy with those grooves in it. Some of these anemone, typically anemones attach to hard substrates, but some of the deep sea anemones can actually surround with their pedal disc a ball of sediment and live out on the, um, on the mud substrate. Thank you, Bridge. And that would obviously be in a place where the bottom right, currents video, were not too us? strong. Nope, I think we're good. Not strong All enough right, to dislodge them. Uh, push out with the last minutes we have. So we can take a couple of last looks here before we leave and bid a fond farewell. Coming up. That. So this has been a truly amazing dive. I mean, comparable to yesterday's. Um, which I'm going to keep going on about because it was just so amazing, non-stop action. Um, today we touched down at the in a very sedimented area with not that much happening no. when we first got there, and I was initially very worried that that was what we were going to be seeing all dive. Um, but that quickly changed, and we moved into a brine lake area, which was amazing. First time I think <laughs> I've ever seen a brine lake. Chuck's ever seen a brine lake. Um, during an actual expedition, not just a video we've seen before. Right, um, and then, and then also that, that enormous oh, yeah. muscle bed. Exactly, yeah. like these, this huge muscle bed that was just full here. of life. So many different species of invertebrates, as well as vertebrates, That's fish, you know, good. popping in and out to see what food they could pick yeah. up. And we saw a couple of those. And then we moved off One into this south, perfectly contrasting environment where, um, yeah. you know, we aren't seeing the huge abundances of life that we do at seeps. Instead, this is much more typical of the deep sea, what we're seeing right now. Oop, Tina Four. Tina Four. Um, yeah, no. much more typical of the deep sea, these sedimented areas with not a lot of obvious life. That doesn't mean there's not a lot you of life, but just not a lot of obvious life. Like and then like now we're back in you go on out, our second we'll topographic high and, and we're back in more chemosynthetic yeah, yeah. habitats. Mode not as in spectacular as okay, earlier in the dive, but still amazing. These reduced areas with the bacterial mats, the, the mussels, the tube worms, and so on. Animals which are found only in these habitats and nowhere That's else. Anything. And then we, we had some interesting, um, I don't I hesitate to use the zonation, but patchy distributions because we went through this area of relatively barren, barren areas between I'll our two lowers up. Um, uh, high diversity please. sites and we'd see the umbellula, the Resist sea pens and their yeah. cohabitants which we did not see elsewhere. And what is this? Ooh. The big bacterial mat. Shrimp in the front. And uh, Megan Putz has said uh, that that Hormatheid anemone, um, they've been calling Feliactis, P-H-E-L-L-I-A-C-T-I-S. 
and Actis is another example. We talked the other day about sure, come back to the um, All right. Antipatherians, All right. yeah. the sure. basic yeah, gene of the original genus name Antipathies, right. has Go been added on to with a lot of prefixes like parantipathies, tanacetopathies, and so on uh, for black corals. And with a lot of anemones, the Actis, A-C-T-I-S, is the suffix that uh, new name, new nice. generic names are added to, like Feliactus oh. or Condylactus. So we're pulling off the, the sea floor. Views. This is the last view of this incredible new area of the Gulf and of Mexico. This it. area that no one has seen before until today. Um, All right, if you're so. Ready. Thank you very much, pilots, for that yep. awesome project. Actually, we found start. both of our targets today. Um, as well as thank you, video engineers, for clipping out all of the footage that we've, the amazing footage that we've been getting, then producing all of those fab highlight videos. If you haven't seen them, go to www.oceanexplorer.noaa.gov <laughs> <laughs> www to take a look at take all the stills, uh, the highlight sure stills, and the highlight stood. videos well, that have been accumulating uh, during yeah, this expedition. Absolutely. As well as, of course, the mission logs, the background essays, and um, our daily updates. And I want to put out a special thank you. For, well, first of all, thank you and to all of the Delta folks on the call in line and in the chat okay, room starting from up all you. over the world for their, yeah. the advice that has broadened our around. ability to tell you what we're seeing. Um, but also, I just want to thank Diva here, my oh, partner, no. yes, <laughs> because her commentary, her enthusiasm, her knowledge, her commentary, her understanding of the way this whole system works has been phenomenal, and uh, it's made my job much easier. I can Bridge just sort of sit here and natter on about these different critters. The RVs are my off the bottom the and dark, starting their blushing, but <laughs> No, and thank you to you, Chuck, as well. I think we make a great team. Your knowledge yeah, definitely balances mine out. Uh, you have this incredible broad invertebrate knowledge that I just isn't, it just isn't there. I learned it s some time ago, but it just hasn't been refreshed right, in a long out. time. So no, it's been really great um, so far. So we're gonna have, while we keep patting each other on the back, we're gonna have our post dive call in nine minutes time. Please do join us to talk about our dives tomorrow. Um, Video's going to switch Some seismic anomalies yeah, and other video. fun stuff for the next two days. So chat in nine minutes time. Thanks, everybody. And thank you again to all the scientists on the chat up. as well as the phone line. Let's see. Well, looks good. Your Titan and see if make sure the top the like stowed nicely. Copy that. Can't see that swing arm. Turns out. That's a bad design. Can I see this swing arm? No, I can't see either swing arm. Really? I think you could always at least see one. Yeah, you can with the mini Zeus. Maybe you can see it if, like, the okay. mini Zeus is in a certain position or yeah, something. Yeah, but I'll get it with the mini Zeus real quick. Uh, that looks right. Oh, wow. What? No, the, see the lighting on the right side of the VSR? Yeah. In that view? I thought that was the like more tether. So I saw the tether going out, and I thought there was more over there. And I, for a second, I thought something really bad was happening. <laughs> that would not be good. All right, are you guys ready to start doing a half knot over ground? Um, Whenever we're clear of the yeah. bottom. I don't think there's any, yeah. But not sure what's coming up. I think we're set on our side. Um, yeah, there's there's another feature kilometer away 
at 1600. So. Oh. Yeah. I think we're pretty good. So we're well clear of that. <laughs> yeah. Bridge, RV Nav. Okay, I stowed your mini Zeus back. Go ahead, RV Nav. All right, we can start coming ahead at a half knot over ground, please. Half an hour over ground, would you like me to punch out of auto search? Uh, yes, please. Half an hour over ground, coming up. Thank you.